30. Okay. All right. Sorry. Pause if she gets here. Right. Mm -hmm. There's an important part I wanted her to hear. Um, but I can maybe repeat it. Sure. Okay. All right. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the ACE Stillwater Civic Center for our Montana State Library Commission's October meeting. I am Robin Scribner, Chairman of the MSL Commission, and I am calling this meeting to order. We would like to extend our appreciation to the Stillwater County Library and the Stillwater Board of mm -hmm. Trustees. Um, for having us here. They gave us a warm welcome and a lovely reception last night. Um, and as your chair, I am going to create a productive meeting space where every commission member and staff member is respected, valued, seen, and heard. All right, a little bit about me. I've been a member of the commission for two and a half years. I'm a retired elementary librarian and kindergarten teacher. And here's Tammy. Good morning. <laughs> I'm going to sit over here, Tammy, so you can see the. Yeah, I yeah. don't think my, my pants could work. Tammy had back surgery, so. Mm -hmm. the same thing. Like, yeah. All right. The good time is when I'm drugged. The bad time is now when I can't take it. Just hold it down. Just hold it down. All right. Welcome, started. Tammy. <laughs> hey, I'm a retired elementary librarian and kindergarten teacher. I have now graduated on to be a Nana for almost five grandchildren. Mm -hmm. oh. And um, yeah, I'm from Geraldine and I'm happy, happily, happily, I help. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I'm happy <laughs> to help um, babysitting, gophering, and cooking for my husband and my daughter and son-in-law on our farm and ranch in, Gen in Geraldine. I was appointed by the governor and am very proud to serve our great state. And I would like the commissioners and as them mm -hmm. to introduce themselves. Let me go ahead. I'm Tammy Hall. And uh, I, I am married for 55 years. He's, he's easy. He's a keeper. He's easy to be married to. And I'm sorry to have my back to you. Oh, no, no, no. It's, you can knock on it if you're tired. Um, and um, I have three children. Our oldest daughter is mentally disabled, lives in Helena. And we have two grandsons. They're both in college. Or one's in college, one's thinking about it. <laughs> he's, in a, he's in a gap life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So they call it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, and um, I uh, I love serving with these people. They're phenomenal. So, and thank you for all you do. If any of you are the librarians, we need you so much. You're just the heart of this whole operation. So, thank you for that. And I'm a retired speaker, writer, and um, radio show host. I wanted to say chronic board member. <laughs> <laughs> chronic board member. Chronic. Chronic. <laughs> The one who couldn't say no. The one who didn't know how to say no. Uh -huh. I'm Peggy Taylor. I spend my time be go between going from Whitefish to Shelby to Bozeman. Those are my areas. We were in Shelby. I was a. I also am a retired educator um, and librarian and teacher and principal. And I have two daughters. One's at Kalispell one, and one in Bozeman, and they have their my grandchildren. I have been named Grammy instead of Nana, and uh, I just spend time going back and forth to them and reading. And yesterday, we got to see some wonderful libraries, and I just mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoyed seeing what is happening in all of those special places. And I've been on the board for two years now and are serving uh, for the next three. I've been reappointed, so glad to be here. She's not in the union. That's all right, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Tom Burnett from Bozeman. <clears throat> I've been on about a year, I guess. <clears throat> and retired small businessman, we manufactured seat covers for pickups, mainly out of camouflage material. <laughs> And uh, served in the legislature for a time. We have 10 grandchildren, and my regular duty with them is two hours every morning doing Zoom math with six of them. Oh, awesome. But I'm off today. <laughs> <laughs> or they're off. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> they get vacation for the day. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. I'm Brian Rossman. Um, I work at Montana State University Library. 
I think I'm the newest member on the commission. I've been on for about three months now. Um, I was appointed by um, Commissioner Christian Clay uh, from the uh, from OG, the Office of the Higher Commissioner of Higher Education. And so I represent the Montana University system. And I believe I'm the only person on the commission who has an MLS as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Carmen? My name is Carmen Cuthbertson. I'm in Kalispell, where I'm a library trustee. Um, I've been on the commission not quite a year, I think, um, appointed by the governor. Um, my husband and I have a business in Kalispell. We have two kids. One of them is still in college. One of them is working. Um, I like to read, knit, garden, cross-country ski, hike, play flute and sing. Um, and I'm, I'm honored to serve on this commission. It's really broadened my horizon and I've learned a lot about how our libraries function. And, uh, I know years ago, people were concerned that my, maybe libraries and physical books were going to become extinct. And I just don't think that's ever going to happen. So I'm happy to support our libraries into an exciting future because a lot of stuff is happening. There's always new things, technology changes, and it's exciting to be part of that. Thank you. Elsie, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be able to be part of the State Library Commission. I've been part of this as I'm uh, part of statute to be uh, noted here as a state superintendent. So it is about literacy. It's about numeracy. It's making sure that there is access to all. And I'm very I'm um, excited about uh, the agenda that I'm seeing in front of us today because it is about action. And I firmly believe that as a part of government that we do uh, perform certain things that is a gathering and a discussion, but more importantly, it's, it's very important that uh, this arm of government determines action and a plan forward so that there is consistency within how we serve our patrons across our state. So looking forward to this agenda. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, we all have all the yeah. commissioners. So yeah. now you're Jenny. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Stapp. I'm the Montana State Librarian. It's been my privilege to serve in this role since 2012. I'm a Montana native, and I've lived in Helena for a little over 20 years with my husband, Ethan. It's just an honor to work for the State Library and with all of my library colleagues. Genevieve? I'm Genevieve Lighthizer, the admin specialist with the Montana State Library. Okay. I've got a question. Yes. Which of our attendees are trustees, the local trustees? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, local trustee too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Thank you for coming. Yes. Kathleen and Linda were there last night. Mm -hmm. It was very pleasant meeting them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who oh, beside you over here? Kathleen. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you. And then thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, I would like to remind everyone that I have asked Genevieve to be our parliamentarian. And if we have any questions about Robert's rules, she will she will help us. I would also like to add that we did have a discussion with the Lieutenant Governor and she had a few suggestions for us when using Robert's rules. One was to perhaps when struggling to phrase a motion that I as chair allow a discussion on how the motion should be phrased. Not in all motions, but using my discretion, I may allow a limited discussion in the phrasing of the motion. She also suggested that we allow public comment before our comments. This gives us a more informed decision and discussion. Our goal will be to have a better formulated motion, not compounded, in hopes that this will make it easier for us and easier for the public to understand. Does that yep. sound right? Okay. So with that being said, are there any changes or additions to the agenda? I would like to I would like to add um, just an informational item. Um, I would like to make a statement and maybe that would best be placed right before we take action or before we get public comment or deal with the public library standards task force recommendations. Mm -hmm. We write Carmen in right, in, yeah. right ahead. Okay. Okay, Carmen, we'll write you in right before the Public Standards Task Force recommendations. Thank you. Okay. All right. 
So, okay, we will continue on to the stanch, uh, excuse me, staff longevity recognitions and the Great. governor's award. Great. Um, first, I would like to ask Tracy Cook to present yes. Pam Henley's longevity award, and, and Pam is in the room with us today. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure to virtually present Pam with her 10-year pen. Pam is one of our consulting librarians, and she works with the libraries in the Sagebrush and South Central Federations. You, of course, see her as commissioners because she also oversees our Excellent Library Services Award and works closely with the six Federation coordinators, particularly at this meeting where she's presenting the annual report along with them. Um, Pam also assists Gen Jennifer Burnell with the Montana History Portal portal. And as I thought about what librarians and other MSL staff really appreciate about Pam, um, I realized it was her willingness to step in and help where needed, her um, great sense of humor, and her very calm demeanor. She has a, a presence about her that can often calm all of us down as we're frantically working through things. And I know many of us, myself included, have really appreciated her willingness to pitch in and help out when we needed her. So Pam, thank you so much for your work and congratulations on your 10-year pen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you Pam. I can't believe it's been 10 years. <laughs> and these 10 years, I think, have been the most fun I have ever had working in libraries. Oh, good. It was wonderful working with everybody, and I've learned so much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I'd like to ask Kara mm -hmm. to recognize Kylie. Kylie. Good morning, everyone. Yes, it's my mm -hmm. pleasure to talk about Kylie. I could gush about her for a while, but I'll try to keep my comments brief. Uh, Kylie joined us in 2018 as the Montana Shared Catalog Trainer. And so she works with our, how many libraries now? Nearly 200 libraries across the state of Montana. And she's the sole trainer and provides training on all manner of uh, topics related to using the Montana Shared Catalog system, which is a very technical system. Kylie takes that technical knowledge and translates it into an approachable and understandable um, learning experience for our for our shared catalog users. And so over the last few years, she's done a phenomenal amount of work building our shared catalog knowledge base, which is an online resource that shared catalog members can access, learn how to use the system and find answers to their questions. And she's continuously been a lifelong learner. She's expanded her skill set through taking coursework in instructional design and has applied that knowledge in her work, not because she was asked to, but because she had an interest in doing that. And um, Kylie has led shared catalog members through training on some major system changes over the last five years. The catalog has become a lot more sophisticated, I would say, as we've migrated from uh, one reporting system to another, which was a very major shift. There was a rollout of our very first shared catalog app, which was a major event for the consortium. And she's led onboarding trainings for new member libraries, um, including during the pandemic when everything had to go virtual. She managed that very gracefully. She's led go live training for seven library systems, including some really large systems such as Great Falls, uh, Lewis and Clark in uh, well, Lewis and Clark County, and uh, most recently the Billings Public Schools. Uh, so very big projects that she's led and has been very well appreciated at all of those systems. Um, her colleagues say that she has a talent for establishing a rep rapport with her audience and has uh, is a wonderful teammate. She's always willing to pitch in. And I would say from personal experience that She's one of the most affirming, kind people I know. She always has something nice to say about people, and it's understandable how she makes learning um, very accessible and a good experience for our users. So thank you, Kylie, for your work over the last five years. Wonderful. Thank you, thank Kara. You. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Um, I really appreciate working with all of you. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kylie. And then I want to recognize Marilyn Bennett. Marilyn was nominated by the State Library and yesterday received the Governor's Award for Excellence in Service. And I just wanted to share with the commission uh, our nomination of Marilyn. 
Maryland has sustained and grown the state library's programs and services through a tumultuous year. She managed the seamless transition of talking book services to an outside contract, leading to a 79% increase in circulation, 278 new patrons, cost savings, and program efficiencies. She helped to coordinate the move of our modular recording studio to the Montana Department of Trans Transportation, allowing expanded use by multiple programs and agencies to produce audio recordings. In a first for the State Library, Marilyn collaborated with the Utah State Library to produce an audio recording of Thunderous, a Montana written graphic novel for national distribution with additional recording being completed in Browning to include Montana native voices. Marilyn has grown the State Library's research resources by extend, expanding consortium collections, agreements with publishers and ebook selections to our OverDrive collection. This was all accomplished amidst the departure of her staff and a building flood that left the State Library offices uninhabitable. And uh, I have a wonderful photo of Marilyn and the governor. She received her award yesterday. I'll, I'll oh. share this photo with the commission so you have a chance to oh. see it. Marilyn, we're just so grateful to have you on staff and uh, for your steady leadership and determination in helping us to make these significant transitions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am very, very honored to accept this award and work with such amazing people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. It's nice. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm really yeah. wondering when Tracy has ever been frantic. Yeah. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen that. Oh. All right. So thank you, staff, for your continued dedication and hard work. We we sincerely appreciate everything that you've done and, and, and you all deserve the awards and the recognition. Okay, the first action item on the agenda is the consent agenda concerning the minutes from June 14th and the 22nd, July 11th, August 9th, September 6th of 2023, and also the talking book policies. Does anyone want anything pulled from the consent agenda to be discussed separately? Any of the minutes or anything pulled? If if I could, Robin, real quick. This is Elsie. Yes. Um, yes. Just a little bit of information on the talking book. Um, has there been any challenges from our patrons that um, uh, that there have been um, incursions with books being lost or misused or anything to require um, anything at all? To have these, to have the policies put into play. In other words, is there a, a purpose and a reason that has given us where we have to have, I believe these are tighter than they've been before. And if I could just have a little bit of information. I know, um, I understand on the consent agenda, I don't want to be dilatory in our agenda items today, but I wanted to be have an understanding of if there is a reason and a purpose why. Uh, superintendent, the, the primary policies are actually being rescinded because under our contract with the state of Utah, the, that contract follows those terms. So there really isn't a change in those policies, except to reflect that those policies are, are now incorporated into that contract for service. The new yes. policy that was proposed at your August meeting is a policy that allows us to work more closely with different kinds of institutions. Um, that have in their service patrons that would qualify for talking book services so that through those institutions, more people can have access to talking book services. Thank you for the clarification. And I'm sure there's data to substantiate moving forward on more patrons and more use as we move forward with these contracts. That's correct. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Are books kept in good condition? Um, well, they're, the, the they're audio. audio. They're right. Audio but I mean, are they returning in good condition? Um, almost all of them are downloaded or, or sent on okay. like cartridges. That's them. what I would think. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know why it said books and equipment are kept in good condition. That's not referring to the, the equipment. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we accept the consent agenda as is. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, we will now vote on the motion, which is to accept the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Okay. Aye. All opposed say aye. no. I was an I also, Genevieve. Okay. The consent agenda has been approved by a voice vote. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the fiscal year 2023 fourth quarter financial report. Are there any questions that need to be asked to make this vote, to make this more understandable? Anyone? Madam Chair, um, as we reviewed this the other day in the finance subcommittee, it was, um, maybe I can pull it up. It shows um, unspent budget authority of 200 plus thousand in general fund. And I'm <laughs> suggesting that we retain that for reversion at the end of the biennium. That we keep an eye on that during the course of the, the second half of the biennium. And so that we have a reversion to offer the general fund at that time. I'm guessing that Jenny would have an input on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. 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 Um, well, first, my recommendation just for the, the motion and the clarification of the order that we we, we have a motion. Um, you're suggesting that we amend the budget. And, and at this point, we're accepting the finance report from so, 2023. So yeah. I think, um, you know, a clarification for a new action item, perhaps at your December meeting to amend the budget. And that would give us time to understand the, the implications of that kind of motion. That's fine. Madam Chair, so the motion is to accept the report. Yes. And that's a good good motion. And I would, uh, if, if the motion's been made, I would second that. And then we will have continued discussions at a further meeting. Okay, we, I don't believe we've had a motion quite yet. It, could I have a motion to accept the fiscal year 2023 fourth quarter report? I move that. Okay, so Tom moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, and Tammy will second it. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we accept the fiscal year 2023 quarter report as is. Okay, any further discussion? Is there any public comment? Okay, if not, I'm sorry? No? Okay, background next. Okay. May it, I ask a question? Yes. May. So, Tom, were you wanting to amend or just point out that the 200000 that's extra, if it's not spent in the next, between now and December, go back to the general fund? Um, or not December, but when would it be? Well, I, think, I think that's part of a separate discussion. So, I think we should have action on this motion. So the, the motion is simply to accept the report as it stands, that yes, the report is right. valid. Yeah. Um, but for future, we need to talk about the fact that there's 200,000 of general fund that hasn't been spent in this half of the biennium as of the closing of the books. When do you want to have that discussion? At the December meeting. At the oh, December okay. meeting. Yeah. Okay. And, and so that we don't find ways to to spend what hasn't been spent in the next half of the biennium, arbitrarily. Okay. All right, okay, so we will discuss that. Okay, so any further discussion? All right, if, if there is none, then we will now vote on the motion, which is by Tom Burnett to accept the fiscal year 23 quarter report and Sorry, the, that's my, that's my okay. Mind. The the motion is to accept the fiscal year twenty three quarter report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All aye. opposed. Thank you. Sorry. All opposed say no. Okay, the twenty twenty three fourth quarter report has been approved by a voice vote. All right. So we're continuing on. So um, we will look at the commission bylaws. No, do you, you have, have to do the, the first oh, I'm sorry. Quarter. The first quarter. Yeah. Oh, you missed that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, the first mm -hmm. quarter. Yeah. It was it's it's up here too. It's in the online yeah. version. Okay, yeah. sorry. So. Okay, so 
Now we need to discuss the first, first quarter. FY24. FY24. I move four. we accept the first quarter report. 24 report. And Genevieve, that should be the 24. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's been, do we have a second? I second it. All right. All right. It has been moved and seconded to accept the um, fiscal year 24 first quarter report. We will now go on and have a vote. Um, okay. All, <laughs> point all, of clarification. all those point of clarification. Yeah. I'm still confused as to where on the agenda you're putting your discussion in December. Would it be at this part? Be no, financial, it would be financial discussion. discussion. Will this be brought, brought back up then in December, the 2024? It will be added to the December agenda. agenda. It will be added to the yes. agenda. Yeah, okay, we'll thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so, so all those in favor of accepting the fiscal year 24 first quarter report, please say aye. Okay. Aye. aye. All opposed aye. say all opposed say no. Okay, the so the 20 that fiscal year 24 first quarter report has been passed unanimously with a voice voice vote. All right. Okay, now excuse me, continuing on, we're going to look at the commission. No federation. 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 Where did I get missed this? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> but, okay. Genevieve, you're not keeping me on track. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so now we need to discuss the fiscal or the fiscal year 23 federation reports. And we would like some public comment. I'll ask for a motion to accept the report. Okay, accept the report. Okay, we will, I will, I would like a motion to accept the fiscal year 23 federation report. So moved. Okay, I'll second. second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded to accept the fiscal year 2023 federation report. Madam Chair, discussion. Discussion, yes. We want to ask for public comment. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Discussion, comment, public comments, anyone? Mm -hmm. Federation coordinators want to share any comments? Is that what you'd like to do? Yes. I wasn't sure yes. what we mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so we have five of our coordinators here. Um, the stagebrush coordinator, Sarah, I don't think she's online. She had a sick child and couldn't come. Um, and she's new, so she would not have as much to report positively <laughs> as um, other coordinators. But we have coordinators. Well, I'm here, just so you know, Sarah's here. Oh, yeah. But you can listen. You don't have to report yet because I know we haven't had a meeting this stage mm -hmm. yet. We'll meet in a couple of weeks. So if you so. want to come sit here, because we're going to get nice on there. Whenever, whenever you're speaking, you guys are going to sit. Yeah. I'm a little closer to this. Okay. Actually, I'm going to turn it over to more of the coordinators okay. mm -hmm. yeah. who can report from the federations. So we couldn't mm -hmm. decide which one to go first. Mm -hmm. We tend to go alphabetical, but Lori felt she always went first. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we wanted to offer volunteers um, who were prepared. And then they usually say, yeah, we have the same thing to report anyway, because they're all very good. Now, do you want to say a few things from your federation? Okay. You had great comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I am Valerie Frank. I am the Pathfinder coordinator. It's so fun to put faces going on. <laughs> People I've been online with. I'm from the Blaine County Library in Chinook. Um, there are 15 libraries on the Pathfinder. We go from Glacier County on the west side to Blaine County on the east side and south to um, Cascade County. Approximately 48% of our budget, our Federation funds were spent on statewide projects shared catalog, library to go, and OCLC. 10 of the 15 libraries use federation funds for OCLC. Um, in preparation for this meeting, I reminded the libraries about the task force review of the federation structure and relevance. I asked for any thoughts they would like me to share with you about why federations should stay as they are, or ideas to make them better, or reasons they may think federations are no longer relevant. And I'd like to share some of those responses. Two of the directors started while we were still doing virtual meetings. They both feel really strongly about meeting face-to-face -face twice a year, one calling it invaluable. Um, words repeated 
by multiple directors were camaraderie, collaboration, commiserate, mentor, <laughs> team building, growth, discussion, and understanding. And having a state consultant available based on federation is priceless. Federation meetings are the only regional meetings and are more affordable for our smaller libraries. One director ended with, I don't have any ideas for how to make federations better, aside from more funding to allow federations to offer more opportunities for libraries. And that is how I will end, unless you have your questions for me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abby Dooley. I'm the library director for the North Lake County Public Library District in Polson, um, and also the coordinator for the Tamarack Federation. And our federation covers all of Western Montana, all the way from the Bitterroot up to the Canadian border in Eureka. Uh, this last spring, we met at the Missoula Public Library for our annual retreat, and we received two wonderful trainings from the State Library, uh, one on disaster preparedness and another on board training. Um, both of the trainings were excellent. We got a lot of great information out of them, and it's always wonderful for us to get together and be able to talk about what's happening in our libraries. Um, every spring and fall, our libraries share their joys and concerns with one another. Uh, this spring, our Federation libraries, some of their concerns included things like inflation and rising costs, which I think are concerns for everyone. Um, some reduced funding from city and county governments, aging facilities, and those that are too small to serve the growing population in Western Montana, which is exploding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. um, concern for how to continue the popular hotspot program if state library or if state funding ceases and staffing is always a concern. Um, but with the concerns come a lot of good things going on as well at our libraries, including uh, lots of continuing education opportunities, which are back in person mm -hmm. after the pandemic, which has been wonderful. Um, renovations planned are underway, well-attended community programs, and lots of new people and families coming into our libraries, which is the blessing of the growth. Um, several of our libraries, including mine, are working with First Lady Susan Gianforte on Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, and that has been an amazing program for our Good. communities Good. and for our children. <clears throat> uh, the Tamarack Federation Library spent 46% of our 23 funds on MSL statewide projects, so that is uh, the Montana Share Catalog, OCLC, Courier, and Montana Library to Go. Um, these services are utilized statewide by libraries throughout the state and all of the citizens. Um, and so spending on these, you know, it'd be great if we could get additional funding for these programs so that we can offer other services and, and programs for our communities. Um, let's see. And then the courier system, of course, is so, so important for us. I'm a, <clears throat> excuse me, about four, let's see, we have 14 libraries and I think I wanna say 11 of our libraries in the Tamarack Federation are part of the partner sharing group. And so the courier is incredibly important for our library to be able to share materials. Um, and books are still representing the highest circulation for most libraries, but digital books are increasing in popularity every year. Oh, yay. Yes. <laughs> um, our library became a purchaser for Montana Library to Go this past summer, and it really opened my eyes to how difficult it is to keep up with the demand. Um, we went through the process in July, and after adding additional copies of books with the highest hold times, there wasn't a lot of money left for new things. And then you have to pick and choose. And so additional funding for Montana Library to Go, I think is going to be essential as we've seen that just start to, to really grow over the last few years. Um, but aside from the funding, our Federation really enjoys getting together at our retreats each spring. And our retreat this spring will be held in my newly renovated library in Pleasanton. Excited for that. Um, on April 26th and 27th. And then we have our fall meeting next week on October 19th at 6.15 on Zoom. So thank you. Yes. So um, your courier service, how, did, is, how does it work for you? It's very easy for us. Um, okay. Because we are on Highway 93 well, between Missoula and, and Kalispell, it's very easy for us. Mm -hmm. It's really, I think, fairly easy for Western Montana. Um, Libby and Eureka are kind of our outliers. And then also a little bit, I think, for like Plains, 
um, and Thompson Falls is not part of the, the oh. partner system, but um, you know, I what think- What do they use, I'm assuming, but what do they use then? Well, they're not part of a sharing group that oh, okay. I'm aware of, so they don't really have one. Uh, they would use there, the mail probably. Okay. <clears throat> um, which is unfortunate because really there is the road that right. would make a big circle. Right. So it would be great to get all of our libraries in mm-hmm. Western Montana on the Courier. Um, but, you know, I know it's harder for libraries, this side of the state travel is a lot harder, mm-hmm. but for Western Montana, it works well though. Okay. I'm sorry to, sorry to do this, but if I could, um, the representative from the previous federation, I was just too slow here with tech to get my question in, but I would like to ask, did any library trustees, do any library trustees attend your federation meetings? Yes, we actually have excellent attendance at our federation meetings. Um, we updated our bylaws a few years ago and um, attendance at the meetings is tied to their funding. Um, we, we tend to have excellent attendance once we did that. <laughs> so does okay. each federation have their own bylaws? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Hi hey everyone, I'm Donna Underwood. I'm the library director for the Sheridan County Library in Plentywood. So way, way up in this part of the state. Um, I'm the Federation Coordinator for the Golden Plains Library Federation. I've been the coordinator for about two years now, I think. Um, to piggyback <laughs> on Abby and Val, uh, very, very similar um, expenditures for our Federation money. It's uh, for conferences, trainings, OCLC, Montana Library to Go, um, shared catalog, software, um, programming, all these all these purchases, expenditures, I think, uh, do fit nicely in with um, the um, the charge of the Federation with um, resource sharing, which I think is, is important. Um, my Federation um, opposite Abbey is a little different. We are on the farthest northeast part of the state. Um, geography, if you've been up there, um, I'm sure you know geography <laughs> can be a, a little bit of a barrier. Um, we're a small conference. We're uh, five libraries in this federation. So we're a small, pretty close, intimate group. Um, for the most part, our federation has been trucking along really well. Um, we've had a little bit of turnover with regard to trustees. So we've got some new trustees coming in. They seem very um, interested, active, motivated. So that's been really fun. Um, we have one retirement coming up. Uh, for those of you who know Janine Brookie in the Phillips County mm-hmm. Library, she's retiring after close to 30 years, I think. Mm-hmm. So she's retiring at the end of November. So we'll be having a new um, library director coming on in uh, Phillips County, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, our federation really values the federation in terms of its ability to connect um, because we are far away from everyone else. It's mm-hmm. nice for us to be able to connect with each other. Um, we like meeting face-to-face. It's a, it's, a, it's a good way for us to have discussions, to offer support, to brainstorm ideas, any, any problems that we may be having in our little neck of the woods. Um, you know, it's kind of weird, the funding in our area. We've got libraries that have trouble with funding. Um, I'm lucky in that I, I don't have trouble with funding. I have a good board. I have commissioners that um, work really well with me. So I'm fortunate, but I've got some libraries that aren't. So we talk about that a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, we've just we've just got a good a good team up there. Um, we are not on the courier. Uh, we are not in any of the sharing systems. It's actually cheaper for me to do um, mail for my interlibrary loaning than it is to do on the courier right now. Mm-hmm. Someday, you know, I know Kara's working hard at it. <laughs> uh, but to, to, to get the courier further further east, um, get it over to the North Dakota border. And I, I'm, I'm sure at some point that will happen. But right now it's the feasibility of just, you know, we're so remote and the population isn't what it is over here. So, um, you know, there's some challenges with that, but. So John, how many miles does your area cover? Like from your furthest library? So basically Malta to the North Dakota border. So that's right. like four hours. I wanna know how, how many? <laughs> we t- we go in hours, yeah. you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I get that. So Which it's for four hours. Is, is 
a lot uh, longer, longer yeah. and some people it's short. So, so I, I didn't hear, was it four hours? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, about, you know, okay. four hour drive. But you drove six hours to get here. I did. So, mm -hmm. and probably mostly interstate. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. But Highlands, still, you know. six hours. Yeah. So, I mean, it just mm -hmm. shows you where, how remote it is out yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think we do really well at providing services for um, the people who live in our area and our and our patrons and you know and the di the digital books are probably the easiest way to share I mean because I know OCLC yeah. or yeah. or they charge the vendors end up charging yeah. more for each for each copy of the book that you get uh, yeah the ebook the ebook e purchasing model is very challenging it is for very challenging and, and, I was a recent um, purchaser too yeah like okay. like Abby said there's such it demand is, yeah that yes. a lot of our our resources yeah. that we do have goes to just filling that demand and not building the collection. Right. So, I mean, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be nice to get those vendors to change their ways? We're not challenged taking yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. I guess I'm looking high, aren't I? <laughs> that's okay. No, that's okay. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the news from Golden Plains. Any any questions or anything? I'm sorry, um, Commissioner Burnett, that you couldn't join us at our Library Federation meeting we had in September. We were Good looking operation. forward to having you too. So I'm sorry about that. But any other questions? I'm unfamiliar with your terrain up there. I lived in Whitewater. You're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> White Rock. Whitewater. Whitewater. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I heard of white. Is that yeah, a city? North of Malta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought when I was on the Montana High School Association board, I knew every school in Montana. That's way up on the border, it's like not, Canada. It doesn't have sports. No, they that's do. a bind with two other schools. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> I know. I know. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm Lori Kennedy. I'm the Dillon Public Library Director and the Broad Valleys Federation Coordinator. Um, I'm also piggybacking on those guys of what we spend our money on. We spend it, um, a lot of it goes to Montana Library to go is probably a good chunk of it. And we did, we had some technology this year, databases, things like that. So we work hard. The one thing that my we meet, we have a retreat that we meet in Anaconda in March. Um, we eat, meet at the Forge Hotel, so we keep it central for everybody. My federations run from uh, Phillipsburg and Drummond all the way over to Livingston and West Yellowstone, mm -hmm. all the way up to Helena and down to Dillon. Wow. So we are that huge yeah, chunk. Sure. So it's easier for us to meet centrally. Sure. Um, my my uh, directors really like meeting once a year. Uh, one of their things was that we are able to have trainings that cannot be housed really anywhere else. For example, this last year we had CPR first aid, which takes you know four hours, and so we had CPR first aid, and they were all certified if they chose to be. Um, and you can't do that at a regular state library meeting to have that that much. Mm -hmm. This year, they would like to have a mental health first aid. That is an eight hour class to be certified in mental health mm -hmm. first aid. And so we will be doing that. That will be our sole. Oh, wow. And we are going to do there was a last year we did a, a mental health um, we had some ladies come in and talked about personal mental health and our employees and how to help them if they're having struggles and different activities that we can do for de-escalation and stuff like that. So that was really nice too as well last year. But we do meet and then we Zoom in the fall online. So that's how we spend our money. And do you guys have any questions? Would you prefer to meet twice a year or... I mean, you don't in have person. the funding. Well, we do that so that we can use our funding for the retreat. Right. So um, our federation does pay. We don't pay for their mileage, but our federation does pay for the hotel rooms. And um, well, the, with the hotel, you get a free breakfast. Um, and then we have usually lunch, dinner. Um, we do usually a buffet, like a taco buffet or potato buffet kind of oh, thing. Okay. So we do pay for that for one of their meals. Um we usually meet uh, Thursday at noon and we are done Friday afternoon. So we do a Thursday, Friday. My library is like during that, doing that during the week. 
and not taking away from their weekends. Right. So Definitely. that was one of our changes. And we moved from February to March as well, because driving just mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. interesting in February. However, driving in March is yeah. really better. <laughs> right. But, for sure. yes. Attendance, what percent of your potential attendees are attending the, the in-person? Well, we have 22 libraries. And last year we had almost 40 attendees. So um, for our business meeting, um, we do do online and in person. So um, the retreat for the, the trainings and stuff like that, if they can't make it, then for the business meeting, they have to be there for the business meeting portion of it, which is the last hour of our trainings. And then we do Zoom so that everybody can attend. And we get probably, I would say, 50% trustees and 50% directors at oh, least. So you do have trustees kind of do. Oh, yes, lot. yes, yes. We have a lot of trustees. Okay. Cool. And we get multiple trustees from multiple places. Okay. So I think we had two from Belgrade. We had a couple from Bozeman, mm -hmm. um, Clancy, Dylan. So we, we okay. do get multiple trustees from each place. Mm -hmm. Sounds like an incredible... Mm -hmm experience i mean that's the those are really good classes to learn i'm glad to know you know cpr <laughs> <laughs> these meetings get quite stressful well i'm actually and a first right responder right. so <laughs> well, good i go a little beyond that <laughs> so did you do the training mm -hmm. oh, yeah i did great. to keep up my certification right but my um because i needed my to upgrade my um, cpr oh, but i did a bsl one and in, instead of the regular what everybody else did because I needed oh, that extension. Right, and so she was willing to to take me in last so that I could do that extra piece of it. But so question. Yeah. Is it still accurate? Staying alive, staying alive. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Even yeah. practice staying that. alive. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> that's what I know about CPA. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. BGC. BGC. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're all, all we are. We're all, <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, very interesting. Thank thank you. Awesome. I remember and, you and from the totally Missoula conference. Yes. We're very mm -hmm. outgoing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is, if that's what Sometimes. that means. <laughs> but, yeah. I get it. Yeah. I've got that description. <laughs> You're very. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, I'm so happy to meet these faces. Good morning. Yeah. Nancy Schmidt. I am the director of the Laurel Public Library oh. and South Central Federation coordinator. Is this where I just sit here and go, Ibid? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. Ditto, <laughs> ditto, huh? Right, exactly. Well, we'll open up my book. I only wrote a few pages. Sorry, guys. So I just want to thank you, commissioners, and Jenny for having me come today. Um, it's always nerve wracking. I don't care how long I've been doing this. Eight years. <laughs> I still have troubles getting through meetings. Um, so I'm going to try to give you just a brief report. I'm gonna, I wrote down my notes, but I'm going to try to go through them. So in South Central Federation of Libraries, we have 18 libraries located in, uh, guess what, South Central Montana. Um, we're neither the largest federation nor the smallest, but we are as diverse culturally and geographic, geographically as the state of Montana itself. So we go from Denton above Stanford down to the state line where George is. And then we go from, think here, Forsyth and Cold Strip and Bighorn County over to uh, Big Timber. Oh so my goodness. We, we have a. Oh my goodness. So I graphed it thinking that we were going to be doing retreats to find the central location of my service area and it's round up <laughs> so, yeah you have Den denton. denton yeah denton up above stanford oh well, i know yeah we're 40 <laughs> miles from there mm -hmm. yeah that's crazy mm -hmm. i thought we were north central mm -hmm. and here you are wow well, they put in the south central, south central. yeah <laughs> Very I guess if you drew the line, you know, Livingston is what mm -hmm. center of the state right. or something like that. Lewistown yeah. is. Lewistown, 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 yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, so we have um, one of the largest libraries in the state, Billings, as well as one of the smallest, which I believe is more, if not Denton mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or Winifred. 
yeah, they're very small libraries um, needing just as much funding as the rest of us, you know. So it's uh, interesting trying to find um, funding for libraries of all sizes. So the, the monies that we get from the Federation um, is well used. You know, like everybody else, we do the state projects and we do um, trainings and, you know, just um, some of us need it for our technology. It's just, you know, um, they consistently use them for our um, expenses of the shared catalog, Montana Library to Go, OCLC, Overdrive. I myself use Cyberian, but I know that other libraries use Envisionware or Librarica. You know, those are software uh, for our computers and, and stuff like that. Um, so 40% of the budgeted monies is used for statewide projects, databases, and electronic resources. Um, technology is, is 14%. So a lot of them do use them for, you know, new computers, uh, new software for um, those computers. Outreach. Uh, library and summer reading programs take up 12% and federation meetings and expenses was 13%. We do meet twice a year um, at various libraries around our federation. It's always been um, a part of our outreach to move from library to library to hold our meetings. This last two weeks ago, it was in my library in Laurel. And before that, it was in Harlequin. So yeah, we do, some of us do travel a little bit. Some of us get to stay right where we are. <laughs> but, and we do that so that we can see the other libraries, see how they're run, see what setups they have. And, and just, we just love the one-on-one. -on -one. There's no way that we could not um, hold in-person meetings and not really become more of a partnership mm -hmm. or, kind of a sisterhood for lack of a brotherhood, for lack of a better phrase, sorry, not leaving the guys out. <laughs> but if we did, if we only held meetings online, I think we would lose a lot. We definitely. I agree. Um, that one-on-one yes. -on -one is just amazing because it gives us the opportunity to take those few minutes and step aside and, and visit with our partners mm -hmm. um, and say, hey, you know, have you experienced this or have you experienced that? And you know what? How did you deal with it? How did how did you handle? And you can't do that on Zoom. Not as easily. Right. It's it's really hard. Madam um, Chair, may yes. I make a comment? Yes. I, you know, was with you all for a year on mm -hmm. Zoom, mm -hmm. and this time right here mm -hmm. is more valuable than all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because definitely. there's something about meeting, for me, meeting mm -hmm. person to person. Um, I I just understand better. Right. And I understand you better and mostly I think all of you talk more openly mm -hmm. I think when we zoom we only get certain people mm -hmm. and it's okay. just a blessing to have faces mm -hmm. so yes. I want to I want to reiterate everybody who's saying that that meeting time for a face-to-face -face at least once a year is crucial right right Definitely. um yeah when it's a zoom meeting I'm more of a lurker I, I don't participate, uh -huh. you know, I just, sorry, I love technology to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I hate technology. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I said to a certain extent, <laughs> you know, you give me that, that new computer or that new iPad or whatever, and I'm going to be all over that mm -hmm. and I'm going to be all over the programs, but this, mm -hmm. it, I'm not a fan by any means. And it really limits how much training and stuff like that that we can do, which we do oh, offer sure. a couple hours of training after mm -hmm. our business meeting and then our lunch. Mm -hmm. We provide a lunch for them. Do you get trustees at your meetings? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Linda here is the, the chair of the Federation. Yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. comments mm -hmm. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it's very informational. And we do. I'm going to say, well, this last time we had every library but one attended. And if it wasn't a trustee, it was a director and a trustee or just a director that attended. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reason. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we definitely try. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move on <laughs> to our next notes. Um, 
So one of our greatest areas of resource sharing is our book kits in our federation. Um, currently, we have 369. We are getting ready to weed a few of them because they've never circulated. But that doesn't mean that we've stopped growing our collection. Um, we've had a number of libraries around the state offer us multiple copies of books and say, hey, do you want this for book kits? So, yeah, free is good. But free is always good. <laughs> you know, doesn't cost us anything. We do spend a small fortune to mail things out to those libraries that cannot either pick them up or are not on the courier. And we are on the courier, us and Stillwater County and Forsyth and kind of Colster, I think, oh, okay. are on the courier. Those are the only libraries in our federation. But I have enough libraries close enough that their people come and pick up book kits. So that'll save us a little bit in, in uh, postage. Be expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I figured it out. And the cost of my courier um, for every item that I sent out, and we count the kit as one item, that's 23 cents is what it costs. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, as far as our budget reports, um, some of you look, and it looks like that we overspent. We didn't. <laughs> Some of the libraries reported the monies that they used. If the item, my shared catalog was $3,000. If I had used my federation funds for that, I would have overspent almost $800. But that would have come from another fund in my library. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those, we did not overspend. They just used part of another mm -hmm. fund. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it just kind of depends on when the bills came, when the monies came, that kind of thing. So. Um, without federation funding, I would say that um, some of the libraries would not be able to afford the shared catalog, okay. OCLC, Montana Library to Go, um, Overdrive. And we still continue to offer new books or updated technology to their patrons. So it's we have to make a choice. Without this funding, would we buy books? or would we provide those, I have 12 computers for the public at my library, would I provide those 12 computers updated and the software to go with them? So, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and so, thank you thank again. You so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so basically what I'm, I'm hearing is federations perhaps could use more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, is there any chance also that you could change the, would you want to change what the federations look like? I mean, as some of them are so large, would you be able to make them put some, like some of the towns in different federation? What is your, I, well, I, just if, a question. If you look at it geographically, like you were looking at her map, we're yes. all yeah. pretty much the same mileage. I think okay. it's kind of how they did it. That's what they did. And it's okay. just where the libraries fell. I mean, if you were to change them and move them to different federations, you're going to need to create more federations. Okay. And so I think that would be harder than I mean, our group really likes knowing what's going on in the big libraries because we have Bozeman Belgrade and then we have small libraries like Drummond. Mm -hmm. So it's nice because we can all help each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an it's an option, but you're going to have to create a lot more. Um, Madam yes, Chair, yes. one of the comments that when I was on the Federation as a commission for a year, which was really eye opening, I learned so much. Um, they do go to meetings in other areas if it's more convenient. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Some of them said they do crossover, right? Right. Oh, no, we okay. have we had okay. we've had um other libraries from other federations come um, into in, Broad Valleys. Um they don't get the Broad Valley spending money, things like that. Okay. Um we also have kind of a special library because we have the prison library. Mm -hmm. The prison library does not get federation funding, but they are allowed to come to our mm -hmm. federation trainings and do that kind of thing. And so we help them out that way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair, I have two questions. Yes. Okay, number one, we did defeat at our budget meeting um, giving an increase to the federations. I know that I was real uncomfortable with that. I know you were. Very um, and I think Peggy was. I'm sitting there thinking, can we get that back? Yeah. <laughs> I know. 
I know. I know. And I was uncomfortable with it, but I want to share why, because I didn't know where the money was going to go. And I felt like we needed to do more trustee training. That's where I wanted to see it go. Um, I think it, it's so important to get the trustees. Um, we really want to get the control of our libraries back to where it should be, which is with you locally. Okay, and we feel so, and I can't speak for everybody, but many of us who were concerned about that, um, that's our goal, is to get control of libraries always back to the hands of the closest people serving the people. And so I think if we, we were kind of trying to figure out a way to aim it at the um, training of the trustees. And I'm very, very happy to hear that the trustees are, are getting active or are active mm -hmm. in in um, and um, some of the groups had talked about when I was on the phone calls with you that they had trouble getting trustees at any of their meetings and others said oh no they come um, but I think their training of their government responsibilities they have huge responsibilities mm -hmm. and so I just want to say for me when we discuss that extra two hundred thousand dollars out of the first quarter, I a top priority for me would be to get that some of that money back into the hands of the federation to help with the training of the legal and budgetary responsibilities of those, whether they're called trustees or commissioners, um, and into the hands of the library, and into the yeah, and into the hands of the Federation. That would be a big priority for me. So I just want to share that. Um, the other thing, I know this is sort of a silly question, but do you take used books, people? All the time. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. Okay, because I, I belong to a book club and we read wonderful books, but we don't, and, you know, Madame Tams, we just, we read the Paris Librarian. There's 20 copies of it. it you know, we just finished Madame Tams' Circle of Friends. It's an incredible book. These are books that we're all saying, and I happen to have, although it doesn't sound important to any of you, 20 collections of C.J. Box, but everybody <laughs> wants C.J. Box. Yes, they do. And if I could give my collection of 20 C.J. Box books to the library, I'd be very happy. Um, is, but, I wouldn't know that. <laughs> because they are popular. And, and, and so yeah. who do we, is there some place we can give used books that are very good? These are the you know, yeah, ones that are really library. cutting for stone and yeah. Your library, I'm sure it's well, Bozeman probably has what they need, mm -hmm. but um, well, I'd rather get it to some of the federations. I was going to say you could you could hand it you could give them to the federations or send an email to the federation coordinators and say, hey, can you find out if your libraries would like these books? And we would. Perfect. What we do with our books when we get donations is we look to see if we can add them to our collection. That's the first thing we do, and we compare our copies. Yes. So we make sure that we have the because they get used a lot. We're yeah. small library. Or lost. Um, or lost, yes. So we do replace and um, add to our collection from donations. The second thing we do with them is we have a book sale, which helps fund our library. Okay. So we have a book yep. sale with them. Um, and the third thing we do is we have a, a agreement with the White Hat Coalition. So we send our paper about backs overseas to our troops while they're overseas. We also send them to the state library. We have some, or not the state library, the state prison. So we have somebody that travels along and drops them off at the prisons mm -hmm. so that they have paperback books as well. And they go all the way along. So those books are really good. I am so glad that we have discussed <laughs> this. This is wonderful, yes. Yeah. I, I would like to, I'm helping Ralph, I'm, I'm a so trustee funny. with the Stillwater uh, public library and I would like to add on to what uh, Commissioner Hall's comments about the, the, about the I, I believe that the federations are really underutilized in terms of trustees. I think yes. we've been working at South Central trying to get trustees more active, to make, making it be, them more, um, uh, to bring, make the meetings more attractive to them. And so I really would like to ensure that the trustees remain a focus because it is our, you know, we have to be there to vote because we are, we have the fiduciary responsibility. We need more training. I also think that the trustee, the, the boards, that is an avenue to train community leaders. Yeah. You know, so I, and I think there's, there's just tremendous opportunities if we can get people there. I'd like to see more than one trustee for, you know, rather than having one that has to be there or just the director to get as many people as we can to these meetings. We have to make them attractive. It is hard because the distances are great. Time is always a, a constraint. 
but I really think that it's something that we need to work at. Yes. I wanted to say a few things too as the South Central Federation Chair. I think these could be excellent learning opportunities. I know there's more and more available from the Montana Library Association virtually, but trustees are required to take three hours of training every year together. It could be a wonderful opportunity for that. Um, I think it's wonderful that we can meet and find out what we agree on, what we disagree on. How, how trustees, we do need the training on board, board training, we need budget training, we need more education. And it, so it needs to be things that are valuable for the trustees because if it's not valuable to the trustees, they don't attend. CPR is wonderful, but that's better for the directors because hopefully, well, it's better for everybody. <laughs> yeah. but, yeah. but if you're if you're having problems in the library, you want the director to know how to help you instead of calling the trustee to run down. The <laughs> yeah. So my point is that they could be edu wonderful educational opportunities. The fiduciary, you know, we need to remind trustees what their value is and why the legislature set up this mm -hmm. whole situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great that the directors can network, but they also go to the MLA, they have fall retreats, they have lots of opportunities. The trustees usually don't travel to MLA. I've gone to some and one year they said, great, we had like 10 trustees. I was like, how many trustees are there? Yeah. <laughs> right. And look at the size yes. of the convention and there's 10 people there. So the regional stuff does work better for the training for the trustees and we need to utilize that and expand it. Okay. Madam Chair, yes. one final question. Um, I know book clubs would pay the postage because they are fanatic about getting their books they just <laughs> love yes, into the hands of someone. If somebody here, one of the Federation directors, would be willing to talk to me at the lunch break. I would be happy to start trying to round up book club people who would in around the state that would be willing to send books they read on to you. If, if you just give me the names, I'll start up. I'll try to have a book club federation thing going, <laughs> if that's okay with you. And I have one last thing. It did look like we overspent, but part of it was when we turned in our expenses. Um, one of the libraries included their state aid as well as their federation so it looked oh, like we were over but they mm -hmm. actually you know they used their allotted amount plus the other part was reported so that was where the, the discrepancy right. Right. and Thanks if i might yes. add the reporting module this year was a little difficult for some of the mm -hmm. um, directors to understand we were used to us the model where we could just put our expense add another and add another and add another and then this one you had to submit each individual one so, and a lot of the money, from what I understand, that goes to you from the two hundred twenty-five thousand in the co-severance goes right back to the Montana State Library. Well, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it pretty much goes to you right. and yeah. then back to them. Yeah, and I was saying um, at a couple different meetings that I've been through the trainings over the, this last year was if this if these programs were set aside and paid for through the state library. Mm -hmm. um, that would save my library about ten thousand dollars, which doesn't. Okay, so the like shared book catalog, or the or the the, the talking book, um, uh, Montana, to go, Montana, Montana, library, the, Montana library to go, to go. OCLC. Right, and I was drive. wondering, is there is it possible to have free. that as a free service? So yes, um, and you'll remember in the last legislative session, we, we asked had. the governor to include funding oh, for those programs in his right, budget. Right, right, that right. didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But I was going to remind the commission that in your coming meetings between now and next June, we will be talking about what our legislative requests okay. should be for the 2025 legislative session. So yeah. I hope you will keep in mind okay. the things that you're hearing in libraries when we talk about what those requests will be. Keep nagging. <laughs> but could it be in our budget anyway? Because it's important. Right now, we don't have the funding. The 200000 well, we have to have a conversation about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And $200,000 isn't enough. No, but it would help. It, it would help. But yeah, so 10000 for my library, probably less for smaller libraries, more for bigger libraries because of the, the more you, the bigger you are, the more books you have, the more cost. Yeah. Not <laughs> that we want to stop getting books. but And I'm biased, but to me, this is a priority of what we do. Mm -hmm. I know... I just supporting and helping their trustees and getting getting trained at that level is huge. Thank you.
Yes, thank you. Thank Actually, you. Yes. Uh, trustees are not taking advantage of the training that they're given now very, very much. They're not attending much. And mm -hmm. if we um, if we increased funding for that effort, it's uh, the horse to water problem. But it's so, the type of education. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't, sometimes. Yeah. I don't think we're, I would speak for what I've heard over the last year with this group. I don't think we're offering specific training for trustees. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why they, part of why the, this additional money would be aimed at. I, I, I think the trust, I don't know, maybe not, but I think it's worth finding out for one year. Will the trustees attend if it's directed at them? If it's budget, your responsibility, and they start understanding this is your responsibility, you know. I, I don't think so. maybe um, our trustees in our federation. I know that they attend MLA because the state library is very good about offering classes specifically for mm -hmm. trustees. And the consultants come to the libraries um, when we say, "Hey, we have this many new trustees," or whatever. The consultants are willing to come down to the meeting and do trustee trainings. Mm -hmm. And I know that does happen in our federation. Um, there are trainings for the trustees at fall workshop. They are, there are trainings, um, and when we do our federation trainings, we always add in um, a time for our trustees to ask questions and things like that, and we have done specific trustee trainings at our federations, but our trustees are interested in what's, they want to make their library the most successful, and how can we do that? How can we make our libraries in our federation the best, and that is not only trustee training, but also library director training, some things that may not be offered. Our trustees having mental health, if something happens in the library, those trustees know exactly what the librarian did to try to help them. So it will not come back on the librarian. It will not come back on the trustees. Um, just before I left, there's three trustee trainings that are going on through the state library that I sent to all my trustees. And I said, please look into this. But all of my trustees are on other boards. We have somebody that's on the hospital board that does financial, somebody that's on a university board. We have one. And so they're also getting those trainings because they're required for classes in those trainings. They're also getting training in those areas as well that they can implement at the library. Maybe that's the problem is because each federation has different bylaws. There's different. And so maybe right. if you're going to allocate money for trustee training, it should be for budget. It should be for dealing with county, you know, mm -hmm. specific areas that you think would be beneficial to the trustees. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, you know, it sounds like you get great turnout and Tamarack gets really good turnout. Mm -hmm. And ours is mostly, not mostly directors. And we need the directors because we need to know what they need. But... Mm -hmm. But you know, you might want to make it specific rather than just here's more money for training. How about it? Mm -hmm. right. May I ask Jenny a question, yes. Madam Chair? Um, I was curious about the comment that was made. By the way, just the fact they're called directors, commissioners, and um, trustees is an example of how diverse this is. It's completely different for each federation and each library control board situation. So it's it's a great deal of diversity. Um, the three hour training was that just the one federation, or is that your no, federation? That, that's a new requirement under the public library standards that were adopted in twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one for all libraries. For all libraries have a three hour training for their trustees. Mm -hmm. all, all, yeah, all trustees, at least a quorum of their boards, have to earn three continuing education credits every year. Together, that's yes. a group. wonderful. I just mm -hmm. want to say that. Great, thank you. And that's something that we could function from. Carmen, go ahead. Um, Carmen. Speaking from my experience as a trustee up in Kalispell, um, I definitely agree with the comment that there are a lot of networking opportunities for directors and staff, and very, very few, practically none, really aimed at trustees. And to me, as a trustee, it's, it's felt very disempowering. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very difficult to do an excellent job if um, if you're not well educated in what you are supposed to do as a trustee. And um, our library board went almost as a full board to our federation meeting in Missoula to satisfy that new three hour requirement of training together. That's in addition to individual trustees getting their hours of certification, this, this three hours together as a board 
And we were able to do that through the Federation meeting. So that's an, an excellent use of the, of the Federation resources. And I agree that we as a commission should work with the federations to really figure out how to aim them more at the trustees, to empower trustees, to really understand their role and how to function within their particular library because the, the legal um, framework for every library really is very, very different. And mm -hmm. the, the trustees have all the responsibility. According to MCA, they are in charge and responsible for every single thing that happens on, at their library, from the collection development to policies about everything that goes on to programs. It all really is the responsibility of the trustees to oversee it. And they need to be empowered to be knowledgeable and confident in doing their job. Thank you, Carmen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm done. <laughs> Stick a fork in Did anyone else have comments? Okay, are there any other questions from the commission? Yes. I, I would like to ask your permission. I do apologize. I have to leave and I would like to make a comment on a future agenda item. Okay. Is it do I have your permission to do so before yes. I leave? Yes, go ahead. Okay. And that is regarding um the change in regulations regarding the the um libraries with populations over twenty five that serve populations over twenty five thousand. I have been on the, the Stillwater County Board, the, the trustees off and on for about 20 years through five directors. And I really believe in the importance of keeping the requirement to the MSL. Um, you know, our directors were fine before this, but our new director has, has an MSL and it is like night and day. I mean, it is truly unbelievable in terms of our, our responsibilities as, 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 a, as trustees and, and all the, the amount of programming and the energy and the creativity and you know she knows what to do, and, and she can run the library rather than the directors kind of helping um, the the uh, the director. I mean the trustees helping the directors. So I really believe it is important to keep that. If it makes a difference with our population under ten thousand, I can imagine how important it would be in a larger library with a larger staff. So thank you very much. May I ask a question? Yes. Was that a requirement when you're hiring? No, what we had no requirement. We just locked into it. Okay. I mean, we were, we were very lucky. But you but, did. But, but I think it is really right. important for libraries um, of over twenty five thousand. So you have that regulation in place. Keep it. Keep it in place. But how would you feel if it was a regulation for everyone? Well, I don't think that would be realistic. Yeah. Even you know, though I mean, yours is under we're Montana. I mean, you know. Yeah. So, but so okay. I would. I would. Uh, yeah. Strongly agree with you. Regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to Columbus. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost two days after Columbus. <laughs> Carmen, <laughs> Carmen. I I would like to point out that um you know obviously this this library chose to do that so even if you re remove a requirement it doesn't mean that right um, Carmen, Carmen libraries. Could, would, I'm sorry. sorry. Could we make a motion and we will discuss that well, your point when we get to the um, discussion about the public library standards. Sounds good. Is that all right? Okay, thank you. Thank all you right. Thank you. thank you. Okay, so. That was fantastic. There was a motion by yeah. Commissioner Hall to accept the fiscal year 23 Federation report. Is there a second? I need it. I'll second it. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we accept the fiscal year 23 Federation report. Um, if there's no further discussion, okay, we will now vote on the motion, which is to accept the fiscal year 23 Federation report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, aye. Opposed, aye. All opposed say no. Okay, the fiscal year 23 Federation report has been approved by a voice vote. Yeah. I'm very sorry, but I think a lot of us need to leave now. Okay, <laughs> that's right. Go Thank ahead. you very much. You
Just take a five minute break. Sure. Take a, should we take a couple minute break? Mm -hmm. Sounds okay. good. Okay, we will do that. I will get in my one hour, my one mile walk going to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. No one at my house. Okay. Yeah. Lord. Okay, we will now He's reconvene. Yeah. For us. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, just a second. I would really like to talk. I'm sunk. Are you? Are they, are they not good? They are. Should we do addiction yeah. recovery? Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. I know. So, yeah. I made Tammy her own box so that for her recovery. Thank you. That is that's really helpful. Kelly, this is all right. No, this definitely is on the bridge of the board. I'll open it for a little you actually need all yes. of Don't do it, Tammy. Don't do it. <laughs> well, she's going to have to because <laughs> Kelly already turned me down. So, Ke so you're going to have to eat all of these. Here you go, Tammy. This Homemade chocolate. So, that's for you. Don't share. It really will help. It'll get me off oxygen. May I snatch this? That's for you. Thank you. Put it in your bag. <laughs> but you have to, sh there's some in front to share. Okay, we will now reconvene. We're okay. recording. We're recording. Yeah. All right. Okay. So continuing on, we will now look at the commission bylaws. Sorry. All right. Bugs. Okay. Are there any questions that need to be asked to make this more understandable? And here we will also allow for public comment. Is there any public comment? Who's okay. our representative on the bylaws? Well, just a reminder that the commission we did all this in a work session. Yeah, yes, we did. Made those recommendations. Yes. Um, and we Genevieve, do you want to bring yeah. those up? The lieutenant governor has reviewed the bylaws and did have some suggestions um, for you to consider as you're considering action on the bylaws. <laughs> I wish that was a little further away so we could make it bigger. I would like to point out a typo. Under um, 7B, let me see if I can find it myself here. I think that is corrected. Well, I think she wants to talk about the, um, do, yeah. Did it say personnel or did it say financial or, or and? Or in one sentence, it still it says finance committee. Under right, the, right. I under believe she personnel. she yeah. fixed that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then do you want to speak to the? Is there any more comments, Jenny? Would you like to speak before we make a motion, or why don't you go ahead and and um make a motion? Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I would move that we accept the bylaws as we have them. Okay. What okay. was the governor's input? The I was say with, the, with the governor's input. So what well, we need to hear. Was okay. It? Go ahead. Um, let me just bring them up and, and Genevieve sharing them with you as well. Um, she had some just some um, additional information. Um, this in the in section five under meetings, um, just clarifying how the chair can allow for for public comment. Um, then making sure that that language is in accordance with open meeting laws. So I think that's a, a helpful recommendation under five e, and it's consistent with the um, public comment language you already have in your meeting agendas. Um, she had a comment for the commission to consider under 6F um, about the order of business on the agenda. Um, right now, what the commission has proposed is language that says, unless otherwise directed by the chair and vice chair, her comment is that typically it's the chair alone that determines changes 
in the order of business. So that's just a comment to you. And then under 7A, she suggested that you clarify that any, any non-commission members who are appointed to subcommittees serve as non-voting ex officio members. Mm -hmm. And so that's included in, in 7A and 7B. And then um, correcting that um, error that Carmen pointed out. And then under 8. Um, Just a second. Where was the one with the vice president? I'm sorry, I'm kidding. That me. is under 7, I'm, um, I'm sorry, 6F. Oh. Right, right now, the suggestion is the order of business on the agenda of the State Library Commission, um, yeah, um, okay, unless so. otherwise directed by the chair and vice chair. Um, her comment is that typically that's uh, a decision that, that's um, the chair alone. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then finally, under um, 8A number 4, just removing the word carbon. We got a good chuckle out of our inclusion of the word carbon. <laughs> carbon. I got Aaron. Oh, that's funny. I think the you know the the one matter that's sort of substantive for the commission to consider is um, whether or not you retain the vice chair's role in determining the order yeah. of the agenda. The others seem to be um, sort of standard recommendations and updates that are consistent with practice. I would move to amend my motion to remove the vice chair. Um, in the bylaws under 6F. I second the amendment. I'll put this on the side. Okay. Can we please see the current main motion? Yeah, give me one second. I'm going to type and I'm going to put it up. And then carbon you're removing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can just do that. Yeah. Okay. No, my use that bylaws. With the other section. Yeah. 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 I have a procedural um, Robert's Rules question. If I want to discuss other um, potential minor changes to the bylaws, do I make those in a discussion after we? vote on this amendment and then we move back to the main motion and then I can bring up other small changes yeah. to discuss. Is that how it works? We should get through this amendment motion first. The yeah. Amendment. And, mm -hmm. Is it checked in? I think we should get through this this motion. Mm -hmm. So we have an amendment to the main motion we need to get through. And then Carmen, you can propose a new main motion for additional um, changes to the bylaws. And I would say if we're going beyond just one more simple change, we maybe need to pause the process mm -hmm. and go back and discuss. And discuss. Yeah, and go back. Kind of pull, yeah, and just have a discussion about what the motion mm -hmm. Yeah. Because okay. um, we don't want to nitpick every right. correction with the motion. That's right. Needed. Is that a second on that? This is the um, yes. amendment to the motion. It right. is isn't seconded. And Tom, it's Tom second. I call for a question. Oh. Okay, if there has been a question called. So is there any public comment about that? So is there any public comment? And do commissioners have any comment, or do I just go ahead? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. we'll do the vote. You need you get, to get the vote, vote on her, call the question. So two thirds have to say yes, let's call the question. Okay, do, or do two call thirds. The question. So vote on call the question. Okay, um, and the, a question has been called. Um, how do I weird that? Are the commissioners ready, the commissioners ready to accept the call, the call the question? Say aye. Yeah. Uh, aye. Okay. aye. Say no. If, everyone mm -hmm. say if, no if you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everyone said aye. Go ahead. So now we can do the vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the amendment. <laughs> vote on the amendment. Okay. So now, um, 
an amendment has been made to the motion by Commissioner Hall to remove the vice chair from the bylaws section 6F. All those in favor of that amendment say aye. 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 All, all those not in favor say no. Okay, it has been approved to amend the motion to remove the vice chair from the bylaws section 6F with a voice, voice vote. Can I ask if, um, if um, Superintendent Artson voted? Ma'am, I did. Thank you. Okay, got it. Thanks. Thank you, Elsie. Okay. Okay. So now, so now the main our, yeah. So now the main motion was to accept the bylaws with that change. Mm -hmm. With that change, and now we can discuss. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carmen. Um, section eight point two. I was wondering if we want to be more broad with that, and just put in their staffing changes, if we can, um, after we're done with writing up the motion, bring bring up that part and look at it. Um, with that quarterly personnel reports, which accurately portray the staffing changes? Yep, it's that one, 8.2. So right now it says, um, accurately portray hiring resignations and dismissals of staff. I'm wondering if we just change that to staffing changes, which accurately portrays staffing changes, which would make it more broad. Um, I don't know, you know, I'm not familiar with the language hiring resignation dismissals. Is that broad enough for us? Is there other things we want to know about what goes on with staff that would be left out if we phrase it this way? It's a question I don't really have the answer to. But I just thought if we want to make it broad, um, accurately portray staffing changes. It would be a very simple way to, to state that. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. You could state it as, as the way you've put it, including but not limited to hiring resignations and dismissals. That makes it broad and give some specificity. Yeah, some guidance. Some guidance. Uh -huh. Could I suggest you make that an amendment, Tom? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to I, I move an amendment that we change the text of 8.2. Eight mm -hmm. To say, Present quarterly personnel reports. I'm sorry. So sorry. To, to, um, mm -hmm. to the section is it? Tell me more time. Text of 8.2. 8.82. 8. 8. 8. 8. And I'll ask uh, Carmen as I'm forming this motion. What was your what was your two word phrase? Staffing, Staffing changes. changes. Staffing changes. Which accurately portray the staffing changes of the Montana State Library, including but not limited to hiring, resignations, and dismissals of staff. Sorry. Carmen, did you want to second that? I second that. Okay. Staff yes. changes, including but not limited to. Okay. Mm -hmm. so exactly. I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. I like that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. It has been moved and seconded to amend the motion to change the text of 8.A2 to staff to ac mm -hmm. accurately which reports, okay, present quarterly personnel reports, which accurately portray, portray staffing, change. staffing changes. I think it's supposed to be changes. changes. Thank you. Okay. I'll put uh, that in parentheses as well, so we're clear that we're entering into the yeah, changes. changes of the Montana State Library, including, but not limited to hiring, resignations, and dismissals of staff. All those in favor 
say aye. 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 Okay. Anyone opposed? Say no. Okay. It has been it has been passed that we accept this, this wordage <laughs> um, and by voice vote. Okay. So now the main motion. No, wait, Armin, what, uh, Armin, did you have anything else to add? Um, I'm wondering under 8.3, I don't know if that's just a um, professional lingo thing that I don't know, but are there other contracts besides procurement contracts? Should we eliminate, cross out the word procurement? Are there other contracts that the library, that the state library engages in that are not so-called procurement contracts, but simple, simply other contracts? I have a question for Melissa. Are, are grants, like a grant award, considered procurement? I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe that that, I don't believe so, but let me double check that. I can, if we are the recipient of a grant, we often have to sign a grant agreement. I don't know that if that is, would be considered a contract that, versus a grant agreement. Yeah, that's not technically considered something that would be a part of the Procurement Act that we have to follow. That is a different thing. I'm trying to think of the, um, the purpose of 8.3. Um, and I think what we what we were aiming for when we came up with this was financial oversight. So, you know, if we take the word procurement out, does does that serve that purpose? We just want oversight over where money is going, where money is being spent. Um, does your financial report accomplish that goal? Well, does we we wanted to add this because we wanted to know more about contract spending, yeah. I think. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So Taking I don't know if there's other contracts that are not called procurement contracts, that, but that are contracts that we would want to know about as a commission. Um, no, as no, that's not the case. OK. Does it make any difference whether the word procurement is in there or not? I like to eliminate needless words just for that, for no other purpose but to make understanding simpler. I don't see that that would change the meaning of it at all. It's just sort of state lingo. That's what we that's what we use. So it would be it would standardize it with other state language that we use, but I don't know that it changes the meaning at all. I mean, if that's the term of art that's used by the state, I think it would make sense to just retain it. I'm fine with that. Would the Contracts we've had concerns about, like Hoffman, New York, would that fall under procurement? Does, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Yes. I'm noticing something from Wisconsin. It says the state procurement manual is your guide to statewide policies and procedures for obtaining material supplies, equipment, contractual services, and all other dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. So it seems that uh, procurement is, is not a limiting or a, a term. A word that would limit. Yeah, so maybe it's no problem to leave it there. It's not just purchasing. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, could be okay. Right? Is any is anything like Melissa said? Anything under the Procurement Act right. that falls under the State Procurement Act? Yeah, we don't do anything outside of that. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, is okay. it satisfactory to leave it in then? Yes. Would yeah, I'm not going to propose a motion. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, the main motion. Okay. Okay. Amendment okay. accepted. This this is the full main motion. Okay. So. Um, Commissioner Holm moved to accept the bylaws with the removal of ice. Is this what I need to be reading? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, excuse me. Okay. Commissioner Hall moved to accept the bylaws with the removal of vice chair from section 6F and to change the text of 8A2 to staff changes of the MSL, including but not limited to hiring resignations and dismissals of staff. 
Um, now we shall have a vote on the whole it, amendment. On the whole amendment. Okay. With, okay, so all those motion. in the motion. The motion. This is the main motion. Yes. It so, is. and to do vote on main motion. Okay. We are not going to meet, vote on the main motion. All those in, do I need to repeat it? No, okay. Never. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Any and else? I say aye. Carmen, do you vote? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. So this motion, this motion has been approved by voice vote. Madam Chair, yes. may I ask a question? Yes. Is LCD, are you having to leave at a certain time? Um, yes, ma'am. And I very much appreciate that we put the action, that's what I spoke about in my opening remarks in the very beginning, to allow me, we have a state workforce investment board. I pretty much cut myself in half and I'm in Zoom worlds within two different of these meetings. <laughs> the other one is more informational. This one is a priority because of the action, even knowing that I there may be a quorum for that. But I'm here listening very intently. Thank you. Is there a Thank motion you. under action you want to make sure that we discuss before you have to leave? Uh, no, ma'am. I think I've got everything uh, the way that it's ordered at this point. I think that I'm um, here participating. So okay. thank you very much for asking that of me. Okay. I think it's important. Um, make sure she... Yes. All right. Okay. So we have been discussing a public information officer position. Would anyone like to comment on the proposal put forth concerning this position. Do we have any public comment? Yeah. Is there any, any, are there any comments from the commission that would make our motion more understandable? Yes. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm opposed to this. Um, I don't see the urgency of it. I'm in general not in favor of uh, increasing employment in government. Um, Broadcasting our good works is not urgent. Awareness resulting from our recent awareness campaigns was weakly documented, unsatisfying, and unproductive. Um, we need to target individuals who we want to bring into our customer base, not through broad breath um, or broadcasting with general announcements or a general approach. So those are my some of my um, thoughts about the public information officer. Okay, okay. Is there a motion to accept the proposal to hire a public information officer? I so move. Okay. I'll second it. <clears throat> Seconded, it has been properly moved and seconded that we hire a public information officer for the MSL. Is there any further discussion from what from what commissioner? I'll, I'll say my reasons why I think um, I I do believe that it, this is um, coming from the governor and and it's important to work closely with him and follow his directives. And I also believe um, from our experience with media and such that we had many questions and many re people that wanted us to respond. And I felt very uncomfortable doing that as a solo person. And I think we need directive um, to have us help us to get our message out in that way. And when we have questions from the from the press, it's it's I do not want to be the one <laughs> putting that message out there for the whole group. And I think we need someone who helps us with that, as well as the other things. Last night we had a at our meeting, um, they have a media person for um, their library and had, they said had greatly improved their relation in their ship with their county. So um, it can be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. yes. So are we, yeah, are we one, discussing, are we discussing, sorry. Just one second, Carmen, we have a, a, a public discussion public person who would like to present. Can people hear her? Can you I hear her? Okay, great. Yeah, okay, thank yeah, you. Can thank you. Here. Um, I'm Jennifer Ball. I'm the director of Stillwater County Library, and 
um, about, about a year ago, um, actually a year and a half ago, we had been struggling with attendance and programs and just having a cohesive message delivered for our library throughout our county. And so I had proposed to our board that we hire a marketing person um, specifically to be able to, again, create that cohesive message to um, the county. And it, so it's social media. Um, our social media presence has increased dramatically. And um, then we also do print media throughout the county. We do like table tents that go out through the restaurants all throughout the county and flyers. And um, we are about to launch a new website. And so she will maintain that as well. It has just helped us um, communicate who we are very solidly in our services. And it's it's increased our activities, our attendance at activities. And it's it's been very beneficial. It was, I think there were some doubts in the beginning when I specifically asked for this person. Um, but I think now all of us agree wholeheartedly that it was definitely worth worth it. Um, she was a, she was an excellent hire, um, valuable resource. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Carmen, go ahead. So the governor's office has a PIO. Is, do I read that correctly in our our mm -hmm. memo? Yes. So Carmen, we have that. The, 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 the governor has a communications policy advisor, and then agencies have their own agency PIOs who coordinate closely with the governor's communication policy advisor. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing two different things. In our memo, it says we want a person to help us grow the Montana State Reference Network, or the, um, the one we're trying to get subscribers for. Um, right. And then what I'm hearing from um, the the person that just commented is more like an an emergency controversy resolution um, PR person. So what would the role be if we hired our own PIO? The, the role would be a consistent communication strategy for the agency so that whether it's promoting the real-time network or responding to media inquiries, um, we have someone who has the specific knowledge, skills, and abilities trained to promote, communicate effectively, and respond to those kinds of media requests. So I, I wanted to just respond a, a moment regarding kind of the, the broad-based communication needs. I think there is still a need for a consistent communications message for the agency so that people recognize the, the breadth of work that the State Library does. But, but to Commissioner Burnett's point, we also need to do targeted outreach to potential users of our real-time network, to people who would qualify for our talking book services, to users of the cadastral application, and the other services that the State Library provides. And in our communication with the governor's office about the, the kind of person that you would hire to do that work, um, they said very clearly that you want someone who is well-trained and qualified in communications to do that work. And that's not the kind of position we currently employ. Does that help, Carmen? Um, yeah. So. So it's the the targeted outreach, which to me would be the job of the person in charge of that work group or that library program. And then there is the other piece, which is generally promoting the agency. Um, if I if I can clarify, you know, oh, sorry, sorry, um, that's okay. And and then the the general promotion piece of the agency. Who are our competitors? We are not a private business that needs to compete. Um, I'm wondering if people who need our services aren't just going to look for them. And if we're the only game in town with cadastral and and things like that that we provide and the new network, um, aren't they going to find us? I'm just wondering if we if we truly need to do this. I understand the emergency controversy. Um, you know, PR part, but the promotional part, I'm really questioning that as a state agency, we need to do that.
Ma'am, if I if I could interject, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. No, I'd rather really hear. Go ahead, Elsie. Thank you so much, Robin. When it comes to um, process of hiring, and I guess I may be in the weeds with what I'm going to ask, um, did uh, the Department of Administration, did uh, the budget office approve budgetarily for an entity to be hired? Um, yes, we've been working closely with D of A and the governor's office on this, this potential position. Uh, the question is a uh, yes or a no then, Jenny. I'm sorry. I know you've been working with them, but ha is have they given approval of this? Because I don't want the cart before the horse at this point. Do we also have an FTE or would you be asking them again? I'm sorry. I'm talking from an agency aspect of when I do hire. Um, is there an FTE? Would you be asking for a modified? Um, and I haven't seen a job description and I think that might be very beneficial for commission looking forward to see if indeed uh, the budget can be attributed to this uh, position. But coming back to it, has the budget office approved of an FTE because this would be a general fund position or is this going to be quilted through many funds? It's it's funded through many funds. Melissa needs to correct me if I'm wrong about the, the modified FTE. I don't know if that has been approved, but D of A has approved the classification of the position. And I'll just add that the the budget change document has not been submitted to the Office of Budget and Program Planning yet. Um, pending this vote today, it would be submitted. So yes, um, Superintendent Arts, and this is, will be a modified FTE request. It has not been um, approved and submitted through the accounting system. The job description has been approved and classified by the Department of Administration. Thank you very much, Melissa. And if I could continue then, the again, this might be a cart before the horse. I believe I would like to see a job description and yes, based on everything that we have been through um, in wanting to brand and rebrand the library, uh, but also as coming with what Carmen had said, the mission of what our patrons demand or determine needs to be wrapped within that, as well as we're government. Um, I don't know if we wanna hang the shingle out there that we're anything different but government. And uh, but I do recognize the request, but I will be voting no on this. I also am one that wants to conserve the tax dollar, uh, want to make sure that we ensure great service with what we've got at this point. But I will be a no on this motion. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I will also be a no on this motion. I would like to explain why I agree with um Tom, philosophically, I was um, uncomfortable adding new positions. Um, I do think that Karen made a great point, like the the new time, real time network. I think the directors of those services have a responsibility within that large component of our staff to do um, their their public promotion. I think the media needs to be very clear that they go to Jenny. I do not feel comfortable having anyone besides Jenny responding if some kind of controversy comes out. I don't want to have a public um, officer for that. Um, I also have a hard time promoting the services that we're offering here without using the directors of those services to do that. Um, this is just a, not a priority for me in the budget. If if we can come up with fifty to seventy six thousand dollars. A priority for me would be to get more money in the hands of the actual um, federations and libraries and the direct services. I, I just have a hard time at this point believing it's the best use of our money. I'd rather do it within what already we have, what, 52 employees? I'd rather do it within those. So I will be a no. If I could say something, um, I guess I, I, I see it as um, do... The does the library staff have the training of communications um, that they would need to basically advertise their their departments, their I mean their programs. 
do those heads have those skills beside I mean if you're if you are the geospatial guy your your training is geospatial is it is it so much mm -hmm. as going and I guess I would just point back to the guidance that we got from the governor's the communications policy advisor about oh. having someone who is specially trained I, I appreciate the superintendent's comments about the fact that you haven't seen the job description. The job description um, acknowledges the importance of someone having a background in communications who has the knowledge, skills, and abilities to effectively do that work. And to your point, we have librarians and geographers. The, the uh, program manager for the Real-Time Network is, has a PhD in geodesy. It's not in communications and outreach. It's not in how to um, speak to the potential users, nor nor do our staff have the time. We also have full-time jobs. And so to take the time to um, develop the uh, outreach strategies and identify the target markets to promote that work is, that's just additional workload on top of um, the work that we're already trying to do. Staff, the gentleman was on staff who were able to comment. So. Yes. yes Jennifer, are you on? Jennifer, did you have something to say? Are you trying to speak? What? Mm -hmm. yeah. on a mute. Mute, yeah. Are there any other comments from the public about this? Can you hear me now? We can yes. now, Jennifer, yes. Excellent. Sorry, I didn't have my headset on, so my array mic wasn't working out. I apologize. That's I just right. wanted to kind of reiterate what Jenny was saying is that we don't have time. As a program director, I don't have the time to do the messaging I need to do. So for example, when we do our different contests for the history portal, I don't have a chance, I don't have a good way to get out press releases. I don't have the method to do that well, um, which a PIO would really help us with and get um, some of the things that we are doing and doing well shared on a to the public um, in a broader fashion than I have the resources or ability to do as a program director. I feel like this is really important for our agency in more than one way to have somebody help us message and um, send through the proper channels those press releases and that kind of information about the work that we're doing. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Does anyone else have any comments? Madam Chair. Brian? Can I just ask a point of clarification? When it was said that this would be funded through many funds, what does that mean? Will there be additional funds added to the state library's budget if this position is approved? There will not be any additional funds, but included in the FY24 budget um, is funding for this position, and it's funded through our different funding streams that we currently have, okay. um, like our, our MLIA funds and uh, RTN funds and our general fund, because this program would benefit all of those programs. Okay. So I, I would like to speak in favor of the motion. I think that... Um, um, have, from what I've heard from the state librarian, from what I've heard from staff so far, I think that this would, having a public information officer would really benefit the state library. I think it would make it more effective. I think it would really help the public to better understand, to be proactive, to understand what the what their library could do for them. So I think it would be a benefit. Um, I also would remind people that this is an initiative that is the guidance that has come from the governor's office. So I, my understanding is that agencies, including the state library have been encouraged to uh, pursue positions like this. Is that correct, Jenny? Okay. So I encourage uh, the commission to vote in favor of the motion. Can I ask Jenny, um, who, what did the Lieutenant Governor, what was her response to this? Um, the Lieutenant Governor is in favor of supporting this position. Could you explain, um, what what would be the next steps? If we approve this, what would then what is your process? Um, Melissa would submit the budget change document to the governor's budget office for the modified FTE. 
And then using that job description, we would begin recruitment for that position. Is it possible to get a job description? Do you have the job description? Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Did you send that to us? Um, no, no, it was not okay. included in your meeting materials, but it is drafted. Okay. It's been reviewed and okay. classified by the Department of Administration. Okay. <laughs> um, Superintendent Arnson, would you like to see that job description? Well, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I would. And I do a lot of hiring. We are, when I got into office, we had 300 plus modifieds. We had so many employees. And then we went through a process. And I know none of you were there, but in 17, when we had uh, pretty much a recession and a review, there were people that had to be let go. And it is still a very touchy issue. And Jenny, that may be something we don't want to talk about at this point, but I believe it is not about um, hiring people. It's about the work that is done. I totally understand that a program person may not under may not want to visit with the public, but I do believe at this point in time, um, we don't have a I, uh, we don't have a definite from the budget office that they're even going to allow this to go forward. Uh, yes, a profile may have been created. Um, I have not gotten anything from the governor's office, and I've reached to them that if they will approve or not, I did get it back from them that they said that they would approve uh, or that they would look at it pending our vote today. Pending our vote today is too squishy for me. I need to know that a precious tax dollar and a commitment to an employee with a profile must happen before I vote on it. That means also it recognizes the good work of the employees at the library. What is the added effect of this entity? What will it take off of the state librarian's plate? What is the mission moving forward with all the programs that are under the umbrella of the state library? That is what I would like to see before I sign on the dotted line, a individual at that rate, as well as, yes, it may have been classified. I have a lot of employee positions that are classified by the department that are not filled. And that I have given back to the, uh, to the um, legislature. So I don't know, Jenny, to get into the weeds if you have vacancy savings. I don't know what budget you're putting forward with this. I do recognize that another person will help take energy and effort off of employees' plates. And I want to make that really clear. To support the employees that are working in their programs is important. And if this individual will help balance that workload, then it's something we need to look at. I said cart before the horse before, I'm going to say it again. I need to see more things before we grow a government agency that's very small at this point. And I need to see the budget that's going to be directed, that's quilted toward it. I've not seen that either. So I want to respect the employees. I want to make sure that I respect the mission of this agency. And I also want to respect the process. Again, cart before the horse. I will be still a no. Here, um, Evan has a hand Okay. Evan, did you have a comment? Yes. Hi, Evan Hammer, Digital Library Administrator here at the State Library. And and there were just two things that were said uh, during this discussion that I, I just want to correct. One is uh, someone suggested that uh, program, program people wouldn't be involved if this position was hired, and that's not true. Um, this position is would be hired to support our program staff. Uh, our Stokes program staff would still be very much involved in the promotion of their programs. Secondly, uh, this is not a proposal being put forth because our staff do not want to reach out and speak to the public. Our staff do that every day, love doing that work. Um, but I think if you look at not just what they're trained in, but also what we're paying them to do, uh, this is a much better use of uh, tax dollars. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Carmen, you had your hand up again. Um, yeah, just um, looking at Jenny's memo about this, it says the governor has directed all agencies to work closely with their PIO. Um, here at a county level, the library board has learned that our county has a PIO 
and we can send press releases to that person and they will broadcast it everywhere. So I would like to urge the State Library before we do this to really look into what use you can make of the governor's own PIO. And at this point, with not having a job description and not being exactly clear how this gets funded, I will also be a no on this motion. Madam Chair. Yes. I appreciate what the staff has shared. I think it's valuable. Um, I didn't understand Evan's comment. I don't think I didn't hear anybody say that this person wouldn't work with the directors. Um, I think that it's been said they would, but I appreciate his comment very much. Um, I would just suggest if this goes down, um, that we offer training in public relations and it is available and it would be far less expensive than having a person that we offer training to our staff directors on how, as this one lady said, to put out um, through Jenny, of course, um, public rele releases to the press, et cetera. Um, I think it, I would think that would be a good training to offer to bring in or to do. Is there any way that we could table this and and see a job description and learn more about the budget information to make a more informed decision of a yes or no? What would Question be that process? Tools. What would a trade table motion do? You can make a motion and table it. Does it have that. to be voted on by the majority? You double check. You can make that. The motion is to postpone definitely to like your yes. December meeting. Yep. So you just need um, a second and then um, a majority. Um, comment. I don't want to delay this. I'm. I want to vote today on this. Um, I, there's nothing else that I personally need that's going to change my vote. It's it's a very deep philosophical that I I think we can use the money better. But it might change other people's no votes. I would like to make that motion that we postpone until further information is provided about the job description and the budget. I will until that. the next meeting. I'm going to, if I'm, you don't like my word, you please let me know until further information about the position is provided. Yes. And that would include budget and job description. Job description. Okay, well, assuming your question, I will point you to the right direction. Does somebody just need to make a comment? I was unable to hear that. Yeah, I didn't make the motion. Oh, sorry, that was, that was the, the first, first one. Yeah. Okay. And so um, this was, sorry. This is for uh, Peggy. I'm just doing last name, I'll go back through. Okay. Now we, so now we vote on that. Okay, so a motion has been made to postpone until the next meeting when we receive further information about the position per, is, sorry, is, is, okay. Until further information about the position such as budget and job description is provided. Sorry, it's not today. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Superintendent Arnson. I voted no. I voted no. I'm sorry you didn't hear. It was kind of in the chorus of everyone. Okay. So the motion has been the the motion to postpone until the next meeting until okay. further information is supplied has been rejected so now do we go back to the main motion mm -hmm. okay so the there's been a motion to accept the creation of the pio position all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. all opposed say no no no, no. And Superintendent Arnson, yours was no again. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Okay, so the motion to accept the creation of the PIO position has been rejected by a voice vote. All right, so let's go on to the draft rules. All right. No, I'm right. State. No, I'm sorry. I skipped ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, we are present. We are presented with the state of Montana broadband pay policy in our meeting notes. Um, Tom, you wanted to add the state pay pay plan policy and discretionary pay as an action item. So, would you please? Make a motion to start the discussion. Yes, I move that any discretionary pay adjustments must be approved by the commission and signed by the chair prior to submitting to the Office of Budget Program and Planning. And uh, and I'll give my justifications after, after. It, if okay. it's been. Okay. 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 Yes, say that. Yeah. I move that any. Can you give her the copy to read? Here you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> State broadband, state, broadband. Broadband. Yeah. state, state paper. Yeah. Okay. And this so is an addition to the broadband paper. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there a second? I did. Commissioner okay. Hall seconds it. Is hey, it, uh, just a second. Sorry. No, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just heating that up. We're not shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. I feel like a rap singer. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Oh, we share the sentence. Sorry. I'm trying to get it under the phrase. Underneath the phrase. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. All right. It's, no. Okay. Go ahead. It has been moved and that printed by Tammy. Move in secondary that seconded that any discretionary pay adjustments Sorry. must be approved by the commission and signed by the chair prior to submitting to the office, the office of budget Rob, program. budget program planning and planning <laughs> budget programming and planning and, and just acronyms. to clarify we actually submit those to the department of administration sure, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. so that should be changed now. okay so to, to D of A. D of A. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Thank you. Did I read that again? Hey, it has been moved and seconded that any discretionary pay adjustments must be approved by the commission and signed by the chair prior to submitting to D of A. Okay. Is there any further discussion I'm or sure. public discussion? Go so ahead. I, um, we we considered a three things that that must be taken into account in this um, type of action. And um, the two that were substantive were expediency, because when uh, HR and our staff are negotiating these things with employees, time is of the essence. We can't wait for another meeting in two months down the road. So we'll call that expediency. And the other is privacy. So you can't make these negotiations out in, in, in public view. That's awkward and not fair to people. And so both those considerations are resolvable by um, doing this in closed executive session online on short notice to the commission. So expediency and privacy are both solved by short notice call of the commission closed executive session and what was the third the third was uh, it doesn't happen very often oh, but right. that uh is is moot in my view because um that could be argued that could be an argument for or against us having supervision and who's we the commission, commission. no but you said we when we discuss this was that the finance, the finance committee? committee that's yes. what i thought okay 
What with, is the process right now for uh, how often are there discussionary? So we actually were asked that question through the finance committee and, and Melissa created a report and, and I'll let Melissa speak to the report. Um, the, the process when we review our um, broadband pay plan policy and how staff currently align to our target pay matrix is to bring any kind of discretionary pay requests to the finance committee and then to the full commission. So, so what the suggestion is, is in keeping with that process. Um, I am concerned about the expediency piece because, you know, when we are negotiating, we might go back and forth in negotiation within 24 hours. And so this motion would require all of you to be available in a very short amount of time to pull together a quorum of the committee and potentially multiple times in a very short period of time when we are potentially negotiating to retain specific staff. So that, that is the one piece of this that concerns me. Melissa can speak to the, the report uh, uh, that, that she pulled. Melissa? Sure, thanks. Um, I, I did pull a report that the Finance Committee received of um, any discretionary pay changes um, that would apply in this situation. And that report went back to 2015. And it showed that um, on average, each year there were 4.28 discretionary changes made per year. Um, the majority of those um, changes were what we call a move to entry. So those are staff that are paid below the minimum amounts, which is um, contradictory to our to the state's pay plan policy. So seven, the most um, discretionary payments, uh, discretionary changes that we made was seven over the past eight years, and that was to move people to um, the entry of the pay band. So currently that process looks like if somebody is under the minimum, the Department of, Admin of Administration work, working with the Office of Budget and Program P Planning approve those changes at this point. And we have to go through those offices to have any of those changes made. Um, and so this would just add a, another layer. Yes, Tammy. Um, Melissa or Jenny. The discretionary planning, when, when the legislature a few years ago set, gave a budget increase for salary, and and we arbitrarily, I was not on the board, so I can't speak to this at all, but we ended up spending 10%, uh, which was quite a bit over the legislature. Wasn't that done through the discretionary spending? I mean, wasn't that how the salaries were given way above what the legislature allotted? It was used as discretionary process. We, can I talk to that, Jenny? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll. Uh, I think what you're referring to is in 2021, yes. when the legislature um, passed statute that changed the way the state classifies positions, and it it went from one classification process to an entirely new classification process. And so when that happened, what came with that new classification process were pay bans, minimum through maximum, new pay bans that we as a state agency are required to pay within new ranges. And so those changes were done, made statewide, and those pay adjustments that were made were because of the change that happened with the legislature. So those were not considered discretionary. Those were in accordance with our pay plan policy. And I would call those market adjustments. And in fact, those are what the, what the codes were used in our accounting system, a market adjustment. So I think well, that's what you're referring to, but I'm not actually sure what your question is. I we were the only agency that spent that money or went gave 10 percent salary increases that year and we used um, but that's actually that's actually not true there were lots of agencies that gave um increases across the board 
and we did not give increases across the board. We used discretionary for marketing changes. We made market pay adjustments and we did not give 10% across no, the board we market adjustments. Not. We went employee by employee using the new classification system that Melissa described and identified which employees needed to be reclassified. All of that work was done with the Department of Administration and then those employees whose pay needed to be adjusted according to their new classifications received pay adjustments and, and some received no adjustments, some received right. higher adjustments. They were not across the board. And that work was done in conjunction with the Department of Administration. And again, the State Library Commission approved all of those pay adjustments. Right. They did. Um, I just would point out, you said this is rare that it's used. Tom, what's your purpose? Agency level supervision. Okay. <clears throat> if I could just su suggest a modification to this motion, it would be to um, to say that um, any discretionary pay adjustments with the exception of retention pay, meaning that we have a current employee on staff that we want to retain, we are negotiating against a new employment offer that um, we have the, the staff have the discretion to do those negotiations. So with the exception of retention pay be approved by the commission and signed by the chair. I think that that would address the, the, um, the need that we see in the instances when we are negotiating retention pay. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, so time is of the essence, and it's a it's a back and forth. But I think if employees and staff know that there's there's going to be uh, once a, a deal is arrived at, it's going to take a couple of days to be uh, run past the commission. That that standard can be acknowledged and. Um, worked with so uh, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't like to add the terms except for retention pay we can move fast enough we can't move within 24 hours but we can move with, certainly within 72 hours and you're thinking it would speed up the process if people knew that yeah okay people know what uh, how the thing works and nobody's going to jump ship from uh, over over 72 hours. Well, they might. That's a risk we might have to take. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yes. Elsie, are you on? She's trying to go between two very important committees. So I'm running. I'm here. How can I help? Okay. No, um, I know that you deal with this because you are also a director of an agency. So um, if there was this negotiation discretionary funding to keep or retain an employee, whatever we're talking about. Do you see this as workable that the commission would, within tw within seventy two hours, have a emergency meeting to do so, a private Zoom to approve it? Do you see it as micromanaging or a good use of of our leadership? Um, I would say that the communication needs to be robust, recognizing a, a couple things that there has to be. Um, a direct portal. Every one of our senior managers carries a cell phone. Every one of our managers does business on that state cell phone. And I believe that is the immediacy of, uh, of communication flow between one or another. I know with the commission, it might be difficult, but from the state agency wise, um, I would hope that that would be immediate communication that shouldn't be the barrier there shouldn't be a barrier there has to be a purpose and a reason why what protects me with all of this is that we have forms that have either gone through procedure or through a policy committee where i have uh union members where i have hr sit on it where we have a a, a direct uh, understanding of what an increase or an adjustment or might look like or even a probationary time um, and then also recognizing the work. So I don't believe 
there are barriers here. If the barrier is there, it is because there is faulty communication flow. Did that help? Yes. Um, with discretionary spending, which is very rare, um, it would not, you don't see it as a complication that in those cases for adjustments, um, uh, uh, for pay adjustments, it would come to the commission. Uh, no, ma'am. I believe it recognizes the good work of the staff. And it also recognizes, I'm going to just point back to it, on the work of what the staff does. Because if there is an adjustment, it is adjusted around the workflow to recognize either a reclassification or if indeed there's been a void of some sort of management or supervisory leadership where there could be a bump up for a period of time until there is that position either filled or else um, there is well, there is something that happens within the uh, the market, but I believe it comes back to communication flow, and I I understand as the historian besides the state librarian on this commission that there and even knowing where government is in the market at this point that there uh, won't be many of them, but I believe that is information for the commission to recognize. Uh, and not something that is necessarily proprietary only to um, a few. Everyone that works in state government should be transparent with how monies are flowing to individuals. What is proprietary is that personal identified information, but working for government means there must be transparent and there must be a discussion uh, in a very quick amount of time. So I would see again, that there would be no problems with what this motion is at this point. Thank you. Can I just ask a point of clarification, Tom? When you say um, to meet in, in closed executive session, that's with the finance committee or with the whole commission? The whole commission. Whole commission. So we need a quorum of the commission. Uh -huh. So I guess my question for the commission is how do you feel about having a 24 hour advance notice to have an emergency discussion or executive session. Is that something that people feel that they can accommodate? And, and, and can I speak practically to that? So what that practically means is an employee has come to their supervisor and said, I've received another job offer. I'm considering taking it unless you can match this salary. So that has to get communicated to me and to Genevieve. Genevieve has to contact all of you find, you know, issue a doodle poll to find a time when a quorum of the commission can meet. We actually have to do a public meeting notice then. So we have to give 48, 48 hours, hours public meeting after you've chosen the date. After, after you've chosen the mm -hmm. date, make that public meeting notice and have a meeting in private session. Go back to the employee with whatever decision this commission has made. You know, maybe it's to, to not increase that employee's salary and and say best of luck i don't i don't know um so that's the position you put that employee mm -hmm. in their supervisors all of their work as well as the the competing offer and and say you you suggest that you will meet that salary and the competing offer comes back with a higher salary we have to go through that entire process again to reconsider that negotiations. So consider the time and the, the taxpayer dollars and the anxiety that that puts on staff to negotiate a salary. This happens very rarely. Um, and, and all I'm asking for is one exception to allow for the expediency to retain our incredibly valuable staff. I'm very torn on this motion. Part of me believes very strongly that it, I do not want to micromanage. And I'm very concerned about that. But the other side of me, I do know in the past history, um, by, by using whatever we want to call it, um, market management, discretionary spending, whatever, we got a real black eye with the legislature because we did spend more on salary bonuses than was appropriated. So that's the past, but I have to acknowledge that. So 
I'm very torn on this. Um, I'm praying a lot right now. Carmen, do you have an opinion on this? Um, I'm somewhat torn too, but um, just like I do on my library board, I see my my primary responsibility is fiscal. And because this has to do with fiscal oversight, I think I'm going to go yes on this motion. I see the, the danger with the cumbersome process. Um, but I also think, you know, as a, as an employee, if you get an offer in another state or another county or another town, how quickly are you going to jump? I mean, are you going to make this decision as an employee, you know, in two days, if you have to uproot your family, who knows what's involved in another job offer? So I, I'm quite, I understand the back and forth and that, you know, this could involve several meetings if if the commission comes back with an offer that Jenny can communicate and then mm. that employment opportunity comes back with yet some you know but the back and forth and I see that problem with the process but because it has to do with fiscal oversight I think I'm going to vote in favor of this motion point of clarification I thought from Tom that this would not come to us until the negotiation had settled that that back and forth, back and forth is going on. And then when the discretionary spending point is agreed to, it would be brought to us. Is that how you see it? I did not see us involved in the negotiation. Madam Chair. Yes. Yes. So it needs to be resolved with HR and leadership mm -hmm. at the agency level, the agency staff. But there is the workability point, I, I admit, because Let's say we approved or didn't approve. Uh, let's say we didn't approve, and the employee came back and said, "Well, how about instead of uh, the five thousand, you give me two thousand, and we got to do it all over again." Okay. But those are costs that I'm willing to to absorb because of the rarity of this happening. Yes, the rarity and the uh, the importance of our 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 supervisory role, our fiscal responsibility. Yeah. <clears throat> May I ask a question? Um, so would it go to the DFA first? Would you or would you would it be it doesn't and, seem feasible to me to come to a negotiated salary until we know we have the support of the commission. Okay. And, and at that point, it would have to go to, to D of A. I see. Okay. So afterwards it goes. I mean, I can't, I can't tell an employee, yes, we'll meet that salary and, and have that employee communicate that without, without knowing that you support that decision. And it sounds like that has to happen in a meeting. So the commission's support is the first step in that process. But you could say to the person, I I support the HR, that's a reasonable request. It's worth it to us, we will take that request. You're not saying any company blank. Sure, sure, but I still need the yeah. support of the commission. And you need, yeah, and you tell the employee that, but I have to go to the commission. But I personally think it's reasonable and I will argue for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I could say something, I'm Carol Ann Davis. I'm the state HR uh, division administrator. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. So I just wanted to explain a few things. One is just looking at that process, just more informational, putting this out there for you guys to um, have all the information. To Jenny's point, it would, whatever discretionary pay adjustment um, was being considered, once, if this were to pass, once the commission approved it, then it would come to state HR and we do our approval and then it goes to OBPP. Normally, um, agencies have done all their internal vetting and approval before it gets to us. And then once it gets to us, we, um, if, if we're good with it, we ship it straight over to OBPP. So just to kind of explain what that would look like on your end, I wouldn't see it being feasible to come to us and then to the commission. Um, cause like I said, normally once we get it, if it's all good and everyone has approved, it goes directly over to OBPP for their review and approval. Um, and, and that can take some time, to be honest, we do try to have very quick turnarounds, both my office and OBPP. It just kind of depends. So that would need to be factored into the, um, turnaround time in order to communicate that as an official counter offer to the employee, right? Um, the other thing, just to clarify, discretionary pay adjustments, 
according to our policy and um, SABERS really encompass a lot of pay adjustments. And I just wanted to make sure that was understood. So in state HR, when we talk about what's discretionary, we're talking about things like career ladder adjustments, if you have those, market adjustments, performance adjustments, retention, supervisory training assignments. So that's just to, I wanted to put that out there so you guys had a full understanding of what discretionary covers. Um, but that, that's all I had to add. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Jenny, what is the, the process right now? If somebody comes to you and says, I have another offer, you negotiate and then you submit it where? That would go to D of A. And so, then how long does that take for, for you to be able to actually give the employee an answer and say to that employee, yes, we can match that? Um, this is actually a, a new process under this new broadband pay plan policy that the state just adopted. Typically, that's been able, something that we've been handling in-house. So the, the process right now is changing and we haven't you haven't done such a negotiation yet under the new process. That's correct. And how do you, how, what's your guess as far as how, how this new process would work? I would look to Carol Ann. I, I've worked in several state agencies um, and those agencies have had the process of sending their retention requests over to state HR, even under the previous pay policy. Um, state HR does understand that those are time sensitive but with getting it through state HR and OBPP, it can take several days at times. I have experienced that um, before transitioning into this role, just out in the agencies. So I don't have a set like guarantee it will be 48 hours or 72 hours. Um, we do flag them as time sensitive. We usually in state HR have a turnaround time of 24 hours. So like if we got a request today, we would normally have it to OBPP by tomorrow, um, but I don't have any insight to really guarantee on a time frame from OBPP to review and approve and communicate that back to state HR to communicate out to an agency. The, the other thing in our new pay policy that we um, rolled out on October 1st, it puts a lot more parameters around retention increases. So, um, if you are following along on the policy on page eight, retention increases specifically, since I know that's one of the things we're discussing is defined pretty um, clearly in there. And there's new parameters on that the pay increase cannot be more than 10% of the employee's base salary. It cannot exceed the maximum occupational wage range, and it can no longer be used for um, employees going just to another state agency, they'd have to be leaving and going to an external employer. And that is to help mitigate some of the bidding wars that agencies are in to try to keep and take employees from one another. Since we are, as a state government, one employer, we're trying to embrace that pay philosophy a little bit more through this new pay policy. Okay, here's my point. Clarify this. So you're saying this new pay policy, broadband pay policy, has put some of those guidelines in there that now you have to have it approved by DOA. So to me, that seems like that is already in place with this plan. Mm -hmm. And that that would take care of someone else is approving or, or disapproving of this pay increase. I th I'd say we let the plan take care of it. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, that's them. That's not us. They are not responsible. We are. Exactly. We're fiscal. But, but the, our agency has to follow this broadband pay policy. Mm -hmm. So it is essentially yeah. for them. Madam Chair. Yes. But we have been appointed to this position, right. to this responsibility. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Yes. So I think given the comments that uh, Carol Ann just made, um, that there and echoing what, what Peggy said, um, there are now there, there are policies in place saying that the maximum 
that could be uh, negotiated would be 10%. Wow. Um, and some of those other things about not, you know, negotiating between different state agencies. Um, just in the interest of not micromanaging, I don't think even I understand Tom's position and I understand Carmen's position about fiscal or fiduciary oversight. I take that very seriously, but I would feel comfortable um, delegating that decision to the state library and then to the state library. I think that there are guidelines in place and I, I would feel comfortable with, with that. Okay. As far as the history goes, that um, that seems to be a concern. I'm not familiar with that. Um, those who are familiar with that history, does this um, section of the broadband pay policy resolve and prevent um, whatever happened before that was not well received? Um, does it prevent that from happening again? Do we know that? The, the broadband pay plan policy requires D of A and the governor's budget office to approve any discretionary pay. So there is there is those two checks in place that would present prevent people from having concerns over us awarding discretionary pay without their approval. And were those two items not in place before? This is new. Those that's two. That's correct. That's correct. It, in other agencies, I think it was the practice prior to the policy. That policy just, um, and I, to be completely honest, I just transferred to this role in August, at the very beginning of August. So I'm not sure on the history that you guys are speaking of in this context, but it was under this administration, when I was at my other agencies, all pay adjustments had to go through state HR and OBPP for approval prior to the policy, but the policy um, does clearly state that now also. Uh, what I will say is maybe um, hearing all of the comments, maybe something to consider is even on the retention definition that we were just looking at on the screen, it talks about an exception process. So maybe that might be something that the that could be considered in the proposal is if um, the state library was going to, so at the end of this retention definition here, it talks about unless documented and approved by state human resources division through the exception process. So a lot of the stipulations or parameters in the new policy have an exception process if an agency needed to deviate for some justifiable reason. And that could be something that maybe the commission would want to be more involved in if the agency was looking at pursuing an exception process to one of the pay policy stipulations. Madam Chair, after, after reading what was pointed out, I am now very strongly in favor of Tom's motion because the fiscal responsibility that we have been given has to be taken seriously. And much of this is passing it away. And I think we have to be very careful of that. I know we're passing it on to other agencies and we're passing it on to other governments. Um, I, I think some of our salaries, I've looked at them all, are low, but some of our salaries in this area are very, very high. And a 10% increase is a lot. And I would really want this to come to the commission. And I think we can work it out. I think it's rare. Um, I think it helps those people make a decision if they know that it will be negotiated with Jenny as best as possible, but then it has to be decided by this commission. Um, that would just be go along with, do I want to leave? Do I want to find another, do I want to move? Do I want to, da, 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 da. I, I think it's workable. Thank you for the good discussion. I think there's no new opinion on it. I don't want to call for a question because when we have to vote on it. But... Is there any further discussion? Okay. So it has been moved and seconded 
by Commissioner Burnett that any discretionary pay adjustments must be approved by the commission and signed by the chair prior to submitting to DOA. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Okay, it has been accepted the motion to approve any the discretionary pay adjustments by the commission and signed by the chair prior to submitting to DAA has been passed by voice vote. Okay, we are on to the draft rules. Do we have time to do that? What if time? We have people wanting to provide public comment, we should try to see them scheduling this that one. Okay, so we will go ahead and go to the draft rules. Um, Which, okay, we will, just a second. Um, we will hear public comment today and then motion to propose or not propose these rules. These rules as they are now presented may be changed after we consider public comment. The proposed rules will then be sent on to the Secretary of State where they will be published as draft rules. The public will have an opportunity for 30 days to comment. According to the Montana Administrative Procedures Act, if enough people request a public hearing, one will be held. The commission will consider any new public comment received and they may amend the proposed rules based on comments. That discussion will happen at our December meeting. Okay, so the first draft rule, Jenny and Erin Fashway are presenting the Montana Geospatial Information Act draft rules. Jenny, Erin, would you explain the changes of these rules? So a reminder to the commission that during the 2023 legislative session, we amended the Montana Land Information Act to uh, reflect more modern use of the language Montana Geospatial Information Act. And then we worked closely with the Lieutenant Governor to change the makeup of the committee to allow for more efficient work. Uh, we also changed the language in the legislation requiring us to create an annual um, land, now geospatial information plan to simply reviewing that plan um, no, no less frequently than every three years so we need to change the administrative rules associated with that act to now reflect those changes in legislation. And so you see within the draft rules changes to align the language with the language that was passed in the act. Uh, you also see changes in the rules, again, amending the requirement for an annual plan to a, a, a process that's less frequent than that. You see changes in the rules that remove the requirements that we have subcommittees of our advisory committees since the, the makeup that, of that advisory committee is now substantially smaller than it was under the previous legislation. And then finally, the amended rules allow for us to have a two-year grant cycle rather than a single-year grant cycle intending to make that process more efficient for both staff and applicants to, to manage rather than having to manage a, a annual grant program. So again, the, the changes you see in administrative rule are consistent with the legislation that was passed and mm -hmm. intended to make that work more efficient. I move that we accept the changes and the rules as written. Okay, before that, could we ask for a public comment? I'm sorry, is yeah. that can we, okay? I, I would like to ask for public comment. Does anybody have anything to? Okay, okay, go ahead. I move that we accept the Montana Geo Spatial Information Act rules as written. A second it. Okay, it has been. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we propose the MGIA draft rules as is. Is there any further discussion from the commission? Okay, seeing no further discussion, we'll now vote on the motion, which is to accept the M G MGIA changes as written. 
We'll now vote on the motion. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All, aye. Uh, all opposed say no. Okay, the Montana Geospatial Information Act rules have been accepted for proposal by a voice vote. Okay, we are now on to the Montana Real Net Time Network rules. Jenny and Evan, would you please provide information here? Uh, similarly, the 2023 legislature passed legislation to grant the State Library authority to administer the Montana Spatial Real-Time Network and to create an enterprise fund allowing us to collect subscriptions to operate that uh, network. And uh, we are required by legislation to create rules to describe that process. And so we worked closely with the Lieutenant Governor uh, agency legal services, as well as the governor's office of budget and program planning to provide definitions and a description of the process through which we'll set that subscription rate that subscribers will follow. Um, we um, define how, how the rate will apply to the, the logins. Um, we also wanted to clarify in rule that anybody that's using the network for educational use as described in the administrative rules, would be able to do so uh, free of charge without uh, paying the subscription rate. Evan, is there anything you wanted to add about the, the rules? No, I can't think of anything. I think you covered it. Thanks. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Is it typical, Evan, that if a if a business signs on a big business or corporation or company that every employee has to pay a fee or do they get a fee for one fee and everybody can be on is it what what's industry typical uh these uh you'll see the language about the subscriptions uh mm -hmm. refers to logins mm -hmm. and it's uh fairly typical for these logins to be associated with equipment because that's what they're using to connect to the network uh, so it really depends on the company as far as if equipment is shared uh, across a group or if individuals in the group each have their own devices. Uh, but it's uh, consistent uh, with uh, other states to uh, charge per login. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Question for Mr. Hammer. Um, do any other states have an admin fee for the or a kind of an administrator fee? at plus the login um, per login cost? Or, do, or are they all just straight logins? Um, they don't break down costs that way in presenting them to users. They are uh, uh, presented as a subscription rate. A follow up. Uh, I'm familiar with a firm that charges uh, an admin fee and then a certain amount per user beyond that. Do you see any of that out there? Uh, I, I don't see that uh, in the other states that we've looked at. Um, uh, whether or not, I mean, uh, what I do know is that the other states are self-sustaining. So mm -hmm. any kind of administrative costs are built into their subscription rate. Yeah, that, that's good enough. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments? Are there any other questions? How often are we adjusting the, the rates? Are we looking at it every biennium or or how frequently do we adjust? Herman, you answer. Oh, go okay. ahead, Jenny. I was just going to say we would look at it at least every biennium and make sure that the rates cover the costs. Thank you. Okay, is there a motion to propose or not propose the draft rules of the Montana Geospatial Information Act? I move we accept the rules of the Montana Geospatial as presented. Is there a second? Real-time network. <clears throat> I'll second. No. Is that the real-time network? Uh, that we're on? Yeah. I'm sorry, the Montana real-time network. Real-time. I'm sorry. sorry. Right. That was my fault. Montana real-time network rules. I move. And I'll second it. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we accept the MRTN draft rule proposal as is. Seeing no further discussion, we will now vote on the motion, which is we would like to accept the rules for the real-time network as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 
Aye. All opposed say no. Okay, the Montana Real-Time Network Draft Rules proposal has been accepted by a voice vote. Okay, Marmon, um, you wanted to speak before the Public Library Standards Task Force discussion comes up? Yes, I would like to make a comment regarding conflict of interest. There are members of the public apparently concerned about a conflict of interest with regard to my being a library trustee and a state library commissioner at the same time. Let me assure you that I'm not the first person in this situation. There have been others fulfilling roles at a public library concurrently with being state library commissioners. The most recent one that I know about, Connie Behe, who was library director at Imagine If Libraries of Flathead County and also served on the State Library Commission. My holding two unpaid volunteer offices as described above does in fact not constitute a conflict of interest. I researched this topic and then contacted Jenny Stapp and State Library Legal Advisor Katie Bowmans from the Montana DOJ so that we could compare notes and ensure that we're all on the same page. We met on September 29, together with Commission Chair Robin Scribner and Lieutenant Governor Kristen Juras, and reviewed the relevant statute in Montana code, namely MCA 2-2-105, titled Ethical Requirements for Public Officers and Public Employees. After discussing the statute, we came to the conclusion that my situation does not present a conflict of interest, just as it hasn't for commissioners in the past. Furthermore, if a conflict of interest existed, the statute demands disclosure of such a conflict, not a recusal from discussion or voting. I wanna encourage concerned members of the public to read MCA 2-2-105, and to call our state librarian, Jenny Stapp, who can explain the statute, answer your questions, and put to rest any fears that the State Library Commission might not be acting in a proper and legal fashion. Thank you. Yeah, I would also like to read from um, the memorandum that came from um, an illegal intern to the Lieutenant Governor. Um, it's the conclusion was, because Carmen does not personally receive a financial benefit from any proposed rulemaking regarding the criteria applicable to directors of large libraries, she does not have a private or personal interest under the Code of Ethics for Public Employees or under the bylaws of the Flathead County Library or Commission. To construe her position as a single member of the Board of Trustees of a local library as a personal interest in matters that involve rulemaking that are generally applicable to all libraries or all lar large libraries is overly broad. Even if Carmen's position as a trustee of the Flathead County Library could be construed as a personal interest giving rise to an appearance of impropriety, her sole obligation under, under Montana Code Annotated 2-2-1054 is, is to disclose the conflict. The Code of Ethics does not prohibit her from participating in discussing or taking action on the proposed rulemaking. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the public so the public library standards task force met and has recommendations for draft rules. These will be presented by Tracy Cook. Um, the recommendations are reported also in the document link to the agenda. We did not get that link. And yes. I did... Okay. Yeah, I just realized that. that. Yeah. My apologies. Yes. The wrong memo got linked. I did not oh. receive and that either. I personally, I, I, I know it's a real problem. Because I needed to see that before I knew how to discuss this. So there was a document from right. previous. Yes. I so do we that. have um, the link now that you could send to us? Yeah, actually, what I can do is I can share my screen. And um, Genevieve, I will pop the, the link for the correct one into chat for you um, so that you have it. All right, and then I believe I actually have the power to share my screen. 
Yeah, but I don't want to. I don't want to screw you. You might want to stop sharing, Genevieve, because I know in the past when I've accidentally taken control, it meant it caused problems for you. So here we go. I will just share this. All right. Um, so the Public Library Standards Task Force did meet, and they had a series of questions um, presented to them, and they worked their way through them. And they met in August and September, and we also had some public comment in between so that the task force could consider everything. Um, I think most of them are fairly straightforward, so what I will do is, is go through this and then... Um, have you give me direction on how you want to handle this. The way I had done it was to separate each one out so that you could choose to take action on that particular item. Uh, of course, you could choose to accept all of it. Um, but the very first thing that they considered was clarifying what state funding is tied to the public library standards. And um, this came about because in 2017, the legislature had budget cuts that eliminated state aid per capita. And so state library staff had requested permission to not have the libraries complete the process for the public library standards. However, uh, a ruling from our then attorney assigned by agency legal services uh, indicated that he felt the law kind of said really uh, state funding is state aid per capita and funding that came through the federations. And so what we wanted to do if we were going to go through an administrative rules process was simply to clarify that. Um, the task force didn't really discuss any other options and they agreed with this. And so their recommendation was to update administrative rule. We worked with Katie Baum Bowmans, our attorney from Agency Legal Services, to actually take a look at these and make sure that the language is correct. And at the, the bottom of this memo, there is the actual administrative rules changes. Um, and so you can see that, in essence, all we did was just simply clarify that state funding is state aid per capita and funding through library federations. Uh, the second thing that they were required to look at was to change the language of administrative rules. And we had used the words tribal library um, from the 2021 uh, Public Library Standards Task Force. When the governor's office and the legislature reviewed the renewal of the state aid per capita law, they changed it to actually say it's an accredited tribal college library that provides services to the public. And so the task force members just made that change. They didn't consider any other options, obviously, since they were simply aligning the language within the standard with the Montana code annotated. And of course, Katie reviewed it and made those changes as well, which I will pull up for you at the end. The third um, thing that the task force looked at was the standard regarding library budgets. The standard, as it had been written in 2021, sort of implied that libraries sh should see a year-to-year -year growth in their budgets. But really, as I explained to the task force, the spirit of that was more just that boards and directors really think about the needs of the library and the services that need to be provided and that they, they try to ask for any resources they might need to provide those services. And the task force understood that and agreed to change that one to the library board and director identify the financial resources needed to provide library services according to the library's mission and regularly communicate with community and local government leaders about financial needs. And so they were just really trying to capture that spirit without actually um, requiring a year-to-year -year growth in the library budgets. And when Katie reviewed this, she simply recommended the addition of the word public and requisite. And I can show you that as well. The task force then talked about amending the deferral process itself. So if a, a library cannot meet a public library standard, they are asked to request a deferral and to come up with a compliance plan. And so state library staff, I kind of mentioned some of the, the challenges that we run into is just um, making sure something, you know, is it a hardship or sometimes the library is going to need multiple years to come into compliance with that standard. Um, an example I would give is like, for instance, the accessibility issues. And sometimes it takes a period of time to make your front doors accessible, for instance. And so 
you know, the state librarian has been working closely with libraries. Um, the consultants also work closely with the libraries to kind of help them come into compliance with the standard. After the task force kind of talked about it, they really kind of came to the conclusion that the current process does work for libraries and they recommended making no changes to this particular part of the administrative rules. And so there are no changes to this one. The next one was taking a look at the formula within the administrative rules of Montana. This formula determines how state aid funding uh, will be allocated, state aid per capita. And with the inclusion of accredited tribal college libraries who meet the public library standards, the task force had to kind of think about, well, how will you give them credit for service area population? Because the laws is basically saying, you know, state aid per capita and per square mile. And so they looked at a variety of different options. They looked at reservation population. They looked at the college population, including students and staff. They looked at um, city population plus college population, even school district boundaries. And the task force even talked about the possibility of a local agreement, a multi-year agreement that would occur between a, a tribal college library and the public libraries that share a service area. And they were okay with this idea as long as it stayed within the formula itself and within the administrative rules. However, after doing much more significant legal research, Katie came to the conclusion that that kind of an agreement probably would not create equity. And so um, what we are recommending as state library staff with this one is that we go back to the drawing board, take a look at these service area populations um, and come back to you with a recommendation. This particular rule, if we were to change it, we have a little bit more time, so we could actually take a little bit longer to consider it. And then the final one um, that had a lot of conversation, as I um, imagine you would uh, know, is the requirement that library directors serving more than 25,000 service area population must have an MLS. There was a lot of debate on this. Um, the task force considered a variety of different options from changing the current standard to state an MLS or equivalent graduate degree is required. Um, they also talked about retaining the current standard. They talked about changing the current standard to allow local boards to decide what qualifications they need. Um, and then they also talked about changing the current standard to require an MLS degree or certification from the Montana State Library within two years of hire. And they really went back and forth on these different options, talking about giving local boards the authority, um, talking about how you know, the standards currently allow any libraries under that 25,000 threshold to um, basically decide what they want their library directors to have. They talked about the importance and the power of the master's degree in a more broader community community network, like how small public libraries actually will often lean on those larger public libraries and their abilities. And they also talked a lot about just what qualifications might be needed um, for a public library director of a what's for Montana, a larger public library. Um, and then, you know, I would say they also kind of really wanted to try and focus a bit on services and um, the importance of services and what you need to do that. And so after much debate and a lot of passion um, on the Zoom meeting, uh, the majority of the task force members voted to retain the current standard and make no changes. And so um, there are no administrative rules changes with this recommendation. And so um, these are basically the um, administrative rules. And so in essence, they are actually defining public library they're defining state funding. These are the things that we were talking about earlier, just pulling out these definitions in one place, kind of mimicking and mirroring what the Montana Code Annotated does as well. And um, like I said, Genevieve has the link and we can send that to you. And my apologies that that memo got linked to the wrong one so that you did not have it. At this point, I guess I would see if um, Jenny, you have anything you would like to add to the discussion? You summarized it really well, Tracy. So again, the the um, motion for the commission is to propose these uh, draft rules for the Montana Administrative Procedures Act and go through that process. 
Madam Chair, yes. I would propose um, an amendment to the MLS issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. To the what? To, to the, the issue the on standard. the requirement on the okay. library staff. So is there a motion? Is there a motion? motion? That's what I'm doing. Have an, I'm making a motion. A motion so. to. Okay. okay. Um, I have, would like to discuss it, but I move that the Montana State Library no longer requires an MLS degree for librarians in cities of more than 25,000 thereby passing the responsibility to set librarian requirements to the local governing boards and commissions. Let me show that and you can help me. I have it here. I, oh, I yeah, will show you. I have to read the top part, so I need it back. Okay. I will pass you, that. Are you able to grab that one? I'm sorry. I, I need it back to the top part. That's for you to keep going with. I need to ask for a second. Is there a second? Oh, I second that. Okay. It has been moved and seconded. I'm going to read slowly. Sorry, one second. That, no, 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 that's all right. Fine, I'm not right. <laughs> you can correct it. Let me do it. Thank you, huh? It has been moved and seconded that the MSL no longer requires Montana State Library no longer requires a master's yeah. um and yeah, yeah Sorry. no longer requires a master's of library science degree for <laughs> librarians in cities of more than twenty five thousand, thereby passing the responsibility to set librarian requirements. Sorry to the local governing boards or commissions. May I address this? Would like yes. to amend the motion? We have that no. this is the motion. That's the motion. It is, this is, for... yeah, I, yes. May, may we ask for public comment first and then we'll ask because we, we wanted to have the public comment before we commented. Um, is there public comment? Um, David Ingram has his hand up. Go ahead, David. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is David Ingram. I'm from Kalispell. I'd like to share some observations regarding the recent task force deliberations and make a recommendation. Number one, the task force composition was quite lopsided. Only one trustee, namely me, was involved in the deliberations. This is disappointing because trustees are the ones that are charged with following this director's standard, while eight members of the task force were directors or their equivalent. Number two, the MSL survey population was also quite skewed. 80% of the respondents were either library directors or, or staff. And lo and behold, 80% supported the present standard. Only 4% were trustees. Number three, a task force member rightly observed that the arbitrary 25,000 population cutoff led to only eight libraries, the largest, with one member suggesting the richest, required the quote unquote help of the state while the other 74 libraries are allowed to hire a director as they see fit. Number four, another member suggested that considering alternative paths, such as accelerated director certification, would allow large library trustees to hire a high school graduate. The time and effort spent by trustees at the largest libraries is significant, and their desire to provide excellent services is not lessened by the size of their library. I, I must admit that I found that statement belittling. Number five, the observation that large rich libraries can afford an MLS director and therefore should have one is misguided. It is true that the larger libraries have larger budgets, but we manage taxpayer dollars with as sharp a pencil as any other library. And we have the additional hurdle of being in high growth areas with significant housing costs combined with a lack of housing availability making internal hires, if appropriate, attractive. And lastly, and most importantly, this commission recently withdrew from the ALA. 
Unfortunately, essentially all MLS degree programs are certified by the ALA, forcing large libraries in Montana to hire exclusively from this director pool. It appears to run counter to the commission's desire to disassociate from the ALA ideology. Please consider removing this standard so as to level the playing field and allow trustees to fill this role as they see fit. They are in the best position to understand their community's unique requirements. Local control is the best way to provide local library services. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Um, Ash, yeah. Yeah, Ashley's next. Ashley's next. Go ahead, Ashley. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I did attempt to submit my comment in written form, but I think I missed the deadline for that. Um, I did want to give a little bit of my history, but since I'm limited on time, I'm just going to read a portion of my statement. When interviewing for my current position, I did receive a call from the recruiter explaining that while I was the library board's preferred candidate, the library may be at risk of losing their accreditation and state funding if I was selected as director. I presume that there would be an option for a compliance plan within a specified time frame, or possibly consideration of the fact that I have 128 credit hours of college education, numerous library certifications, and 12 years of library experience as a possible alternative to an MLS. As you well know, that was not the case. Throughout the interview process, I began to see local news stories of my candidacy, as well as posts on social media and in local, regional, and national library groups. And as you might imagine, the comment sections were absolutely brutal. Mm. Some comments that I read on the MLA social media, Flathead County information groups, and even ALA networking sites were enough to make me physically sick. I was being billed as an uneducated, inexperienced, backwoods, book-burning bigot. Mm. There was ample innuendo as to what I must have done to even be considered for the position. Library professionals that I had previously presented to at library conferences or worked with on collaborative projects were calling for my resignation before I ever stepped foot into the director's office. It was a completely humiliating and totally dehumanizing experience. When the library board decided to proceed with hiring me as the director of Imagine If Libraries, I left the only town I had ever known, a library that I loved and ran successfully for eight and a half years, as well as all of my friends and family. I did so with the hope that with time, conversations surrounding my qualifications would settle and I would be able to do the work that I was hired to do. What I learned during my time here is that most people in our community really just want their voices to be heard. I also learned that sometimes previous administration took the time to only hear a select few while rejecting the opinions of others outright. Library professionals were being looked at as arrogant, dismissive, and uncooperative at times. But essentially, people were just tired of being talked down to, and on this, I could absolutely relate. So I really did take time to try to listen to the people around me and work with the people around me. What I've decided is that we don't have a management problem. We don't have a standard problem. We have a communication problem. And until everyone can get on the same page and listen to each other with mutual respect, I don't see that changing and the future of libraries looks pretty bleak in my opinion. I would like to ask that you offer an alternative to the requirement that library directors in a service area serving populations over 25,000 are required to have a master's degree in library science. What that alternative looks like is solely at your discretion. However, the standard as is does a huge disservice to library professionals that have committed their lives to library service to their community and wish to further their career. The current standard also does not account for non-traditional pathways to education, experience, or leadership and does not ensure diversity, inclusion, and equity in library services to all Montanans, which I know is a core value of the Montana State Library and libraries all across this state and country. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, next is um, Stu, Stu? Yeah. Stu. Go ahead, Stu. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm chairman of the Board of Trustees at Bozeman Public Library. <laughs> but in addition, I have my doctorate in library science 
and taught master's candidates at Rutgers University for a number of years. And I'm here to speak in favor of maintaining the current standards. I strongly believe that the skill set that is taught in master's programs provides the fundamental building blocks upon which successful directors and leaders of libraries can build their career. There are basic skills that are taught, uh, cataloging, classification, library management, collection development, building children's programs, building adult programs. These are all core to what makes a successful librarian. And while there can be potentially alternative ways to approach this, I think it's a good standard to have that we maintain the idea that a master's degree is core to what makes a successful director for these libraries. Thank you very much. I appreciate the chance to provide input. Thank you. Is there anyone else with public comment? Oh, Susan Gregory. Okay, Susan, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm here in Bozeman, the Bozeman Library Director, and I do understand Ashley's points. I think she's certainly very articulate, and she said some things that need to be said. I've worked in libraries all of my life, and half of that time, maybe two-thirds of that time, had a master's degree. I want to talk about um, the elephant in the room, and that is that a professional degree is something we don't question with an accountant. We don't question a professional degree with a physician. We don't, we don't question a JD with an attorney. And yet now we're saying that librarianship is not a profession that needs a professional course of study or license. Uh, my understanding is to be a school principal in Montana that you need to have your master's in order to be licensed. And yet again, based on one community, we're being told no, your profession's different. You don't need to be licensed. Anybody in our community can come in and run the library. You know, that's different community to community. Obviously, each community has a number of diverse opinions. Every community in Montana has diverse opinions. And I think we need to look hard at the fact that any one community in Montana would set the standard for the rest of the state. I know for a fact, you don't want the Bozeman Library Board setting the standards for Kalispell. And we expect to have that sort of respect. So also, I just want to comment briefly on ALA and that whole situation. Um, whether you know it or not, the executive director of ALA, Tracy Hall, resigned this week. There will be new leadership. And I do think we need to also understand any library association, any professional association, will have changing leadership and changing philosophies in the course of time. So please don't make a, a ruling that will penalize people for pursuing their professional degree. Thank you. Thank you. Is there, Sarah? Sarah, Sarah, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Creech and I am the vice president, president elect of the Montana Library Association. Thank you for providing time for some public comment during your meeting. I also want to thank Ashley for her comments, and I want to empathize with her position. No one wants to be in that position, Ashley, and I'm so sorry that that is how um, Montana made you feel. I don't think that was ever our intention. Um, I do want to say that I think the idea of a standard is <laughs> important to keep in mind here. I think that we need to remember that undermining standards is the start of undermining all standards, specifically this standard. Um, if we don't have something in place for which to um, compare against, then it's a slippery slope. And this standard has been in place for more than 50 years or almost 50 years, I'm sorry. And I think that the comments about the richness of the communities with uh, which these libraries happen to be is um, an interesting one. I think it's more just the question of the tax base than I know um, Mr. Ingram mentioned that specifically that yes, the tax base is broader so that that is the reason um, more libraries are 
uh, I'm sorry, the larger libraries are the only ones that are being held to the standard. And I do want to point out that smaller libraries in the state have um, met the standard without um, having populations of more than 25,000. Right now, there are 13 Montana libraries that have uh, degreed librarians as directors. And some of them are our smallest libraries in Montana, Columbus and Ekalaka included. I would like to just um, speak on behalf of the entire Montana Library Association board in support of maintaining the current standard. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Any other public comment? Ashley, is your hand still up from the previous comment? Okay. Uh, yes, sorry. No problem. Okay. Yes, no more comment from me. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, um, <clears throat> hey, so the motion has, has been made, has been made by it has been made and seconded to have it. The motion has been made and seconded that the MSL no longer requires an MLS degree for librarians in cities of more than 25,000, thereby passing the responsibility to set librarian requirements to the local governing boards and commissions. Um, May I address this? Okay, I understand the controversy on this, and and I would agree with the um, the trustee that we have heard mostly from librarians, interestingly, from librarians in smaller communities, which I find ironic. I appreciated what they were saying, but none of this applies to them. Um, I think why I want this dealt with today is because. What's going to happen now? There is a timeline. And this will go out for, if I write, for three months of public input, public discussion, other people, staff to look at, and it'll come back to us in March. My concern is that if the board is not, and that's an if, I don't know, but if they're not in favor of the motion that the task force passed, um, it, then they will come back in March and say, but this was what we got from you. And they'll feel like we didn't listen to them at all. So I think if if we if we do want to remove this requirement, then we need to make that clear today. And that's a document that goes out for staff and public review. Otherwise, I see very fairly they would come back in March and say, well, you sent out a document that you supported this and you don't. So I think we have to at least have a discussion on it today. Um, I absolutely need to say, this is not about saying no degree is important. We are all very, I think, possessive and proud of our degree. I have a master's in, in uh, educational counseling from MSU. Um, I, I think it is not about saying a degree is not important. What it is doing is acknowledging who should set those standards. There are over 100 libraries in Montana that are allowed to set their own standards. We just heard that 13 small libraries already have an MLS. It's not required of them. Is that 13 libraries in the whole state? Right. But then we had many people who called it, who supported doing this. They were from small libraries, and to me, I, I appreciate their comments, but they were contradicting themselves. Many people said, I became a librarian, I didn't feel like I had qualifications, so with the help of my trustees, with the help of people in the community, I received a degree, I took classes from, you know, Montana Library Association, and now I feel very qualified. I, they were basically saying they could do this. Nobody's saying that we shouldn't have a degree. I think we have to realize we've set a precedent for many, many years that libraries are capable of making their own requirements in hiring. I find it arbitrary that 25,000 all of a sudden says, you can't make your own decision, you're not qualified. I think that we are being very arrogant Personally, I found it very arrogant to say to the biggest boards in Montana, 
25,000 people or more, you're not capable of making decisions on your own degree. I believe personally that some of these may require a PhD. Some of them may, uh, yes, one, one of the people said, we have two people on staff with an MLS and they run our bigger departments in the books. But we found that the librarian needed a management degree, maybe um, and a technology degree. We, I don't think that we, as a commission of seven, or the tax force have the right to tell people in the biggest libraries in Montana, only eight of them, you are not capable of deciding what your librarian should be. I hope they require various degrees. I know they will. I would bet they will. But is it our place to tell them they have to? And I don't believe it is. I think it's degrading to those libraries. Again, we are not saying there should be no degree. We're saying that decision needs to be made by the local libraries and commissioning their commissioners, their trustees. And that's why I made the motion. Madam Chair? Yes. I I would like to urgently propose an amendment to our motion. Mm -hmm. um, I propose that we amend this to say for director, directors of our library, we're not talking about librarians. We are talking only about the director position. We need to amend our motion to reflect that. Um, to no longer require an MLS degree for library directors, and it's not in cities, it's for libraries with a service population of more than 25,000. And we need to that, get that correct as well in our motion. I'm going to. As a proposer of the motion, I accept those. I, I want to make a procedural comment if yes. I could. So to, to clarify the procedure that um, we would follow if this um, action is uh, supported by the majority of the commission, when we propose administrative rule changes under the Montana Administrative Procedures Act, we would propose a rule that essentially eliminates this rule. And then there would be a 30-day public comment period. Right on that and then the commission will mm -hmm. take action in December, not December. March. Sure. Yes. Sure. yes. Perhaps a better motion um, would be to eliminate that rule. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. I'll say from Robert's rules, the governor, the Lieutenant Governor made the point of your act, your motion should be then positive, not the negative. We're okay. not, you should make a motion that says that we're not going to do okay. this. Right. Which should be in the positive right. of we are doing this, which I think aligns with what said. So I withdraw my motion. I would like to replace it with a motion that says we not require the MSL. No. No, that's still negative. What do you? But we are. You're removing. You're just you asking the, to remove the to remove the standard. To remove the standard. Period. Mm -hmm. My motion is to remove the standard. From the public writer's hands. And we need to this. We need to say what the motion or what the standard yeah. is. Do we need to say what the standard is? Okay. Sorry. Okay. For service areas over 25,000? Yes. Just so that people feel. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you guys are cracking it. You don't yeah. like it. Yeah. Okay. So I need a second to the motion to remove the MLS standard for services er service areas over 25,000 from the public library standards. I need a motion. I second. Okay. Okay, so 
we're not accepting all the draft rules. We're just changing this. Okay. So there's the motion has been moved and seconded to remove the MLS standard for service areas over 25,000 from the public library standards. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just got, I'm sorry, I'm, I take that back. I'm yeah. sorry, let me take it back. Yes. Fine. I'm sorry, may we have discussion first? Is there public discussion? Is there any further public discussion? Is there any further com com commission discussion? So, Madam Chair, um, I would like to speak against this motion. I think that the commission should accept the task force's recommendation. There was extensive discussion over several months and a number of meetings that involved a large group of people. It took a tremendous amount of Montana State Library staff resources to coordinate that and for the commissioners who are concerned about um, use of resources, I think that that should be taken into consideration. Okay. Um, Commissioner Hall just talked about how this standard is arrogant. I would suggest that it would be arrogant for the commission to disregard the task force recommendation, have the extensive amount of study and resources that have been extended by the task force in the state. Of the vast majority of public input was to make no change to the standard. We're, ha we're having this, I mean, the, the elephant in the room that I think we need to acknowledge is that we're having this discussion based on the decision of a single library and policy makers should not make policies based on exceptions. Local control is not a standard and imagine if it does have local control and has exercised that local control in choosing not to meet the standard. Um, just speaking personally, as a professional librarian, I'm disheartened by the lack of respect for my profession and the lack of value that I feel for the library profession mm -hmm. coming from the commission or some commissioners. Um, as Susan Gregory mentioned, uh, for schools to be accredited, Montana administrative rule, rules require that administrators and principals be licensed. And to be licensed, they must have a minimum of a master's degree. I think to require no professional degree for libraries is not in those libraries' best interests or their patrons' best interests. And just with respect to Commissioner's Hall observation that for all of the smaller libraries in the state, this is not, this is not really relevant to them, I don't think that's entirely correct because the task force received a lot of input from those smaller libraries about how much they rely on the larger libraries and how much they rely on the professional librarians at those larger libraries and how valuable it is. So I would urge the uh, commission to vote against this motion. I think that uh, having the requirement of a professional degree is in these libraries' best interests and ultimately in the best interests of all libraries in Montana. Thank you. I also would like to comment I agree with Brian. I, as an educator, I view this as a person, as a professional, and educators go through the same issue as librarians. Um, I, I have a master's and I'm very proud of it also. And when I took my, and I also have a endorsement in library. And when I took those, I mean, I was teaching for 25 years. If I had gone into the library without having any, um, training or information, it would have been a steep learning curve. Um, I just totally admire what librarians do. And, and yes, you can learn in other ways, but I found that it was my education and then go back and apply it in your work situation where you were able to make the biggest difference. And so as an educator, I can't lower standards for education. That's just not in me to do. And um, as a teacher, I wouldn't lower standards for children either. So I believe in standards and we should strive for the highest. Madam Chair, yes. um, I'm gonna vote in favor of this motion. I wanna explain why. Um, I have a master's degree in English and Russian language and literature. My native tongue is German. I speak French, Italian, Spanish, and Russian. I've had six years of Latin, and I consider myself a well-educated individual. I certainly respect degrees. But I do feel that we're tying this um, degree requirement to the wrong position inside a library. 
And I, I can only speak for the imaginative libraries that I'm a trustee for because I've seen the inner workings of that library. We have several, I think two people on staff with the MLS degree. And I'm sure that they lean heavily on that degree and use their expertise to make our library really great. But I also understand from a business background, when you get to a certain size, regardless of what you actually do, whether you're um, a car dealership or a, um, a law office, at some point you need a business administrator. That person needs to understand hiring and firing, that particular legal environment that you operate in as an institution. And that's what they use on a daily basis. Ashley Cummings was not out on the floor a lot because she had other duties. She had to go to countywide meetings. So she needed different skills. And I wish we could find a way to, to express the desire for degree people in our libraries by tying this standard to something else and not only to the director position. That is the wrong place to put this requirement. And I understand that it looks like a disregard for credentials but my vote to remove the standard is not based on that thought. Um, and I wanna to respond to some of the comments made earlier. You know, somebody expressed the desire not to create standards for others as far as libraries of different sizes. Removing this standard does not mean that one of the eight large libraries is forbidden from hiring somebody with that degree we're simply allowing that decision to be made at the local level. And since we already know that there's smaller libraries who are not forced to hire a director with an MLS degree, but have done so anyways, that clearly shows that local um, decision makers, the trustees can be entrusted with this decision and make this decision well and in the interest of their communities. Um, I also wanna point out that there are lots of standards for our public libraries to fulfill. So if we remove this one standard, we are not dropping any and all professionalism and any and all requirements from our libraries and go back to the Wild West where trustees can hire, you know, as was suggested, a high school graduate to run a big library. That's a ridiculous thought, and I don't think any group of trustees in the state would do that. Um, I also want to point out that there are other states in the U.S. that do not have this requirement and have great library systems also. So I, I would like for all of us commissioners to, to look at this in the really broad context and, and get over this, this idea that this is about one library and forcing them to do something or not forcing them to do something. I think we really need to to seriously consider why this could be removed without doing any damage to any of our libraries. And I'm absolutely in favor of removing that requirement because it is tied to this one position and one position only. And I think that is wrong. Thank you. Yes. May I? Yes. I'm Jody Moore. I'm the director of the Red Lodge Carnegie Library, and I'll be speaking to you after lunch about the Network Advisory Council. And um, as you can tell, there's emotion on both sides of this discussion. <clears throat> I just wonder um, if maybe the conversation, rather than removing it, should be changing it in some way. Are what are we? What are we really? struggling with you know are we struggling with this one incident that just happened mm -hmm. in the imaginative libraries are we struggling with the concept of master of library science some of you are suggesting in the larger libraries maybe you should have your master's in business administration or something like that so could we could we look at the standard rather than just striking it what are you trying to say that the essential standards should be for personnel in libraries or specifically for the position of library director and kind of get at that, because I do think this is your job as the State Library Commission. You know, we talked about in this last discussion point on uh, the pay plan policy. You didn't want to pass something off to a different department because that was your responsibility. And from where I'm sitting, I feel like this is your responsibility to set these standards for our libraries. 
I'd be happy with standards set for libraries across the board of all sizes. We make a lot of accommodations for the smaller libraries because some of our small libraries are really, really small. But I, I worry that by striking it completely, you're giving up way too much. And I think you could come to a consensus on different language. You don't like the way it's currently stated, but I think you could agree that there should be some standard. Thank you for coming. Madam Chair, I, I, in response to what was just said, I still like the line on my motion. I, I'm, you know, that's the way it is right now. But for explanation, when this goes out for the public, I still really believe that it says thereby passing the responsibility to set library requirements for directors to the local governing boards and commissions. I, I feel very strongly the issue is not the MSL. It doesn't have anything. Most of us were not here for this debate that happened in Kalispell. Um, it's not my issue at all for this. Um, my issue is that it go back to the local boards to make the decision. So I really would like it. And if it takes an amendment, whatever, I really think we have to explain, given what was just said, that we say motion to remove the MLS standard for service areas over 25,000 from the public library standards and pa thereby passing the responsibility to set library requirements to the local governing board and commission. I, we are not saying we don't believe in any standards. We're saying it needs to go to this board and commission. That's the heart of it. And so, uh, you know, I, I, do you want an amendment? Will, will that help with time? I can make an amendment to that. That's, you know, this is my original motion. How do you want to do with Robert's rules? Do you want me to make an amendment? You have, you have the paper here. here. And so. Currently, this is the motion on the okay. table. This is what goes in the public record. Okay. Just this. If any changes want to be made to it, you need to go to Robert's rules and make an amendment. I would I, make. I can't personally add that. Okay. I it. would make an amendment. <laughs> I will just make an amendment. Leave leave that one right where you, the motion to amend to add after the statement, thereby passing the responsibility. at the end, thereby passing the responsibility to set librarian director. That's okay, I'll slow down. Passing the responsibility to set library director requirements to the local governing boards dash commission. And that's so that it's clear, we're not saying no degree, we're saying you do it, it's your job. And it is your job legally. Uh, I don't have a dog in this fight, but I that's have the a end. question. Isn't the discussion really about funding mm -hmm. the library that did not meet the standards? Can the funding be adjusted based mm -hmm. on the educational degree of the directors? It doesn't have anything to do for me with funding of the libraries at this point. It's only about who governs this. Right. Um, uh, is there a second for that? Oh, okay. Yes, sir. okay. And again, it's clear. I want it clear when this goes out to the public for comment and staff. Okay. The motion has been made and seconded to amend to add, thereby passing the responsibility to set library director requirements to the local governing boards and commissions. Now we vote it. Now public comment, please. Is there any more public comment? Susan Gregory, your hand is up. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, comment and, and hope the commissioners also bear in mind the fact that the library boards will rotate members generally every year. And so the demands or the wishes of the library board will change and go back and forth. 
depending on the membership of that board. And so it's just something to be aware of that the um, requirement to have the MLS or the desire not to have the MLS for the director probably will flip flop back and forth. Thank you. I apologize. I don't know how to raise my hand. Um, I'm filling in for Katie Bowman's today. My name is Teresa Omens. Um, and I just want to make the point that leaving it up to local control is not a standard for distributing state funds. Um, and so I, I think that the board really needs to have a standard as far as how the funds are distributed. Teresa, will you state your title and we, where, you, where you're from? Yes, Teresa Omens. I'm from Agency Legal Services. I'm also an agency counsel. I'm filling in for Katie Bowman's today. So would you repeat please what you just said? That leaving it up to local control is not a standard. The whole point of, of the board is to set standards so that state funding is distributed appropriately and leaving it up to local control is it's just not a standard. I, Madam Chair, I understand that point, but there's a whole bunch of different standards. So striking one or adding a new one, I don't think is any is any kind of legal issue. I think, you know, the, the standards, there's pages and pages of them. I think removing a standard or adding a new standard is, I don't see how that in any way could um, could interfere with anything. So that, I'm sorry, Teresa, that comment doesn't quite make sense to me. We do it all the time. We've not, we're not setting precedent here. Can, can we vote on the amendment? Okay, so, okay, is there any further discussion? Okay, so we will now vote on the amendment to add, thereby passing responsibility to set library director requirements to the local governing board's commissions. Oh, Madam Chair, this is Superintendent Arntz, and sorry I was running between another yes. meeting that I have in the other office. Um, I do believe we need to look at the funding aspect, and I think somebody also had brought that up quite possibly. I'm looking at the rules, as I know they weren't in our packet, and I did text Jenny, and they just came into my email. So if, if on this, uh, I'm, I'm trying to see here. Uh, and Jenny, maybe you could direct it or quite possibly um, we could have Tracy direct where that dollar might be. Would you like sure. me to take that, Jenny? Sure. Okay. So um, the public, the way that it works right now is to receive your state funding, you would need to meet the public library standards. This particular um, standard is actually, and I pulled it up earlier, it is uh, 10.102.1160, and it's number seven. Directors of libraries that serve over 25,000 people have a master of library science or equivalent degree. Um, currently, with the way that the standards are structured, if a library director doesn't meet that standard and doesn't have a way of coming into compliance, or if a board chose to intentionally perhaps not follow a standard, then they would be ineligible for funding. And if you want to strike that standard, then you would just simply remove that standard from the list. And then uh, as part of the administrative rules process, we have to explain the reasoning for things. And so Commissioner Hall's amendment actually explains why the State Library Commission uh, chose to remove, uh, to eliminate the standard. Did that answer your question? I wanna make sure I'm answering your question. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. I think it alludes to that there are multiple standards, and this is just but one that's going to be removed. Yes. And so the other standards of funding, mm -hmm. if there is a standard relating to funding, it would not be on the uh, library director requirements. That funding would be of a different standard, and as you had said, that there would have to be um, multiple, how do I want to say, multiple um, 
uh, multiple entities that would have to say why the state library said that regarding that standard. So if I'm understanding it again, mm -hmm. this amendment right here is not going to negate any funding or um, harm the process of funding because other standards that are consistently or that are in place right now would oh. be the ones that would where the funding would come from. Not, not just specifically this one. Yes, I just wanted to make that clarification. Tracy, thank you very much for that. Welcome. I apologize, Chair, for interrupting. Well, that's all right. That clar clarified things up a little bit also. Again, this is just going out now for public comment. And yes. So I'm not even sure where to go. We're, I believe we're still going. See if there's so we need to vote option. now on the amendment? Yeah, right. voting the amendment. Okay, so we now need to vote on this amendment. Should I repeat it? Do we need to repeat okay, it? Yeah. To add um, to the amendment is to add thereby passing responsibility to set library director requirements to the local governing boards and commissions. Um, No. We will now vote on that amendment. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 What did you say, Elsie? All those yes, in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those opposed say no. 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 So just so my records and that my names are on Peggy, Robin, and Ryan. Um, oh, you didn't vote. Yeah, I did. I yeah, didn't okay. vote. Okay. I'm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and Brian. I'm no vote. Okay, I'm, I'm. Yeah. I'm gonna have to abstain because I. I'm. Yeah. Your okay. Thank you. And now, okay, now let's go back to the main motion. Yeah. Sorry. Give me a moment, and I will add this. You're fine. So now is it the main motion? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So the motion to remove the MLS standard for service areas over 25,000 from the public library standards, thereby passing the responsibility to set library director requirements to the local governing boards commissions. Okay. Okay. So now we need to vote on this. Is there further discussion? Madam Chair? Yes. Yes, I support um, this amended motion. Many states do not require the MLS. Most libraries will still seek it. Trustees are capable and responsible. And at the meeting where we discussed this, I was substituting for Commissioner Hall in, I think it was August. Uh -huh. There was a variety of, of input. I was, uh, I was surprised by the... By the um, as was said back and forth on this. So it's a, it's a valid, um, I mean, it wasn't all in, uh, in favor of maintaining this standard and it does not jeopardize funding. Okay. So now, <laughs> very peaceful. Okay, so, is there any further discussion? Is there any public comment? No. Okay. So see no further discussion. We will now vote on the motion to remove the MLS standard for the service areas over 25,000 from the public library standards, thereby passing the responsibility to set library direct requirements to the local governing boards commissions. All those in favor say aye. 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 And all opposed say nay. Nay. Okay, the public library. 
Sorry, can you second? Yes, sorry. That's okay. Okay, the motion to remove this standard, thereby passing responsibility to set the library director requirements to the local governing board's commissions has passed. Okay, now we need to discuss the rest of the draft rules. May I ask a question of Tracy on process? Yes. Tracy, at the meeting, the August meeting, the the task force supported under how to set tribal funds, um, kind of supported a motion by one of the members, Don Kingstad, that said to use college city population on the credit to tribal college. And if they didn't want to join, the money would revert back to the public libraries. Um, and then at the next meeting, when I was there, they the commission voted that they would leave it up to Jenny to negotiate with each tribe and that would be the process. Um, later in the discussion, when Kay Bowman was bringing up that my motion to have a works requirement instead of an MLS and other acceptable degrees, she said that that was too vague. And so then I point out, well, isn't it quite vague to say that Jenny would negotiate with each of the tribes, which she had said was okay. Um, are we just dropping that vote by the task force? Because you said we're going to study it further, which I think is a good idea, because I think it maybe was questionable. I voted to give Jenny the power, mm -hmm. but I think it was very vague and uh, maybe question of not even legal for to make where she could negotiate with each tribe separately. Um, I thought about that later. So are we, do we have to do anything official to change that or are we just? Tracy, I can weigh yeah. in. So, oh, yeah, Jenny. so um, if the commission proposes the, the rest of the rules proposed by that task force, we would still go back to um, discussing and reviewing our options. We are not proposing any kind of recommendation with regard to the tribal funding at this meeting. Yeah, more, I, more I think it's a good necessary. idea. More work is necessary. It, it yeah. was under 10-102-403, and I, I was yeah. very uncomfortable we had not Yes. That we, we kind of left it loose yeah, and goose. We all we all agree that more work is necessary. So okay. that recommendation is not included in the in the, in the, in, okay. in the rules now that you're considering. That's good. Yeah. Um, we have to see that beautiful spreadsheet again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So do we have any other further discussion about the draft rules concerning the public library standards? Is there any public comment? Is there any commission comment? Okay, if not, I need a motion to accept the Public Library Standards Task Force draft rules, recommendations. And uh, as, as we just changed, changed, as, as, amended. changed as amended. You want oh, great, yeah, no. uh, task force recommendations. Um, yes, I guess not with that wording, how you want to say that when yeah. the changes are. If, if, if I could, I would like to clarify um, a motion to accept the draft administrative rules as proposed, or maybe just a motion to accept the, the draft public library standards. Okay. Motion to accept the draft administrative rules. From the public library task force, it is the the motion is the amendments are now part of it. Okay, they they have become now part of the record. Well, I mean it, it's you're accepting their recommendations and you've added a, an additional recommendation okay. through your previous motion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I move we accept the draft administrative rules from the Public Library Standards Task Force. Is there a second? As amended. You, you didn't you amend them. You're accepting them as presented, and then you added your own motion, motion as well. So you can accept so them. So it's all embedded together already. Yeah. Lacey, can you just please reiterate those for me really briefly again? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the the task force recommended that we clarify that state funding is state aid per capita and funding received through the library federations, that we add language um, that for tribal libraries that matches the Montana code annotated, which is accredited tribal college libraries that provide services to the public, that we change the language of the standard regarding library budgets so that it does not require a year-to-year -year growth, but does require that library boards and directors identify what resources they need. Um, and then the ones that they recommended no changes were the deferral process, don't change that. Um, and then they had with the MLS degree, but like Jenny said, you have changed that one. And then the final recommendation is that we continue to investigate the formula to include accredited tribal college libraries in state aid per capita and try to come up with something that is equi equitable. So Thank just you. to be just to be really clear in this motion, the motion is specific to the rules, not the recommendation. So the motion isn't to accept the recommendation, the motion is to accept the draft rules that were proposed, which is why it's specific to those four rules. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? No, <laughs> I'm very confused, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It is confusing. I think what Jenny's saying is, if you accept the draft changes that the Public Library Standards Task Force made, then you um, are putting those in the administrative rules process, plus we are taking your changes by eliminating the MLS standard. So I get, I, I actually get what you're saying, Jenny. If you If you do it this way, then it's very clear what we're supposed to do. And that is that we are adding those, basically the definitions of state funding and tribal college libraries. And we are changing the library budget standard. And then per the motion you just did, we'll eliminate the MLS degree standard. And that's what we will propose as the administrative rules process. Did that help? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the motion is to accept the draft administrative rules from the Public Library Standards Task Force. Is there a second? I second it. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. How can we approve their recommendations when we have just changed the recommendation? So again, the, the language is specific to the rules. So Tracy, could you bring up the rules again, please, so they can see the rules? You're not, I'm not saying you're accepting their recommendation. That was a motion. Yeah, no, it's the rules. The, rules. the draft, administrative, draft rules. administrative rules. So this okay. process is proposing draft administrative okay, rules. But not the task force. Well, the task force drafted administrative rules pertaining to the definitions of, of state funding. They proposed draft rules pertaining to the use of the language about tribal colleges. They proposed draft rules for uh, changing the budget uh, requirement, the budget standard. And so this motion is to accept those rules um, so that we can carry forward with the procedures act. Jenny, could we have changed those other rules today? Sure, I mean, you can now. I mean, this is just the motion. And then they would become part of this? Are they? Sure. Then why That's, is our change process. not becoming part of it? It, it? it already is. It's in a separate motion. Okay. So you've, you've done that work. Okay. Now we're, we're at a, on another right. business item. Very confusing. Thank you. It's mm -hmm. the draft administrative rules from. Okay. I think maybe the hang up is that it says from the Public Library Standards Task Force, maybe we can add and the and pursuant to the commissioner's previous motion, if that makes it more clear what we're talking about. I just think some of, the, some of the, the, the draft of the rules came through the, stand, the standards task force, and then we now voted to change some of that, and that's all included now in the draft administrative rules. I think maybe the hang up is that it says from the public library standards task force. It's really not just from that. It's also with our change inputted into that now. So maybe we should just take away the from the Public Library Standards Task Force and then it's clear which rules we're talking about and voting on. It's the ones that came from them that we now looked at and that we also changed with the previous motions. 
so it doesn't need to be amended mm -hmm. yep. to so would possibly i'm just possibly would could we change change it to motion to accept the public library standards draft administrative rules is that that's all we need because the recommendations they were recommendations they weren't so someone, someone needs to, to make that motion please or can i do it as the person who did that? yes it's out of your hands now so it's just a Put it table and second is now belongs okay. to the to you all. And so if you want to amendment, someone has to make that action. I would amend this to take away the last slide. Motion to accept the draft administrative rules. Period. Maybe you need to you need to say the public library, library standards, standards draft, draft administrative, administrative rules. Because these are draft administrative rules up here too. So yeah, they have to be labeled. So if we just said the public library standards draft administration. One second. You can all help me on two for pills. <laughs> yeah. That look like what you would like to look like. Except the motion. I meant the motion to accept straight. Okay, so the yeah, motion is to amend the motion. To accept the public library standards draft administrative rules, do we have a second? Second. You were the you were the you were the first. I said I'm ready for the order. I'm so. We need some food. I need food. I second that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. It has been moved and seconded to amend the motion to accept the public library standards draft administrative rules. Is there any further discussion? Okay, if not, let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All aye. Thank you. Sorry. All opposed say no. No. Okay. It has been recommend. Okay, so the public <laughs> the public library yes, strategy draft for ministry rules um has been accepted by a voice vote. And now we will break for lunch. Well, well thank you, Robin. Now we, now we do have to have a main motion. Yeah, so that's just, I'm okay. sorry. So, yeah, main motion. I'm so sorry. This is our okay, motion. sorry about that. Moment. That's okay. It's, it's, thank you all. I'm going to continue the rest of my work. I appreciate the great discussion today. Thank you all for allowing me to participate we this to morning. We have Elsie, to just a second. Motion. We need to vote on the main motion. Can you wait just a minute, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay, one second. We're changing the main motion. Okay, so now the motion has been made to accept the public library standards draft administrative rules. Is there any discussion? If seeing there is none, let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. no. Okay. So the public library standards draft administrative rules has been passed by a voice vote. Now, may we adjourn for lunch? I have my and we will be you. back at, you bet your lunch. I haven't had any yet, so hold on. Should we say 145? Yeah. One, at 145, please. We'll be back. That'd be good. Okay. At 145. Thank you all. Okay, I'm I'm exhausted. Yes. Anyone else exhausted? I'm just, just at LSU in New Orleans. Goodness, girl. Wow. I mean, in Baton Rouge. But <clears throat> I'm so sad. They're so far away. Hey. Um, All right. So but he does call periodics. Okay. Yeah. okay, so welcome back to the afternoon session of the Montana State Library Commission meeting in Columbus, Montana. Sorry, we <laughs> hurried our eating. For the purpose of saving time in our meetings, as we proceed through the informational items on the agenda, we will allow approximately 10 minutes per presentation. And I will ask each presenter if this is enough. Okay, so our first presentation is by Jody Moore from Red Lodge. We're so happy to have her joining us. And she is going to talk about the Network Advisory Council. 
Is 10 minutes enough, Jody, for you to? I'm going to try to keep my discussion brief, allow you guys some time to ask questions okay, perfect, good. and mm -hmm. move on along the agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Genevieve, will you just pull up, start at the basic? Yep. So um, I want to make sure everybody can find the Network Advisory Council online. Um, this is the direct link. But if you started at Montana State Library and clicked on about the library, um, you will find us um, on that drop down menu. There's the Network Advisory Council. Um, and this information hopefully gets updated <laughs> as things change. Um, so, to begin, the Network Advisory Council is designed to serve as a bridge between the greater Montana library community and the commission and the state library staff. We are the advisory board for the library portion of the Montana State Library. The Network Advisory Council is um, sort of part of the advisory boards recognized in the administrative rules of Montana. Um, that is ARM 10.101.101 under the agency organizational role. Um, we refer to ourselves as the NAC. Yet another um, acronym in the library world for you all to remember. <laughs> yeah. So the NAC is comprised of nine librarians. Um, most of us are library directors. We represent a variety of library types, sizes, and geography around the state. In addition, we have um, MSL staff, Jenny, Tracy, and Kara, part of the group. And one representative from the commission, and I believe I understand that's Peggy um, soon. So it'll be great to have a commission member um, sitting in on our meetings. We meet um, at least four times per year. Um, usually it's coming out to around five. Those meetings are typically in person or hybrid. And then as we've needed to discuss issues, say the commission has had something they want the NAC to look at, we've been able to call together um, online meetings in the interim. Um, the <clears throat> idea of the NAC is that we are in service to all Montanans because that's our end users in the library world are the residents of this state. So we, um, I believe all nine of us keep that in mind. I think Genevieve, if we could just click on the members list. Um, so again, my name is Jody Moore. I represent um, the NAC today as the chair. I've served as the chair for the last two years. Um, I joined the NAC in January of 2022. Um, and then Lori, who was here from Dillon this morning for her federation, she is the vice chair of the NAC. Um, we got Mitch from Livingston. Hopefully some of you were able to meet Mitch um, yesterday. Aaron, who um, at one point served as a commissioner, um, probably prior to most everyone who's here today, she represents a tribal library from Browning. Um, we have Susie, who's the director of the Great Falls Library. Alyssa, who's the director um, of um, the Lincoln County Libraries in Libby. Dorlin, who I think Brian's very familiar with, <laughs> she represents the academic library world um, coming from uh, Montana State University. Jana was also here this morning as a Federation representative. She is um, representing the Northeast corner of the state, Plentywood, Montana. And we've got Mark from um, Hamilton, the Bitterroot Public Library. So, um, we are fairly spread apart. We are fairly representative in terms of library sizes. Jana coming from the smallest library. Um, and then probably Red Lodge would be the next smallest to that. And then our largest library is probably Great Falls. Mm -hmm. well, um, yeah. And the, well, true, although if you count student population, it would be smaller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, are informed in our work by um, obviously folks from libraries around the state. Um, we get feedback from our own communities, our professional lives, and also from another acronym, the CSCs, the Core Service Committees. They are comprised of 
more like maybe a little more granular. So on the core service committees, we would have um, other library staff and other um, trustees might serve on those committees and they report back to the NAC. And then we take in all that information and we're able to use that to make recommendations to the state library staff, to the commission. There's not much that the NAC can do. Um, we can't take things to the end, right? This board, this commission, you guys are the ones that would adopt something and turn it into policy. But we can be involved in some of that early process of brainstorming, um, drafting and editing with the state library. So some of the big things we've worked on um, in the last couple of years have been um, the latest iteration of the LSTA plan, work plan priorities for state library staff, the library development plan. Um, we're all very excited about the new cost share formula, hopefully bringing um, all of our amazing suite of library programs to all of our libraries and making it affordable for all of our libraries and predictable for all of our libraries. Um, it's been such a pleasure to serve on the NAC. I walk away from every meeting and those meetings can be very long like this one today. Mm -hmm feeling energized and excited and on my drive back to Red Lodge, I just am thinking about all of these things. It's made me, um, it's been professionally invigorating. And so thank you for the opportunity. Because if you don't know, it is the commission that appoints the representatives of the NAC. So um, while you may not have sat on the commission when I was appointed, it was the commission that appointed me and my colleagues. Um, I think I just want to be able to answer any questions you might have about what we do or how we do it or why we do it um, or any concerns you might have or if there's anything you would like me to take back to our next meeting, which is in November, in early November, to um, just inform everybody. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tell more about the cost share program. Yeah, so the cost share formula has been um, largely informed by um, amazing work that Melissa is able to do at the State Library. Um, and the concept would be, in the past, we've had these, these separate programs, the Montana Shared Catalog, Montana Library to Go, um, our contract with OCLC for services mm -hmm. like cataloging and interlibrary loan. And each of those have carried their own formula as to how much it would cost for any individual library to join that program. And obviously the costs are different because the cost from the service provider is a lot higher for the Billings Public Library than it is for the Red Lodge Carnegie Library because they are dealing with a much higher population, more materials. Um, the frustration of that has been that you have to have these conversations in all these individual groups and the conversations change from year to year based on the costs. And so for me as a library director, reporting back to my local board, trying to do budget planning, it's sort of like, well, we, we don't know what it's going to be because that particular group doesn't meet until May. So we, we won't know what that number is until May. And it's hard to figure that out. And then we might say, oh, well, the shared catalog is going to go up 5% this year. And the Montana Library to go is going to go up 2% this year. Um, and then we've had libraries around the state that you know haven't been able to join in these programs because the cost is is prohibitive for them. And so I think the goal that Jenny brings to this idea of the the single cost share formula is that some of those concerns could go away. That we could be, um, you know, we're still going to be very fiscally responsible. We're still going to make sure each library is paying what's an appropriate amount to pay. But we are going to find a way to do it so that we could say, you can plan on this. You can you can set your calendar to this. And we can do this for everyone if we each go into these costs. Now, in the initial looking at the numbers, there are some libraries that really jump up in costs. And there are some libraries that really decrease in costs. 
So one of the things that um, Jenny and Melissa have considered is whether, is there a way we can sort of make that a smooth transition for libraries where the change is going to be more abrupt. But right now, the current model that works the best is based on the same numbers that we use for distributing state aid. So it's a population-based number. And does it mean that there will be haves and have-nots, just redistribution going on? No, I don't believe so. And ultimately, I think if the cost share formula proceeds, just know it would be this group that would be um, making the final determinants. So you would certainly have the chance to review all of the data. I think what I see when I think about this is the opportunity to turn us all into haves mm -hmm. um, and get rid of the current have-nots. Because there are some groups or some libraries that don't because of the expense, right? Mm -hmm. Someone said today they were not taking part because they couldn't afford it, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So everybody's going to be above average? <laughs> and what wait, what is that? How does that say you go? Know? <laughs> above average and something something. Yes, yeah. beautiful. Yes, yeah, we're all gonna be so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how this works. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, um I, I think sometimes you know we get in the weeds and we overthink things. And this this idea of a single cost share formula is like, hey, what if we could make this easier? What if we could make this simpler? Um, what if we could remove some of the barriers? Um, because um, just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And how can we give access to all Montanans? It's exciting. I will say in the library world, there's been so many changes and um, some of them have been scary, but some of them are just exciting. You know, when we can send people home with a hot spot and say, here, is internet access a problem for you? Here, you take this. And now, now we can solve that problem for you. It's really great. So that's what this feels like a little bit, an opportunity for the state to be able to make things a little easier for local libraries and therefore for all Montanans. Is under this, what we have, do we have that pay formula? No, but I believe we are not to the point with that. Okay. Where it's because you said something that I jump up a place, but mm -hmm. you don't have a yet. Okay. Yeah. So far it's in very rough, format. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how often does the NAC interact with the commission? How often do you make proposals or, or need um, need to bring anything to the commission? Mm -hmm. So it, it varies, of course. I think the next thing we'll do will, the, will be library development plan yep. will be the next yep. thing. So, so there's a current library development plan that was approved by, you know, that version of the commission. And, and this version of the commission, we'll see the next one in at your June meeting. We will meet in May and then maybe the commission will meet in that, June. Because we'll meet okay. in November Okay, we'll talk about it. And okay. so maybe a third December meeting. And then um, let's see. Um, Should you just the budget one? Yeah, yeah. So, so we would have... We would have done a pass through of the budget and then that would have come to this group. That would have been in the summer. That was June when you guys, or August, June or August? Or June, June, yeah. you guys saw mm -hmm. that, how to recommend mm -hmm. that. Um, so I have done presentations sometimes as we've brought mm -hmm. things to the commission. Sometimes it's come directly to you from um, state library staff, mm -hmm. depending. Um, so I, I would always be available if you wanted me to be at a meeting and to make a presentation. And then I would say that um, we've had a couple of things where there's been sort of a back and forth. I think the NAC worked on um, a policy for that. Um, did we call it a freedom to read statement or a, um, we, we worked on that and then it came to the commission and then there were some concerns and requests for changes and that went back to the NAC and then came back to the commission. So it can work and it can flow in both directions. And our meetings are typically designed to fall you know, sort of the month before the commission is meeting. So if we meet in November, then you meet in December. We meet in May, you're meeting in June. Yeah. Did that answer your question, I hope? Yeah, so so from what I understand, sometimes um, the NAC itself will bring something something to the commission and sometimes it comes through Jenny or other staff members, but you guys actually worked on it. Is that right? 
Yes, I think that's that's a fair representation. I didn't mention, but we are appointed to three-year terms. Um, I don't believe there is a limit on those terms, so we could be reappointed, and they are staggered terms so that you know, there's never a time, much like this commission, there's never a time where everybody is new at the same time. So the state librarian would recommend potential appointees to, to the commission. Correct. Or the appointments. And that is typically in June. That's when um, the terms expire. Otherwise, if we had somebody who had to resign or was moving out of stage or something like that, we would maybe have someone mm -hmm. slotting in to fill the remainder of their term. Mm -hmm. Looking at the members again. Yes. Too few men. <laughs> you know, it's a conspicuous quality. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not just kidding. No, yeah, I, I think um, inequitable. Yes. Underrepresented. I would say it's probably um, a possibly overrepresented based on the demographics of the library. Let's so see how many world. Men. Yeah. However. Um, you know, it's an important representation. Um, so we have, we have Mitch and Mark. Um, we did have Sean um, before he left his um, position and took a job with the State Library. Um, I, yeah. Oh, two out of? Nine. Yeah. 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 I don't know if we collect demographic information on the makeup of library staff. I don't think we do. But I don't think we do. As I think of directors, mm -hmm. at least around the state, I can really only come up with two more men off the top of my head. Three. 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 As I can think. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so when you look at it in that framework, like I said, mm -hmm. you could you could make an argument that they're overrepresented, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking Helena was pretty heavily represented. Helena field represented. Okay, let me tell you as you look at that list. Can we go back yeah. to the members list? There are a lot of us that aren't mentioned. It doesn't know. Oh, sorry. It, it looks it looks like it is all Helena. So I was just thinking I'm gonna know. So um that. so you have you have Jody there with Red Lodge. Um Lori says Helena, that's Dylan. Um Mitch says Helena, that's Livingston. Um and I think I think there is um probably a majority of members listed as Helena. In fact, there is no representation from the Lewis and Clark Library in Helena. So this is a flaw, perhaps, yeah, of, the, of what pulls that data in. It's just reverting to our address. Oh, I see. That's mm -hmm. also, it's our at the state library's address. Mm -hmm. And so I need to ask our web guy to go in and um, both list the library you represent and then the lab library mm -hmm. address. That's just a so could you tell us what library we've got Tracy yeah, from us to. and Kara? Yeah, and us. then Jody from Red Lodge, oh. Lori from Dillon, okay. Mitch from Livingston, Aaron from Browning, so that's the Blackfeet Community mm -hmm. College, um, Susie from Great Falls, okay. Alyssa from Libby, Dorlin from Bozeman, um, obviously Jenny is in Helena, Jana from Plentywood, and Mark from Hamilton, the Bitterroot Public Library. <clears throat> okay, mm -hmm. that's a good cross section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's always hard to get enough Eastern representation. Red Lodge is like just barely on the Eastern side of the state and, and John is from the Eastern side of the state. I always like to see the Eastern side represented a little more when it comes to statewide projects because we are a different animal. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> If you live in Whitefish, anything past East Glacier is yeah. <laughs> And again, when you look at population demographics, more of the population is in the western part of the state. So, yeah. That was two, two, um, two state library staff members, one state library commissioner, and then eight or nine librarians from across the state. So nine nine librarians from across the state, including one tribal and one academic. That's the current makeup. That could shift. That is not set in stone that it's, you know, um, seven public, one tribal, one academic. And then we have um, Tracy, Kara, and Jenny from state library staff. And we have one commissioner 
Absolutely. Now, it well. used to be Dalton, and then yeah. I'm just going on. Do you, how much do you work with the federations? So when, um, when I'm in my federation meeting, I feel free to bring up things related to um, the NAC. And as you saw, you had two of your federation coordinators who are also on the NAC. So, yeah. So, um, but at federation meetings, generally one component of a federation meeting is a state library report. And uh, I can speak to the South Central Federation at our fall meeting. Jenny was present for that and she gives a report from the state. And so I think the NAC would only jump in directly to those if, there was something that needed to be expanded upon. Now, I can tell you that I'm listening to all of my I colleagues at a federation that. meeting, at trainings, et cetera, and I'm bringing that, their voices, mm -hmm. to a discussion mm -hmm. at the NAC meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and we, if they were public meetings, they, um, we have had members of the public who attended when they had something that they were, you know, concerned about. When I say members of the public, in that case, I mean members of the library community. So they are staff people at libraries, although any member from the public could be present. Okay. Is there anyone more questions or comments? Thank you, Jody, so much yes, for, you're so for welcome. coming. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us. And um I'll just thank you in advance for um, entrusting us with such an important job to represent um, this wonderful Montana library community and the needs of all Montanans. It's, as I said, it's a real privilege to be able to be a part of that group. Thank you for this. I do have such a great attitude, too. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Could I ask that you send us a link when, you know, of what's going on in with NAC? When you meet in whatever community. now, do they receive Genevieve when you send out our meeting materials? I mean, it's, it's publicly noticed, so if, you, right. if you're on our bed delivery, um, it'll show up. It's also always on our carousel on our homepage. Mm -hmm. Um, the week before, but are you to... looking for like a specific email? No, no, it would just be helpful. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it just would have been helpful today mm -hmm. with your report to have the link. It, it that's all. I'm oh, okay, that's what you're saying. okay. Yeah. Okay. Peggy got me to it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Hey, our next is the um, public library standards as adopted in August of 2021. And mm -hmm. Tracy will be presenting about, about that. Um, Tracy, 10 minutes enough? <clears throat> Tracy. No, Tracy, we can't hear you. Are you speaking? <laughs> yes. Now, can you okay. hear me? Yes. Two mute buttons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. 10 minutes will be plenty. I actually, several of you got to see this process in place when you listened in on the task force. So you had asked me for a little bit of a history and review of the last update of the Montana Public Library Standards. And so I included a timeline so you got a sense of how long it took to go through it. And then a little description of the charge of the task force and um, the process that we used. It was very iterative, which I appreciated. Um, it very much felt like this particular set of public library standards was kind of built together. And we really sought a lot of input from <clears throat> public libraries and library board members and directors as well. I would say one thing I noted right away was from the beginning, the group was really very interested in the role of library board members, and they really wanted to work hard to focus on the community and what the community needed. <clears throat> they wanted to actually uh, pare down the public library standards a bit and really focus on services, and they wanted to kind of make sure that they they had that balance, I would say, of providing excellent service, but not, um, but making it a standard that could be accessible from all sizes of libraries. <clears throat> and so that was um, the process that they used and the draft that we came to with the public library standards as well. So I included in there the different 
links to meeting materials so you could see the versions as they changed over time. They started out pretty rigorous. And then as we got feedback from the public libraries about what's doable and what's not, you know, we streamlined it and crafted a different set of standards until we finally got to the, the standards that were adopted by the State Library Commission in August of 2021. And I had presented at your last meeting about <clears throat> just our success rate with the meeting of the public library standards and the kind of the feedback that we were getting from libraries um, that it really felt like we had created something that was doable and good for them. Did you have any questions about the links or the, the process? Um, like I mentioned, many of you kind of saw it in action and realized how much re research we try to do and information we try to provide to people. I just note that the 10-year-old uh, ones or 2010 or something was 14 pages, and this one seems to be three. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really only two because the third page is the deferral process. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to point out, as a member of the task force, as always, but Tracy does a phenomenal job with the research she gives us, the information she gives us, and the management of the meeting. I personally think Zoom meetings are very difficult to manage. And one of her greatest gifts is giving everybody, not just giving everybody an opportunity to speak, because on that Unfortunately, like David said, there were very few people willing to talk, but Tracy has a way to go around and she got every person to share their input. And I just was blown away and impressed. I just want to thank you. Welcome. Now, Carmen, you know why I blanched a little bit when you said, can we look at all of them? <laughs> Where <do we> go? <laughs> Hey, are there any other questions for Tracy or any comments? Hey, okay, thank you, Tracy. Okay, You're we welcome. will now we'll now now go on to Cole. She'll be presenting the continuing education certification program as adopted June twenty third, June of twenty twenty three. Sorry, um, Cole, will ten minutes be enough to discuss your to, for your presentation? Um, good afternoon, Commission. Hopefully you can see and hear me. Could you confirm that, please? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Great. Um, well, you have the uh, memo in front of you, and um, this summarizes what we did with the Continuing Education Task Force leading up to the action item uh, in June of 2023. Um, I'll just briefly mention that upon that adoption, we were able to implement the new um, rules and language around certification, um, including that for directors, staff, and trustees. Um, we're happy to report that we we're able to immediately certify uh, more than 20 directors, and actually, as I've been um, Working through today, I'm continuing to update certification records so that uh, more individuals are able to quickly move through that process. Um, with that, really, um, it, I, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Um, Tracy or Jenny may also have uh, information that they want to share. Are there any questions? Anyone? Any? Would you like to share? I've got a question. Yes. And is it proper or useful to publish the names of people and their certification levels? Um, it has been the practice of the State Library um, probably since 1990 when the first certification program was put in place to annually uh, celebrate or put out a press release essentially um, that lists the, the individuals who have uh, achieve certification over a year. So we did that in January of 2020. Oh, this is 2023. Yep. Um, uh, the, I, I came on board in March of 2022. So um, the, my first effort with that was this, this January. And so we're on track to do the same in January of 2024. 
Could that be uh, a static web page or a dynamic web page? Um, that goes out through our Gov delivery service. And so it is available in the RSS feed or the archive of all of our newsletters. Um, I'm going to show so, that real quick. Sure. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show Colleen really quick where that is, just so that. Thank you. Um, if you go to our home page and you click on news under about the library. Um, gives a second. Um, this is everything that gets sent out from um, Gov Delivery on all our channels. And so it's kind of a nice snapshot of all that's going on that's being communicated out from the State Library, whether it's GIS, National Heritage Program, <coughs> Library Services, or just general MS News, and any of these you can click on. Um, and it is um, a link to the kind of the, the you know, website version of the email. Um, and then if there is a specific topic, like some of these went out to very specific topics, especially like GIS. And if you're not signed up for that specific topic at this time, you can enter your email address here, and then you will also get those in your email box. Robin, could I ask? Um, we talked about it with the other task force. I'm looking at your members. And would you tell me where they're from? Because again, they all say Helena. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they're um, librarians, are they all librarians? I have the yes, member here, here, Jennifer yeah. Ball. So, mm -hmm. Jennifer's behind. Jennifer, right here. Yeah. Thank yeah. You, yeah. You're, you're, you're right not near where Jennifer is. Um, mm -hmm. Myself yeah. as the staff member and task force member, Carmen Clark from Bozeman. Miranda from Sydney, um, Pam served as a task force member and consultant, um, Dr. Ingram from Kalispell, Fantastic. Tina from Harleton, uh, and then Robin, uh, your chair was a member of that task force. Okay, good. Thank for Geraldine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to David for well, being not. The un underrepresented male. 300. <laughs> what um, roles do these people fulfill in the library? I know Dr. Ingram is a trustee. Um, the general director. Carmen is a staff member at Bozeman Public Library and supervisor. Uh, Miranda is a staff member in Sydney. Pam, of course, is our consultant. Um, Dr. Ingram at it serves with you. Um, and then Tina is also a director. Okay, that's great. Thank um, you. I'm not sure if this is correct. Um, I had asked for kind of an update on our continuing education credits. And so is this the appropriate time to ask a question about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think my concern with the continuing education credits were that we, if we are responsible for them, which is one of our main responsibilities as listed in the law, um, that I think we have to be careful who we allow to present those credits. Um, I was really concerned when I read all the research and study on Empower Montana. Um, I I didn't see their their agenda at all meeting the needs of library trustees and librarians about the budget, about state law, the things, the meat, the meat and potatoes, which is what we need to have continuing education for. Um, and I also saw that we had links to the eight, you know, the American Library Association after we had cut ties with them. So I wasn't sure that we should list them as our continuing education task force recommendation. So those are two of my concerns. Is this the appropriate place to bring those up or was am I being unfair? I think, I think this is the appropriate place to bring them up as, as is shared in your memo. There is uh, a definition of what qualifies for continuing education uh, and that definition is in the memo. So that, that's the process we follow. And I honestly didn't feel like the materials from Empower Montana were worthy of being anywhere in here um i i found them very very insulting um i think i read one section of what they were teaching in that 
uh, powered classes had um, something over other classes. I've got it written here in my notes. Um, and therefore, they and they they were made up of males, um, white people, English speaking people, anyone who owned a home, um, Christians. Um, the list had um, like six things that covered every Montana practically, except for our wonderful natives, and they weren't listed. But everybody else was it, as being basically a power grabbing group. Uh, I I just found found their materials very inappropriate and offensive, and I think we have to guard what we give credit to with our continuing education. I think we have to protect that. And I think we have to make sure that it fits the meat and potatoes of what we should be teaching. Robert's Rules of Order, leadership, tax rules and budgeting, and you know, not the pretty fun stuff, but the facts that would help them. I, If I'm out of line here, help me. Um, but I, we, oh, sorry. Could, could we maybe ask for a, I don't know, a list of, of classes that we offer? I know it's so diverse because I've tried to get certified and I need to get back on the bandwagon. I got so discouraged with the, you know, the different logins that you need to go here and there and then you log in and take the class, but that doesn't automatically transfer to a credit because then you need to log in somewhere else and just tell somebody that you actually did it. And then they have to believe that you did it and give you credit for it. And the whole system seemed very convoluted, but that's, that's a different topic. Um, what about a, a, a list of classes and organizations that we as the state library offer as an option for people to earn credit? And I think that's probably quite a long list. Maybe that would help the commission to, to get an overview of what the state library accepts and promotes as, as continuing education credit opportunities. Um, sure, we, we have, um, we had a question that came in and, and so we're working on putting together some data and lists about um, both what we offer and then what courses are being taken by the individuals who are applying for certification. Those are kind of two, two separate um, data sets that we want to take a look at and be thoughtful in, in reporting back. Um, the, the quick answer is that when we post trainings that are sponsored by our agency, those go on to our Aspen event calendar. Um, and so just taking that glance on a month to month basis, you see what the state library is offering in terms of continuing education um, and as well as all of the meetings and things like that um, as part of our public notice process. But um, other than that, the, the credits, uh, as long as they meet that definition and at the point where an individual is uh, submitting their application to be certified, um, those credits are then verified at the local level. So um, the director would approve or verify a continuing education record for their, their employee. Um, the board chair does that for the director. And so really that uh, local um, continuing education plan or that local decision is made about what constitutes valid credits for an individual to then forward on for certification application approval process. And we've so, captured that in the second part of this memo. So the, the state library makes some suggestions, but it's really up to the, um, the chairperson of the board, if it, the library has a board, um, is responsible for the offerings that the trustees take. And then the library director is the determination the, the person that determines, okay, you, you librarian would like to take this class, I'll take a look, yes, this flies. And then the, li library, the library director certifies to, to you essentially at the state library that yes, this is a legit course. And then that, that earns credit. So it's not 
it's not only the courses that the state library puts out there as possibilities, it's really librarians and trustees finding their own courses and then coming in to, to check and see if they count. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But some of these groups do teach the workshops, right? That are recommended by you. We're, we're not recommending coursework necessarily. We're saying that as long as a, a local library staff person, director or board member takes continuing education courses in a structured learning environment, and that that local library certifies that that meets their needs, then it can be eligible for certification. We don't go through the process of, of vetting trainers or that kind of thing. You know, we we have our consulting staff that provide a lot of the, the kinds of training that you're talking about. And then if a local library decides right. that they want to take training on, well, CPR, for example, as we talked about earlier, if that's offered in a structured learning environment, then people can qualify for continuing education credits for that training. So Carmen, how did you find the Empower Montana? Was that something you sought out on your own? No, that came through a um, the, the MLS continuing education email that I'm subscribed to because I wanted to know how to, you know, where to get certification um, to get certified as a trustee. So this was one of the recommendations and it's offered through the Montana Library Association and the MLA hires Empower Montana to run this DEI class. So because it came through the state, state library email, you know, my assumption is that that counts for continuing education credit, right? So to me, that looked like it was recommended by the state library because it came through the state library email. I'm not sure what the, the phrasing on our, our on email announcements are. I don't know if we say that they're mm -hmm. not endorsed by the state library or something like that. It, it's, you know, it's about raising awareness. It's the same reason why we have those events on our calendar so people can find them quickly. Um, I would like to, because this is a public record, I wanna make sure that I'm accurate. So I wanted to make sure that I was not misstating the Empower Montana. Um, Anyway, what they refer to is that privileged operatives as personal, interpersonal, or cultural, I'm sorry, have gained power over other individuals that they have not or do not deserve. That's their wording. Benefits to the members of this dominant group at the expense of others that they have not earned. And they are white people, able-bodied people, heterosexuals, males, Christians, middle or owning class people, middle class people or people who own property, middle-aged people, which of course I don't fit in that one, yay, and um, English-speaking people. And my concern is that I, I find that very offensive language. And I am not singling something out. This was all the way through their materials. So I just think we have to be a little more careful if something was on our webpage that we are aware of what we are even though it's not a recommendation if it's on our web page I think it's seen that way so I don't know how we handle that but I wanted to share that with you very honestly um so there you go and I'm assuming if it gets shared through the um continuing education newsletter to me that implies you get credit for it otherwise you wouldn't disseminate it to your continuing education newsletter subscribers. So this is it, a class that we, that is that will give credit. Yes, as long as it meets that definition of a structured learning environment and the library director or the board signs off on it, yes. Well, I'm assuming you wouldn't send it out in an email if it didn't qualify, because then that would not be serving your newsletter subscribers, right? Right. Yeah. A couple of uh, observations. <clears throat> So the way we have it set up right now is if you participate in a structured learning environment, then that could mean simple um, seat time. You might just turn on the computer and then it, you, you go uh, mobile on. Um, how do we verify that there's value from, that the person has gained anything from it? <clears throat> and I don't want to get all, you know, all prescriptive, 
about this, but I, I just show that as a weakness. Mm -hmm. And let's say you had a library director that was really into fly fishing and you maybe had a lot of fly fisher people in your town. And they said, well, let's, you know, the, the applicant says, I, I want to attend a fly fishing seminar so that I can relate to my people better. Well, under our present format, that counts. That's a that's not bread and butter, nuts and bolts library ship, librarianship. So <clears throat> besides the things that have already been talked about, those are some uh, credentialing things that are kind of weak that we're putting out there that we're, that we're directing. I mean, I, procedurally yes. in my tenure and experience, when we attend things that are outside of the wheelhouse of Montana State Library um, or MLA offered, we have to enter in that information and we have to verify that it fits within these categories of library services to the public, library administration, collection management, and technical services, and technology. And then that gets submitted, but it doesn't just automatically turn up as credit hours because I believe Cole reviews that. And if she saw me submitting, which I wouldn't do, fly fishing, you know, conference. <laughs> Um, I think she would probably, you know, um, be have the nerves to come back to me and say, Jody, this is not a valid. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is some checks and balances yes, there. There is. I was um, going to say that. It, if you're wrong. Yeah. yeah. Cole, excuse, I'm sorry, Jody, mm -hmm. not Jody. But Cole, um, there is checks and balances. You also have um, the number of credits that they need in administration and they need in in Etc. I mean, that's what we discussed for the task force. So there are checks and balances, correct? It's not like you're going to take underwater basket weaving as <laughs> something as something that would go pertain to administration, correct? It, it would be a pretty hard sell, I would think. <laughs> and I, in the yeah. process of verifying those records, um, uh, yes, it, it would be hard to to justify that. So. Really, as as we look at the um, the requirements of the certification program, um, we we set out that big picture. We define what continuing education is. We define what those four categories are, um, and we also you know have those credit requirements for each of the continuing education tracks. That sets the pathway, um, and this was really important to the task force, and, and Robin, please correct me if I'm misstating this, but to have the flexibility um, for an employee and their employer, the library, to determine what that continuing education path is, was really important so that the types of courses um, and the types of training would really meet that local need and the, both the job and the individual in the job at that local level. So, right. and, yeah. And I want to mention also in in um, Columbus, mm -hmm. Columbus, they have a fly fishing designated area with all fly oh, fishing. Livingston. Oh, Livingston. Livingston. I'm yeah. sorry, not Columbus. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. Check out, they check uh, out fly rocks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they check. Yes, they do. So, so I mean, that <laughs> is that could potentially be something that a library in a local area would want to want to have somebody that's an expert in fly fishing. And, and of course, not underwater bass weaving because I don't think anybody's an expert in that. But fly fishing is something that could be you know, could be ascertained as a good, good class to take. But there's a lot of other ones. Also, I mean, there's, there could be administrative ones that, or what, I can't even remember the four categories right now on the spot, but mm -hmm. that could, could, that could take something from somewhere else and use it as a, as a good, good class to take from that category. So I, I think that we, we did give it to the local local library directors, et cetera, to say yes, that, and and I'm sure they're going to hold their employees to a, to a high standard, correct? Kalei? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and what I've really been encouraged with our, our change since, since June is actually the uptick in the number of staff members who are um, recording continuing education, have started a staff track, um, 
and staff members who are actually pursuing that initial administrative track for certification, um, just because they, they see the value uh, of continuing education and they think it's worthwhile to have that um, certificate at the end of the day to help them, whether it's for job advancement or maybe stepping into um, or putting their name in the hat when we have directors who are retiring or moving on to other things. So um, just that early gain in the, num in the amount of participation with the program has been very encouraging to me. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. And I think what I was trying to say, but not effectively, I think we need core classes. Mm -hmm. There have to be core, just like at college, there are core classes in legality for their sake and protection and budgeting and that. And then there's also options for other classes right. and that I think, feed into it. And that is- So we yeah. do have core classes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. all I- agree. Right, Clay, I'm speaking out of turn, but I, I believe well, that that's, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we when we launched our online learning platform in January, the core of those core courses are um, were created. Uh, a lot of the content um, Tracy has written that get to the legal responsibilities, budgeting and finance. And then actually just Friday, we opened up a new course that extends learning um, really for whether it's trustees or directors or regular staff members on Montana library law themselves. And so um, you know, we announced those. That was something that we put out at kind of a special bulletin um, just to let people know that that course was available. So in terms of the courses that we are creating, the workshops that our consultants do on site with trustees and directors, with the federations, that we really are concentrating on the, those core competencies, the core knowledge and skills that Montana librarians need to um, you know, know what the landscape is like now and to know what their sideboards are in terms of the, the laws and policies that, that we all have to operate under. So we're continuing to add to those offerings and we're excited um, to have more participation with those courses as well with our online platform. I was going to mention too, just because Carmen, I know we've we visited a little bit um, about some of those barriers of login and transferring credits. And so just be assured that we're working on plans for um, some technology-based ways to overcome those, but also, you know, very thoughtfully opened up our online courses to guest access. So for someone who doesn't really need the credit, but really wants the learning, um, that's something I did recently that actually makes it easier for anyone to come to our online learning platform uh, and read and take what they want from the course content without having to jump through some of those very, very frustrating hoops. And I would like to say um, any class that Tracy puts on is always fabulous. And I think the newly created content is very much on point. Um, it's probably just a matter of um, other stuff that comes to other organizations that we just put the information out for might not always be on point. Um, I'm taking that DEI class and I think it's a hair raising education in how to be racist. Um, and it's, in my opinion, not beneficial to a librarian, a trustee or anyone I can think of because it absolutely promotes the idea that the skin you are born into determines whether you are a good or a bad person. Um, and that's not a class we should recommend, but that's really a side issue. I think the classes that are being produced, especially this newest one, and then the trustee essential series. Um, so the classes that the state library itself has put out, I find very useful. Yes, a question for you, Carmen. Um, in the courses that you've taken, have you been measured and graded? Did you have to prove that you learned anything at a certain level before you could uh, submit it for credit? The, the courses from the state library have a little learning check. So after you complete a unit, it asks you some questions that you have to answer. Um, so yeah, in that sense, yes. 
I don't know that it stops you from going on if you don't pass. I don't know what it does because I've never not passed the little <laughs> learning. <test. laughs> but it does have that that in it. So I don't think you can go mow the lawn um, and, and pass the, the classes that are put on by the State Library itself. Thank you. Thank you for that, Carmen. I, as someone who has um, committed 30 some years to education and instructional design, I I do um, appreciate that you understand um, that those checks are, are there to help kind of trigger the learning and, and to help put some skin in the game when we have to put the effort in to learn. So um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I want to thank all of you for your hard work, especially the classes from that I've seen from the Montana Library, they're very, very good. And so I want to recognize all your hard work. Um, I'm just very possessive of our professional title and that we give these credits. And I, I just want us to really be careful who we give that to. Um, I know this is a really silly question. Is there a charge for classes? Okay. Typically not, no. Okay. I think I'm going to take some. <laughs> they're they're very. The I am. I'm going to take Especially some. This Montana library. Mm -hmm. They're very good. But I was sort of worried that they cost some of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Because if not, we will try to get going thank a little you. bit. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Clay. Um, we'll try to get going here. Jenny needs to give the state library report. I'll try to be brief, but I did want to call attention to a few of the new reports that are in your standing reports. Um, first, the fiscal year 2023 annual report that has our agency highlights. I just really want to draw your attention to the remarkable outcomes and impacts that we had in the last fiscal year and the incredible report that Rebecca Camp and other staff worked to pull together. So I hope you've taken some time mm -hmm. to look through that and I'm happy to answer any, any questions or provide additional information there. Um, also in your partner feedback document, um, we just, we shared a little bit of the feedback that we received from some of our partners who also received that report and mm -hmm. wanted to share that with you. I just want to thank you for that good report. You're welcome. Uh, and then um, some additional new reports in your materials. Um, we do continue to have the website dead links report. Uh, we'll continue to update that regularly. Uh, a note for you, because I know it's something we've talked about in previous meetings, and we're all waiting for the new template for state agency websites, mt.gov. The latest word that we've received from the Department of Administration is that perhaps by November we'll have a draft. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep watch and hope to move forward with updates to our website when we receive that template. I included in your media materials the Interim Budget Committee Hotspot Lending Report. That's a report that we are required to provide to our Legislative Interim Budget Committee uh, we were required to, pr to produce one for September 2023, and then you'll see another one for their September 2024 uh, interim committee meeting. So information about the use of that program provided for the legislature. Uh, you had asked us to produce a uh, contracts and personnel report. So those are included there. Tom, you had a, a question. Could you please remind us about the, the uh, temporary nature of that funding? Yes, so we received four hundred thousand dollars a year each year of this biennium for um, in one time only cool severance tax monies. So that money will expire in uh, June of twenty twenty five. Now, then, is it hopeful the libraries themselves will pick up the hotspot cost? Um, that is up for discussion. Right. Yeah, I I doubt many would pick up the cost. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Are we saying that maybe is not it very expensive? Or it's mm -hmm. expensive. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's it's highly, highly valued. Mm -hmm. Highly valued, but very highly expensive. Highly valued cost prohibitive <laughs> for okay. most of your library budgets. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Carmen. The hotspots are unfortunately subscription based. Um, so it's not like a book where you buy it once and then you can lend it out and lend it out and lend it out until nobody wants it anymore. Um, you know, the hotspots, because it's an, a subscription, is a recurring cost that never goes away. So it's not like other materials that you can lend out. 
um, without incurring additional costs. So I know that'll be a big discussion for my library if that funding ever ran out. Mm -hmm. Hardware is not the expense. It's the, the service. The service. Mm -hmm. is, is that something we would want on our discussion about the but, legislature? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and also we have our eyes on some of the federal broadband funding that's coming mm -hmm. into Montana. At some point, the state will start talking about the, the pot of money um, that's for digital equity and inclusion to help support digital literacy and to help get more people online. Um, and there's a possibility that we could get some of that federal, federal funding for this program if it's something that's valued. So that's something we're keeping our eye on as well. Um, as I mentioned, we have your, your uh, contracts and personnel reports. We'll plan to update those on a quarterly basis. If there's any questions about those, those reports, let me know. And then we also included an evaluation of our uh, recent fall workshop that occurred in Great Falls. That's uh, one of our primary learning opportunities that the state library hosts for participants around the state. So we have some evaluative information, including a request for cost information that we've shared there. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of our standing reports. I have a question. Sorry. Go ahead. I have a question about your, um, or the State Library's annual report. Um, I expected more data, uh, more of a data-based report. And I wonder what, um, if this is worth a discussion at commission level to figure out what data would inform the commission better on the performance of the state library. Like what, what constitutes success? More subscribers to this program, more users here. Um, how do we actually measure that? Because the... What what I read in the report didn't really give me data to compare previous years to this year, compare in the future, like what did we do to increase this or make this better? How would we measure success? There were a few links that you could click to mm -hmm. for data. Was, weren't there? Was there's, there? I thought, I, I thought there were it's... there were metrics throughout. So I, metrics, I okay. I'm, I'm not quite sure where that met, that data is lacking and and what suggestions you might have. Of course, we're happy to take feedback on how to continue to improve our reporting. That's what we want to hear from you. Um, okay. So how do you how do you um how do you measure how do you compare this annual report to previous years? How would you make that comparison? What data would you use? If you if you pull up this one and last year's, I mean, I've I've only read this year's, and I was like, where is the? I I think that depends on the the program and and what we're highlighting. Um, you know, some of the highlights do vary from year to year, so we might not be offering comparative data. If there was a program where you wanted to see year-over-year -year use, um, that's something that's included in our, our dashboards about our programs that you can refer back to. Um, and we can include more links to our dashboards if you want to see that year-over-year -year trends in different kinds of programs, if that would be helpful. Uh, and it, again, if, the, if you have suggestions, we want to we hear those suggestions. I think the, you know, a previous year comparison like you do um, in a financial report and like like um, like we do with the finance committee, we can look at the quarter and we can look at the year to date. Um, what metrics are there? More customers? You know, if you, if you needed somebody to promote the library, how would you measure that the promotion worked? What, what is your measurement? Um, Feed partner feedback, you know, and somebody saying this was great, I used it and it was fabulous. That's anecdotal evidence. It doesn't really allow me coming in from the outside with no insider knowledge to say, wow, this year the library really, the state library went above and beyond and really did fantastic with the resources they had. 
you know, they got 50% more people to use this service because they went out and did this and that and the other thing. I really have nothing there that I can I can use to to judge the performance. One thing we've talked about in the past is the cost per deliverable. <clears throat> so in manufacturing, you have a cost per widget produced. And you might have a cost in library services, a, a cost per um, librarian trained in the art of cadastral. So maybe last year it was uh, $37 to train a librarian to a certain level of competence. And this year it's only $35 for the same employee. So those are ways that you could measure, but we have a, we're so far away from that kind of data. Um, but that's what, that's how you would measure in, in a business environment. You say, well, it's taking employee uh, 301 an hour and a half to do this task. It's taking employee, employee 615 three hours to do this task. We need to train employee 613. Or we need to do something. Or, or maybe that employee is improved by double over time. And so you, you celebrate that. But if you don't measure cost per service rendered, <clears throat> Um, you're just celebrating um, in general terms, as, as Carmen is saying. Um, good vibes. Generally good things happening. It's a little hard to get your, to, to really evaluate that. And for an employee to take pride in it. For them to know, it used to take me uh, 42 minutes to build a 106. Now it takes me 39. That's pretty neat. I'm getting faster as I go. Would it be beneficial, <clears throat> and this might be just me, but on the contracts, for example, to at some point have a Zoom meeting where we can ask questions and get information. Um, I, and I'm, I'm kind of piggybacking on what you're talking about, but things jumped out at me like $40,000 a year for an avian specialist from the Montana Audubon. Now, that I could understand because it's such an important part of our natural catalog for one year, but this contract goes to 2025. And I would think maybe something like an avian specialist at 40,000 a year, you know, I have to look at that and say, is that worth $200,000? That's a lot of money. Um, is there purpose? to set up Montana birds so that we have a catalog of it. Well, that to me would seem valuable under our um, science and, and environment for Montana, but I can't imagine it taking five years or four years to ever build a catalog like that. And so um, that I had a question, like how do we, what is an avian specialist doing that's worth almost a quarter of a million dollars in four years? Um, so, and of course, then I wondered what movie was, Moodle? <laughs> I figured it was right up there, Noodles. But, um, you yeah, know, what is a Moodle? Moodle's the it's learning platform. Okay, thank you. But anyway, that that kind of question, I, I wondered if it would be productive to anybody to have a meeting time or if we could just send, maybe it would be better to just send Jenny a list and say, 40,000 a year, for five years for an avian, what is this? What are they teaching? What are they doing? What's I don't know what's the best way to do those questions. I know we're out of time today. I know it's long on a report. I don't know when it would be, but I found quite a few items that I just thought, hmm, this. You're on contracts and we're on the annual report. Right. So that's yeah. two separate things. I know, and I apologize. Maybe back, back to the, um, the annual report. Would this be something for the newly formed personnel committee to to work on um a some suggestions for a data based more data based annual report that uh, that would be more useful to the commission to look at once a year to gauge 
efficiency or how well the, the state library does its job. I mean, I have no doubt that we do useful things, but I have no way to compare performance um, or outcomes of the library this year to the previous year. There, there's nothing, there's nothing for me to make a comparison. There's no data. Is that something the fiscal committee would be doing, the financial committee, the subcommittee? I don't know. I guess I, I'm questioning if other commissioners agree that there's something lacking that you're not getting between the report and the dashboards that we already provide. We're not, that's what I'm trying to, I view this as kind of a summary mm -hmm. of things that we highlighted over the year. And we have the dashboards, we get reports on each project and often ask those questions and say, how did we improve and such? So I feel like we're getting that information Perhaps we need throughout to maybe, the year. Maybe, perhaps maybe we need to go a little bit more in depth looking ourselves at the dashboard. Do you, have you have you looked have we looked very much at the dashboard? Have you looked at the reports that are put out there? Because I mean everybody every there if you look at the dashboards and click mm -hmm. on them, like the budget, when we were clicking on the budget the other day, it was you know, there it was quite in depth. Mm -hmm. If you do you see what's on the screen, Carmen? I mean. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of yeah, Jenny. If you if you would take me through a dashboard, maybe that would help. That's a great idea. Maybe we need a dashboard lesson. Well, we. I mean, we Rebecca, did, Rebecca, Rebecca did, did not too long ago. Yeah, not too but, long ago, but you but, might. Not yeah, I don't know if she was. Yeah, maybe there. maybe Carmen would it help if Rebecca just did a a, a <clears throat> kind of a either a one on one with you or we could do a a training with any other person. Right, right. Yeah, yeah we did do it. If it would be acceptable, I would suggest that we try and do something after this meeting along those yeah. lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would I would welcome learning more about the dashboards too. Sure. And it's always yeah. good to have an update on it. I I, I think. I mean, yeah. just to navigate through. Yeah, let's I let's do hearing it again. I'm mm -hmm. exceedingly right brained, mm -hmm. so I really like this report. And I really yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm I leave the. Left brain stuff completely to Tom and Carmen and Robin and oh, Leo Brian. No, 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 not me. <laughs> so let's let's schedule a, a class on dashboards for interested commissioners. Perfect. Yeah. Because there is a, quite a bit of data in those. <laughs> not quite a bit. <laughs> Extensive. <laughs> yes. So is there are there any other comments about Jenny's <laughs> report? And I would just I would just say to to Commissioner Hall's question if there's if there's something that jumps out at you on any of these reports, you can always ask for them to be on a future agenda item or have. Oh yeah. Or am I allowed to just write you and? Yeah, or you know the bylaws have have an agenda setting process yeah. now, so I think right you me know and I can ask. I mean, I don't really want to take up time on an agenda asking about an avian person, but I could. I mean, but it's if, interesting. If I would like yeah, to know, too. Yeah, there's simple questions. We I can, mean, it's we interesting. We can so, yeah. answer the question, and I just think it, mm -hmm. it benefits everybody to hear it. Okay. Thank okay. you for the improvement in the website links. I looked online for a, um, a corporate standard in the corporate world, and this is our 4.7% dead links is not as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> Uh -huh. those aggravating. When I when I um discussed that metric with the governor and the director of, of um D of A, they thought that our percentage was quite good compared to that. Hopefully when the website information comes mm -hmm. out, it will been waiting uh, approve for, for everyone. Time. Yes. Okay. It is five minutes after the time I promised my husband I would leave, so I don't get any deer on the way home. <laughs> So if we could get it going, that. I'm sorry. Um, the commission goals and objectives, um, was everybody able to print off the business calendar? I printed it off and it was very, it's very handy to show us what our goals and objectives need to be for the coming biennium. Shout out to Rebecca yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. of Rebecca course, always. Yeah. Of color color. And yes, very good. And are there any job. questions about that? Do we have any questions about our goals and objectives? I guess, okay, if not, um, is there, 
Yes. yes, yes, yes. Oh, I have that yeah. under um, any other business. Mm -hmm. and I was gonna, if you don't right. mind. I have one quick question. Okay. I cannot do the Federation meeting on October 17th. Um, it's only an hour long and it's Zoom. And I wondered if I feel badly about that. I think I had looked at that one. I, I can help you. Would you help me with that? Okay. I think I, don't I think have I a have conflict on, on the 17th. 17th. I'm thinking I have the my husband is dentist. If you're already doing it. Okay. Is there any public comment on any matter not contained in this agenda and that is within the jurisdiction of the state library commission commission? Okay, seeing as there are none, we're going to keep on going. Is there any other business or announcements? And I have a couple if nobody else has any. I would like to sincerely, I am having a terrible time with my state email. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And I am wondering if we could do Gmails with, say, Commission Scrib Commissioner Scribner, Commissioner Hall. Um, some at gmail.com. I we possibly now. Yeah, I'll speak to that. So, okay, you were yes. kind of the first commission to ever be allowed to get NC.gov emails, and, and it's not, it's a um, state ITSD does not like, well, they're very protected for, for, for security reasons. Right. So, when someone's logging off the outside, it's lots of red flags to them, right? Mm -hmm. So, that's why there's so many hoops. They're for a really good reason, but it right. makes it very mm -hmm. difficult for you all. So I think having experienced that, that probably can be sensitive. And then at that point, like legislators often do, they'll just create an email in Gmail or any, any you can do whatever your current email platform is, whether it's, you can just create yeah, another account whatever. and just uh -huh. create it as commissioner, scrivener at Hotmail, Gmail, whatever that way. And that just puts it up to you guys, that way you guys are responsible for it. And that's maybe a suggestion to separate it from your private right. so you're not, Having those two worlds, right? And and, and I would, and that's what I would like to yeah. do. Yeah. So I would, I would say like that to... whatever you're using, just open another one. Okay. Just commissioner and blah blah. I wanted to point out that Michael's been very helpful. I spent a lot of time with him, yeah. and I don't think it's his fault. It comes in, yeah. and then it goes away, and then it, it comes in. It keeps you off after yeah. sixty days. Uh, yes, was, I was I kicked off. Oh, yeah, I've been kicked off quicker. Okay. So personally, like whenever I send anything business wise, I just send it to your Gmails as well. Thank you. Yes, and we appreciate um, it. But I also understand, like, if you just want to drop the, there's also a monthly expense to the MT.com yeah, email addresses. So there is an expense. Right. Oh, what are you to me? We have to buy you a license. <laughs> oh, it, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm the list. So we're not on it. Whatever you're using. Okay. Spring, so. so then, and that's so, up to you guys to do that. Okay. And I would so, like you to know that as AI, I find them very insulting because they cut me off and said I was stale. Stale, <laughs> yeah. Stale, August. Stale. I am never. It's seventy four. Could we have a like a? You're not stale. Standard. Oh, yeah. Should we have an MSL commissioner Taylor? Or let's have a standard. Oh, good idea. Yeah. I mean, some of it will be when you go to get one. I, I don't think anyone else will have MSL in your name. But yeah, because you know, right. you have to if go it's just commissioner, I'm going to run into trouble. Yeah, but if you do like MSL commissioner in your name. I yeah. would think that would be available. Last okay. name. And then mm -hmm. and then just let me know, know what it is. when it's ready. And then I'll take the MT.gov one off the public facing website. Okay. And I'll put your okay. And that's email. another thing. Have we updated the website lately? The commission website? Oh, so with Brian's information. I would really like that. I think it is. I okay. think Brian is on there. I, but I just, check. well, I just looked and I. And there, I have some tickets into our ICU though. Okay. So if some things are, hey, I was on there almost okay. immediately. Okay. I got a picture of me, but right. I was on there. Mm -hmm. Um, I went and I saw Tammy's phone number is still on there. Yeah, I want that. Um, let's see what else did I see. I already get ten phone calls a day for Tamron Hall, because on email, if it looks up Tamron Hall, it has my local phone number and those ones, and my what? email. What? <laughs> That's hilarious. From the talk show, maybe? Yes, and on the <laughs> webpage, my email, my TamaraHall.com webpage gets at least six a day. And the picture of me does not look like a beautiful <laughs> six foot, 30 year old black woman. <laughs> but some people must seem to think I'm. That's funny. Just answer. Okay. <laughs> oh, what they want to know. The <laughs> letter board. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, sure, so, let us know what you're done with the NC.gov email. Done. Um, okay. And then. Uh, okay. We will um, that way we can just okay. just continue them. We'll put it. Okay, I'm going to go to members. So, so 
it when, has when uh, at my my orientation I raised the point that a lot of you your home addresses are on this page um, I have my work address and I I don't know how you feel about that personally I'm pleased that my work address is there rather than my home address right. we asked the governor to yes and, yeah Melissa and, I don't know if Melissa's online still she she got an update from the it's also on the need. governor's web page they do put for right. all the councils and commission right. they mm -hmm. do put your home address which yeah. I, I understand that right. feels yeah but that's that them that's the governor's boards and commissions okay and, and it, yeah I mean, and, and I don't care. Peggy but can be the. You stand because the application says pick what you want. Yeah. And it, I picked my email. So I don't understand so why, how it works. If I search. When I filled out the application. Yeah. I've had my mail bar. Yes, they want your address. But. So I can't. So that idea, a good question. Maybe get pictures. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Robert. Yes. Okay, what else? Emails, commission page updated. Okay, before we adjourn the meeting today, or, or is there, are there any other discussions? Are there any other announcements or business that has not been discussed? Is anybody? Good job to Genevieve. Thank you for repeating us. <laughs> yes, that was a very delicious lunch again. We thank Stillwater County yes. for I have a, I'll have review the agenda items that I noted okay. for our December meeting. Okay, so, go ahead. Um, Tom had a request for a discussion about budget amendments. We'll take final action on the administrative rules you proposed today. Um, we will have, I think, the library development plan from the Network Advisory Council. Um, I believe you'll also have my evaluation from the Personnel Committee. Okay. Do we want to do that? You, could... you have to pick yeah. a third mm -hmm. member that you oh. We asked Peggy good, 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 yeah, and Peggy Beth, mm -hmm. since she was in the vice chair. In the process mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. yes. And mm -hmm. was, she, was, it was Sharon. Work with Sharon, right. Yeah. So those are the um, those are the agenda items I noted today. And following your your accepted bylaws now, we'll do the the four week um four weeks ahead of the meeting, the preliminary draft for you to respond back to. We'll have a week to send additional suggested agenda items um, and then we'll submit the final agenda to you two weeks ahead of your meeting meeting materials be posted a week ahead of the meeting okay i would also like to put on the federation um funding. Oh, funding. The funding. Funding. yes sorry thank you. Oh, okay. that word was oh, way yeah. up there mm -hmm. okay so a discussion that. about that, that yes, federation please, funding 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 I'd like to request, and I don't mean it in a critical way at all, if we're going to have a social event the night before, it would be helpful to know as far in advance as possible. Mm -hmm. I know that's hard sometimes, but, um, you know, like visiting a library or a, a board get-together or a commission dinner or anything, it would be helpful to try to know more than a few days before, because I... It was very nice. I'm sad. You're jealous. I'm very jealous. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just well, my doctor, I'm, I'm seeing a event for human trafficking in, in Gallatin County. He goes, really? I said, no, not for it, against it. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I know. I've got to get better at this communication. Okay. I don't think we, if they human trafficked you, they'd bring you back. <laughs> I don't think they would. My parents sent me away many times. I'm sorry, that was well. They did. Okay. They okay. Me finish this school. Before we do it during the meeting today, I would like to thank all of you for your hard work and for your dedication. Um, I feel felt like the meeting went semi fine today. I believe that we can be proud of the work of the staff and of um, what we're trying to do. Okay, your energy and input are appreciated. Thank you, everyone. And I would also like to thank again the Stillwater County for your hospitality. We truly enjoyed our. Thank visit. you. I'm so proud of your hotel because you're sold out most of the meetings. Yes. May, may I have an ad motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. The October meeting of the MSL Commission is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.